Hello, adventurer. It's good to see you. You have made it to the morning grind. Welcome, welcome. It's the live stream at the beginning of the Geekverse, where we talk about all types of topics in geekdom, gaming, and fantasy, with an emphasis on being constructive and creating the things that we want to exist in the world. It's all on the grind, size more. Can't be too fine, can't be too coarse. That's exactly right. There are a lot of adventures to be had today. Dungeons to explore and monsters to slay. And who knows what a random encounter might send our way. That's why we have to prepare. So settle in now for the morning grind with your favorite beverage in hand. Tea? Or maybe something a little stronger. I've got a few bottles of the old Winyard left. Whatever you want. Pull up a chair. Oh, dude. Oh. If you're feeling fancy, how about a cappuccino? Or a frappuccino? Or how about an espresso? Just tea, thank you. Sounds good to me, Gandalf. Whatever you want. I'm just glad you're here. Everyone is welcome. You can just watch if you want. You don't have to worship anything you don't want to worship. Thank you, Mike. But be forewarned. Sometimes we get really strange characters around here. Wait, what's that you say? Why can't you come and be a part of the stream? My wife would disown me. Oh, no, I bet she'll be fine with it. Come on in. Am I scared for my safety? No. What are we supposed to do? Everybody do the secret handshake. <laughs> secret cultist handshake. Oh, oh, now do wizards who love each other. <laughs> yeah. This, my friend, is a science. I still don't have gifts, but it's fine. It's all on the grind, son. Can't be too fine, can't be too coarse. Dude. This would be a sick place to bring the band. Indeed it would be, Dave. It really would. I'm seeing more people coming in. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Oh, look. Here's someone new. <clears throat> is this the cultist meetup? Yes. Yes, it is. Come to hang out. Uh, hmm. Please accept me. I have nothing else. Okay. We accept you. Everyone's welcome here. Brought some snacks. Well, that makes things even better. You want some coffee? I don't drink coffee. You sure? It's cultist coffee. What well, makes it cultist coffee? I'm a cultist and I'm drinking it. Oh, then I'll have some. What exactly is going on here? I'm seeing more people coming in. Welcome, welcome, it's so great to have you. Oh, and look, here comes another stranger. Can we help you? Uh, yes, uh, fellow cultists. I could really use some food. Oh yeah? Uh, welcome. We have donuts. Oh, it's me. I'm glad I'm here. I'm sure you have a few questions for me, though. What's your name? Who do you work for? What god do you worship? Great questions, Rob. I'm Steve King, and I worship... Nyarlathotep. No, not really. I'm just Heath, and I won't be worshipping anything this morning. But I will be your host. Welcome to the office. We're going to have a great time. I've got my coffee ready. Because now it's time for the morning grind. If you could become a fish, that would be amazing. Then I could command you with my mental fish powers. Good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to the morning grind. Whoa, too much light, I think. Yep, yeah, I don't like that. Too orange. Welcome to the morning grind. So glad to have you here. First of all, I want to apologize for being late. Um... I don't really like what's going on here with me this week because I had to cancel a live stream on Wednesday, kind of late breaking, and I'm late to this one. So I'm going to have to change up kind of how I'm doing. I may have, may have come to a limit of uh, exactly how far to push myself because both of them have come down to exhaustion. <laughs> so I don't want to do that. Uh, need to make sure I'm working at a level where I can do lots of stuff over the long haul. But thank you for being here with me this morning. I think this is a, a topic I wanted to do. I was also running late because... When I got up, I want to be able to do this topic right. I want to be able to create a dedicated YouTube video about this topic, and I've been trying to research it and make sure that we have all the information. So I think if we're talking, we're talking about the D and D OGL situation today, and I was trying to collect topics and information that we have because I think the best use of this live stream to talk about this topic is to make sure that we have all the information that's out there and also assess its credibility, you know, cause we're not even sure. I believe at this moment, there's been still no 
release from Wizards of the Coast or anything like that, right? So we should also be talking about in terms of credibility of the information that we have. So we're going to take a look at uh, take a look at this from that kind of topic here. So yes, we got lots of people here this morning. So Stray's here. Hello, Stray. BGD is here. Good to see you. Inner Light and Retro Girl. Morning. Yep, I'm running late. I'm running late. I hate it. I'm sorry. Uh, Matt, good morning all. Thanks, Heath, and Inner Light for the feedback on my editor. Hey, if uh, you are on the Ravenkeep Discord server, and let me post a link to the Discord server right now so I don't forget. Uh, right here. Uh, Matt has created a... Uh, Hero Quest game editor. That's uh, not uh, uh, for maps. It's fantastic. So he he put the link to that uh, in the Discord server. So Raven Keep Discord server. There we go. And then yes, let's stray is correct. Breathe and sip. I've got coffee again this morning. So I'm actually drinking the uh, witch's brew this morning. So we should breathe and sip. Do it with me. Deep inhale, complete inhale, and then complete exhale. And now take a sip of your favorite beverage that you've got with me. Ah. Yes, thank you, Matt, for the reminder on the sip as well. Uh, Grimhild, good morning. Good morning. Great to have you with me. Glad to see you. And White Rabbit is here. Have a few on my morning work break. Welcome. Come on in. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the OGL, and I think we're going to start at the beginning, but I hope that a lot of you also have different links or things like that that you can put up that we should look at uh, in order to kind of come up with a whole kind of story about what's going on, and then at least this live stream can be a resource for that, and then maybe I'll do some more analysis and put out a uh, thinking about what we come up here and put out a video on my own. Let's go to an abbreviated and very short morning messages. The Morning Grind is brought to you by World Anvil. For all the game masters out there, World Anvil supports more than 45 systems, including D&D. Or you can create your own. It allows game masters to plan, play, and present their adventures and campaigns. Use the code MORNINGGRIND to get 40% off yearly subscriptions. And thank you for being here with me live on The Morning Grind. And if you're watching on replay, welcome to you as well. It's great to have you here. If you're enjoying The Morning Grind, please click the like button and subscribe to the channel if you're not already. It will really help the channel grow, and I would be very thankful. We also have the Ravenkeep Discord server you can join if you would like to be a part of the community. All right, that's what you need to know. Let's get to the main topic. Okay, so the situation with the D&D OGL. And this is a situation that uh, impacts me and a lot of people that I know, potentially, right? Uh, because, for instance, uh, I had been talking, I had written the Journey to the Tree of Sorrows RPG, and I'd written those books, uh, turned them in years ago, and they'd never been published. But even back then, I was kind of joking that there would be a new edition of D&D before they actually got out there. And it's because they are requiring so much art. It's the art that is uh, uh, such a, a difficult thing for those books. And they're going to look absolutely beautiful, and they're going to be amazing books when and if they get published. But even then, I was thinking kind of as the publisher side of things that, hey, we are moving kind of slowly here, and then what if there is a new edition of Dungeons & Dragons that comes out after all these things have been written, and then how do we deal with that? And then as time has gone by, well, not only do we have a new edition of D&D, but then we also have this potential situation with the OGL. And, you know, when I was first covering one uh, one D&D stuff here on the Morning Grind, we've done it a couple of times, you know, I was not even aware of the issues that the community seems to be having regarding like all of the uh, digital situations and microtransactions and all of that. Uh, I was just coming in from the perspective of, oh, let's see what the new rules are. And it seemed like from the two times we've looked at the rules that I haven't actually been able to play test them or anything like that, but that I wasn't seeing anything in the rules that was causing me to go, oh, yuck, you know, or something like that. It was like, OK, let's look at the clerics, how they're revising backgrounds and things like this. And that at least on first pass, it could be a, a good revision to that. But then we had all of the issues with the 
uh, a potential, uh, whether or not there would even be physical books or whether you're going to get physical books and how much it's going to charge to be able to play on a, a, an online platform and all of that. But then it hadn't even really occurred to me that, uh, and then we have the situation with the OGL. And what's strangest to me is that it seems to be going retroactive because like it wouldn't surprise me at all based on what we were hearing and um because we also did a video on the the under monetization that term that was used the under monetization of DD. so it really wouldn't have surprised me if let's say sixth edition one one dnd whatever you want it to be sixth edition would have decided to completely kind of break and do something completely new that they wouldn't have had to share but then what could you do about like the fifth edition ogl it hadn't really occurred to me, and in fact, that you could un-OGL something, right? That you could un-open gaming, gaming license something kind of retroactively. Now, we're going to look at that here, but I guess that hadn't really occurred to me. So if somebody wanted to continue, uh, so if you wanted to continue working with it, I would have thought you could. So it hadn't even occurred to me that it would be kind of retroactively. Uh, Lynn Dark Knight says, pay up. You said the words D&D. Got to give wizards their cut now. <laughs> that seems that seems the way people people are saying that's the way it's going, right? And I also I also want to do a video. I had a list of videos that I'm still trying to get to, and so I'm putting the D and D videos up on top. It makes me wonder. One of the topics that I was going to cover is how brand loyal are we to D and D anyway? Like, I can answer for myself. I think not very. And I think this may be something I'd be interested to know what other people say. Like, how brand loyal are you to Dungeons and Dragons, that brand? I've talked about that in the context of making movies that uh, even though I play Dungeons and Dragons for you know a long time, I'm not particularly brand loyal to that brand. Like, people are talking about merchandising. I might have a t shirt one day, or not, maybe not anymore, but like potentially. The amount of D&D specific merchandise that I think I need is very limited. You know, I've got a friend who's got a D&D logo t-shirt, and I thought that was kind of cool. But, um, you know, I don't need D&D themed merchandise. I'm much more uh, interested in the worlds. I think, to me, it seems like Forgotten Realms or um, Dragonlance would have more brand loyalty and interest than like the D&D brand. First of all, we talk about a whole bunch of different games here on this channel, right? Um, so it's not like we're... In fact, we talk about mostly other games here on this channel when we're talking about role-playing games. But then even as far as brand or lifestyle, to me, it's it's more about the fantasy worlds than it is specifically about the Dungeons & Dragons brand. When Dungeons & Dragons was all that was out there, well, that's one thing. No problem, White Rabbit. Catch up on the replay. Uh, enjoy your morning. You too, you too. Access your inner light. Not any inner, inner light says not uh, at all anymore. Inner light says not at all anymore. But the games I play seem to be using the OGL, a lot of OSR, for instance. Yeah, and I see. I'm wondering what the impact of all that's going to be. Grim Hild says, yeah, changing the OGL 1.1 going forward for sixth ed is one thing. But Wizards of the Coast trying to unauthorize OGL 1.0A uh, 1. is much, much worse. See, and we're going to start back from the beginning here. We're going to look at the Gizmodo, which I believe the Gizmodo article is the start and the genesis of all of this, right? But see, what you're saying right here, Grim Hild, is, my, is what I would have said. I would have not been surprised at all if 6th edition was much different from 5th edition. Because you can see now they've been trying to say, hey, that 5th edition is going, 6th edition, let's call it 6th edition, 1 D&D, whatever that is. It's going to be backwards compatible with 5th edition. And uh, so that kind of makes you think we're having a continuation right here. But if they were going to do something like all of a sudden make a 1.1 OGL, it seems like 6th edition would be a completely different rule set. So then all of a sudden, if you're using 5th edition, you are using an old older version of the rules and they're trying to move the player base to the new version. And now here's this new OGL that we're going to issue these rules under that could be more constraining. Um, now then you might have a situation with Pat with fifth edition. That was a lot like Paizo and third edition and Pathfinder. And we talked about that in another video, whether or not that could happen in that kind of situation, you might be more likely to have a kind of Paizo Pathfinder situation. Maybe that's obviously that's what they want to stop. But um, yeah, I completely agree with you right here. 
Lynn Dark Knight says, I jumped ship about a year ago to Pathfinder 2E. I enjoyed the system more, but I'm bummed about pausing my D&D collection for now because of Dragonlance. Yeah, there is um, Dragonlance coming out, right? And also, see, I think this is, I mean, it must be having an impact. And you would think that in today's world, the Wizards of the Coast press team might be more on this. And I'm wondering about that from that, this perspective as well, because I've been seeing in my feeds, even people who have been very loyal to Dungeons & Dragons and also who are using the... I mean, I've got several friends who publish under the OGL, right? Uh, and I've even seen those people who are canceling orders for... There's some vaults of something book. I don't know that book. But canceling orders, pre-orders for it. Dragonlance is coming out... Um, so, you know, you think if it wasn't, if the leaks weren't true, you would think we would have something like a tweet or a statement or something like that from Wizards of the Coast clarifying something. And as far as I know right now, we don't have that. Now, if somebody knows something contrary to that, please let me know. Yeah, Trey gives us like three games every day that isn't d and if you, If you're in the Ravenkeep Discord server and you're under the other game section, Trey posts a lot of different games. And we've been looking and learning how to play them here on the Morning Grind. Um, Pathfinder, uh, to, <laughs> Access Your Light says, Pathfinder would probably be one of the first brands to be attacked if 1.0 is deauthorized. Yeah, you, when they think about how many large companies are are there that, um, you know, are, are, are significant in that regard. I mean, Paizo is definitely one of them, right? And they probably, they can't, it seems like when we, when I did the video or do we talk online, I forget about the monetization of, uh, no, about whether or not there could be a new Paizo. Uh, we were looking at who could possibly take that place. And we said there were three characteris characteristics that you would have to have. You would have to have good ideas, but good ideas uh, alone are not enough. I mean, if you have terrible ideas, you're not going to be able to do it. But good, you have to have good ideas, but good ideas are not alone. Uh, you have to have the ability to execute those ideas and execute those ideas at scale, which probably means um, industry connections for dis distribution, uh, printing at scale. So not like print on demand, but actually printing at scale, worldwide distribution, et cetera. Uh, and then you also have to have a connection to a large player base. Right, you have to have your connections. I was using the term mailing list, but I'm talking about by mailing list that can be email. It can also be, um, but more importantly, when I'm talking about mailing list, I'm talking about direct connections to people who like your work. You know, know who you are. Obviously, you're connected with them. Know who you are. Like what work you're doing. Have spent money with you in the past and are willing to spend money with you in the future. If you have that, that's a very powerful component. And there are very few people who have that um, triad. Pi the, Paizo and Pathfinder is one of them. It could have been D&D uh, &D Beyond. D&D &D Beyond could have been that, but that was purchased, right? And so we talked about in the other videos how uh, that may have been not only a technology acquisition, but also to make sure that that contact list of D&D &D players did not get out in the world. So morning, Rhino Watcher. Okay, this is another fantastic point. So the OGL is only needed if you're copying text from the SRD. And I think this is an extremely important point to bring up. Uh, and okay, so I don't know anything about fourth edition. So this is also important context. Rhino Watcher says 4E also did not have an OGL. So, right. So it's important to note, and I think this kind of thing is going to become all the more significant. Make sure that I, I've got this right. But okay, in the United States, at least, you cannot copyright a game's mechanic. That for whatever reason, right or wrong or whatever, whatever, that's not something that you can do in the United States. You can't copyright um, a game mechanic. But you can copyright the expression of that game mechanic, right? So, for instance, that's why, okay, you can't copyright the idea of taking a card, you know, at the table and then rotating it 90 degrees to have an effect on the game, right? So that's not something you can do. You can, however, copyright or trademark or whatever, tapping something, right? So if you tap the card, that's what that means. So that's why in other games, you'll have to see uh, cards will have to be used or cards will have to be exhausted or something like that, right? So I think that's very important that 
that there's not there should be, and I've I've seen this in other YouTube videos. So hopefully this will be clarified and make it be more important that if you're just trying to use mechanics, then that's fine, but you can't use the expression of those mechanics. That was an important part of the SRD, the system. Uh, I always want to say reference document, but I think it's a resource document. But the SRD is the expression of a lot of open, uh, a lot of mechanics that was explicitly able to be used. And actually, so we did take advantage of that when I was writing the um, Journey Three of Sorrows RPG in several sections because it was a fifth edition book. And so some of the character stuff that we wanted to uh, have had text from the SRD in it. And that was because we wanted it to be a unified, a unified book, you know, right? Uh, we didn't want you to have to reference something else outside of it for like some extra information on druids. If you're playing that, you know, it was right there. For example, I, druids may not have been in it. I got druids on the brain because of Ravavania. So that was so that was important that you could copy text immediately and that expression of those rules from the SRD and include them in your games. Grimhild says, Wizards of the Coast probably doesn't want to focus on a specific setting anymore for a couple of reasons. One, setting silos and two, problematic older lore. Um, uh, let me go here to Lynn. Lynn, do you think Critical Role will be exempted from their royalties collection? I have no idea. I, I have no idea. Uh, a lot of people think that Critical Role could be a force that is actually large enough as uh, Paizo was back in the day because they had Dungeons & Dragon magazine to actually make a big swing in the gaming community. So it, it does seem, it does stand to reason to me that if you are an executive at uh, Wizards of the Coast or Hasbro, you would want to keep Critical Role on board. That you wouldn't want to do anything that would make them do something else. It does seem that way to me. I have no idea. I have no behind the scenes information or anything like that. But that does seem like Critical Role is such a large cultural force that you'd want to keep them in in the uh, in the fold, like with whatever it takes. You know, if you can't buy them, like directly buy them, like um, D and D Beyond, you'd still want to keep them in the fold. Okay, so this is a continuation of Grimhild's commentary here. Uh, so setting silos and problematic older lore. One, setting silos. In second edition, they had tons of settings. Forgotten Realms, Dark Sun, Spelljammer, Planescape, Ravenleaf, Bur Ravenloft, Bur Birthright, etc. Many people interested in one setting wouldn't spend money uh, on the other settings that they didn't play in. Yeah, I, yeah, that can, that can be a problem. So, yeah, from the business perspective, you probably do want to have everybody playing in the same world. Now, I like different worlds, personally, but you can see the conflict between somebody who is playing and somebody who is sitting in the boardroom. So two, Wizards of the Coast wants to distance themselves from lore and older settings that have some insensitive stuff that hasn't aged well for a modern topic. Uh, no, that's fine. That's no, no problem at all. Uh, so this is also right. This is, this is also what I want to talk about. Oh, look, it says that we have 21 people watching, but don't, it says we have 24 people watching. So welcome, everybody. I believe this has set a record for the largest watched Morning Grind live stream. So welcome, everybody. So glad to have you here. Uh, please do hit the like button and subscribe if you found this for the first time. So uh, great to have you here. So Rhino says the leaked version is a draft. So it's being discussed and negotiated in Wizards of the Coast. Nothing is set in stone yet, which is why there is buzz trying to sway the... Uh, decision. So, right. So Rhino puts leaked in uh, scare quotes here, which I think is uh, completely valid. Whether or not this was deliberately leaked or unintentionally leaked, this is why we need to assess credibility, right? This is when I was talking about like, because we don't know this is happening, right? So what is the credibility of anything, uh, you know, of this right now? Well, we don't know, right? Now, we might be able to derive some credibility based on different sources that have come out. But right, this is a draft. It's been leaked, whether intentionally or non-intentionally. There's a lot of discussion. It seems like because Witch of the Coast, at this moment, as far as I know, has not issued a specific statement, it does seem like, well, let's just watch and see what happens. And somebody was talking on the Ravenkeep Discord server about that, that it could have been an intentional leak to kind of judge community reaction. 
So nothing is set in stone yet, which is why there is buzz trying to stay, to uh, sway. Rhino says critical role is probably who they are coming after for royalties first. Oh, really? So that's a uh, um, uh, slightly different opinion here. So it could be, it could be. I'm not actually as familiar with critical role as many people here probably are. Um, I, I know about it and I have watched some of it, but I'm not a, uh, I, I haven't dived deep into critical role. Critical role is probably who they are coming for, for royalties first. They're using their IP to make money from a legal standpoint. That's money you are leaving on the table. So would it be better to come after them? Would it be better to come after them or would it be better to buy them? That would be my question. I think I would, would be asking myself uh, if I were the boardroom. I can attack Critical Role and try to get money out of them as far as licensing goes. Or I could co-op them. You know, or I could be their friends, you know, and or, you know, just buy them directly. Which one of those is the better way? Because there's also the PR aspect. I mean, what if what if Wizards of the Coast came after a critical role? Like, I don't think that would look good for them. I mean, it doesn't say they're going to do it. Stray says, I'm not worried. If they're draconic, draconic about it, they will lose money. This is going to be TSR all over again. This time they uh, they're owned by Hasbro, though. You know, I think there's also, I, I want to talk about this in terms of corporate geekdom as well. Because, you know, on this uh, channel, I've talked about how I'm against, or I've come to be against corporate geekdom. You know, we had a really good run with a lot of great stuff that came out, I believe, starting with the Lord of the Rings uh, trilogy by Peter Jackson. And then we had some great successes in fantasy and geekdom in kind of the larger corporate sphere. But then when people realized, oh my God, this is something that makes a lot of money. We've ended up, I think we've kind of crested here. So here we're, we're understanding dungeons. It's, it's so weird to me to be talking about Dungeons and Dragons in the context of corporate geekdom because Dungeons and Dragons was always kind of the underground, at least the underground thing. It was that weird thing people were doing in the sewers, right? <laughs> uh, but now it's very mainstream and it's a corporate product, which seems weird. And I prefer the kind of um, underground geekdom stuff so maybe that's why I also look at other things because it's weird that we have to talk about Dungeons and Dragons in the term of in terms of corporate geekdom. Uh, hopefully, people. Hopefully, it will listen. Hopefully, they will listen. Maybe you know. Maybe uh, something. Th these kind of discussions that are going on here and Twitter and elsewhere are influential. Um, critical role, maybe, but also Kobold Press, Paizo, and some of the big D and D Kickstarters. Uh, yeah, I mean, we were looking at stuff by Kobold Press. What was that yesterday or the day before? Um, I like what Kobold Press is doing, but even uh, it, uh, I saw an analysis and see, this is the kind of thing that needs further analysis, but somebody was breaking down like last year, what were the top 10 Kickstarters that used the OGL and how much money did they raise in total? And so if the licensing were in place, the, the royalty for the new license were in place, how much would that have actually made for Wizards of the Coast? And it's this person was saying it's actually not a lot compared to their revenue. So why fight this? Why fight this battle for what is comparatively not a, a very small percentage of like less than, you know, like. 0.2% or something like that. So I think that could be looking at right now. Matt says, I don't think they um, would sell right now. And that Rhino, yeah, they're privately owned, right? Critical Role is privately owned. They have less incentive to sell. If if I owned it, I would probably not sell, but I'm not really a sell it kind of person. But on the other hand, you know, on the other hand, let's say you have built something up that large and then all of a sudden here you get, uh, you've been working really hard at it, you know, to make it what it is. And then all of a sudden somebody's willing to write you a big check and you get to, you know, I, I don't, I, it, it's not impossible. Cause then you get to go to Tahiti and, and sit there and, and simp your sip, sip your mint juleps. Um, but then again, you're surrendering something that is kind of the underground. I, I don't know because critical role is, is privately owned. Is that the geek underground or is that still corporate geekdom? It's so big that you think that's this, this corporate geekdom, but I still think that, you know, if critical role is privately owned, even though, it's as far as the geek underground goes, I would say critical role is very much mainstream geek culture, but is it mainstream culture in general? That's an interesting one. 
corporate geekdom will always destroy what it's promoting. Yeah, Lynn, uh, Lynn Dark Knight says, oh, the good old days when we worshiped Satan to ensure our dice rolled well. <laughs> Hi, guitar guy, Nick. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, see, BGD says, yeah, so what you're saying is we've passed peak geek. Yeah, maybe we need to use that term. I like that. So we've passed peak geek. Maybe, maybe um, there needs to be a, an underground, a counter, a counter revolution. I don't know. The, the counter, what's the, the geek counterculture to corporate geekdom? That needs to come back. That needs to come back. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Critical Role was with Geek and Sundry. I had forgotten about that. So they were with Geek and Sundry. They left to be on their own. So I can't see CR selling out and losing their own autonomy. So yeah, that so they have demonstrated in the past that they want their own autonomy. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, Shinpai Kuga says, the OGL has provisions for custom license offers. I'm pretty sure Critical Role is just going to get something custom. The fact that they also represent a whole lot of free marketing for them. So, right. Um, there is that idea of, right, that, oh, other licenses can be negotiated directly. And so it may be that that's the way they go with something like Critical Role. Um, okay. So let's let's do a couple more. And then I want to bring up the Gizmodo uh, article and then a couple of other things that I found. Because I was still going through all of this as well. Uh, but OSR says, uh, OSR says, Interlight says, OSR has gotten the underground geekdom feeling down. Which I, oh. They have got the underground geekdom feeling down, which is probably why I like it more. There's an article on PBS recently that completely trashed OSR players. I was seeing something on P uh, like PBS headlines. Now, I didn't get to read that either. Maybe that's something I should read and take a look at for possibly doing a video on. I, I was also, I was seeing like two days ago, wondering if the rolling a D20 is gatekeeping. Did anybody see that? I had that on the list to make a video on. But you're right. Uh, I would say you're completely right, Inner Light. If you are looking for an underground geekdom feeling in uh, the current gaming environment, it might be OSR. Yes, we actually have 31 people now. Here, let me put the Discord link again. Uh, we have 31 people watching. Uh, well, let me throw out the Discord link. I want to set up some... Uh, the next step, I put our um, Raven Keep. I put our... Um, sort of guidelines up. And the next step I want to do is put up forums, things like that, so we have more in-depth discussions. But yes, please uh, come by and join the uh, Ravenkeep forum. Zeblik says, it's time to create mazes and monsters and use new art. Well, you know, we've got castles and crusades. We've got tunnels and trolls. We need to look at tunnels and trolls and castles and crusades on uh, the morning grind. Uh, I've got, I've had the castles and crusades handbook here for a while and I haven't gotten into it. Uh, I've got, I found a PDF copy of it so we can look at it maybe next week on the morning grind, but I've never looked at tunnels and trolls. So I need to look at tunnels and trolls as well. Rhino says Hasbro is planning multimedia monetization of D and D. They will have movies, lunch boxes, video games, tabletops, making streamers mad is a small percentage of the total pie. Could be, uh, yet yeah, see, I want to know what's going on with this. We've talked about this D and D movie on the channel as well. I could, I did a, a video on how to make that good and because they're really dumb ways to make, they're really ways to make that terrible. Um, and then I saw the trailer and I think they made, they found a new way to make it terrible. And it may have been you Rhino who was saying, there was somebody who was saying in the, um, my commentary on that trailer that what they're trying to do is make the D and D brand, the Marvel brand. And so when I saw that comment on the YouTube uh, comments, I went, Oh, that does make sense. Going back and looking at that trailer. Now, I, I still, it still didn't impress me. But looking back at that trailer and going, oh, somebody said, what's working right now? Marvel, arguably, or what has worked, Marvel. Make a Dungeons & Dragons Marvel movie. Going back and watching that trailer with that in mind does kind of make sense what they're trying to do. Guitar Guy Nick says, the biggest issue with the OGL is that they are testing to see how many third-party people are on their radar so they can bring down the cap of $750,000 to catch more of them. Uh, maybe. So the biggest issue with the OGL is that they are testing to see how many third-party people are on their radar 
so they can bring down the cap. Oh, so like, yeah, because they see that was one of my issues. That one one of the big no go kinds of issues to me because it's possible that I would want to put stuff out on uh, using the OGL or you know originally uh, for either Rabavania or Theophany. But having to report all of that, all their reporting requirements, I was like, wait, what's going on? I, I'm not interested in giving myself all that overhead. I mean, not happening. Len Dark says, the only way to decide is the president of Wizards versus the president of CR in a bare knuckles fight. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, let's, uh, I want to bring this up right here. So as far as I know, this is the original write-up as far as the leak goes, right? This is the, the Gizmodo article. Let me refresh. So this came out, it says, well, it says that it was updated yesterday at 2.57 p.m. So I wasn't even aware of this really until like 9 or 10 o'clock last night. And I was trying to catch up on what everybody is saying on Twitter. So... There was a leak of this, right? And and what is her name here? Linda. So Linda Codega got a hold of this. So despite reassurances from Wizards of the Coast last month, and I really didn't even get too much into that, the original OGL would become an unauthorized agreement. And so that seems to be controversial too. Can you choose to unauthorize the original OGL? And it appears that no new content will be committed, be permitted to be created under the original license. I've got some additional information on that because I was trying to find that because that was the original shock to me was that can you un-OGL? Maybe, maybe not. But my inclination was how you can't un-OGL. So we're talking about that this re this refers to the system reference document because as we've said you can't copyright mechanics you can copyright the expression of mechanics but the system resource document was stuff that you could directly copy from was the expression of mechanics that everybody could use right under the terms of the OGL that's how it went right so the creation of the OGL version 1.0 2000 let's see um Okay, so here we go. Right, so most of us know that. So in 2022, when Wizards of the Coast plans, and, and by the way, I, this this may talk about it right here, but also I saw going by on Twitter that they're talking about making this distinction uh, quick, like that, that, that they're trying. I thought that, oh, this is something that's going to be changing with the OGL when one D&D comes out like next year or something like that. But I was seeing something on Twitter that they want to change this like now which also kind of shocked me if that's true. Let's see if this says uh, anything about it. So I was expecting that, well, okay, we have the revised Dungeons and Dragons rules and we're going to update the OGL when that comes out. But maybe it's sooner than that. And I see, has anybody read the actual leak? This, this surprised me that, okay, a lot actually. The original open gaming license is a relatively short document coming in at under 900 words. The new draft, which was provided to io9 by a non WOTC developer, is over 9,000 words long. Has anybody actually read that or, or know where we can find that? If you know where you can find that, could you please post a link uh, in the comments or also in the Discord server? Because I would like to be able to take a look directly at this 9,000 word document for credibility issues, right? Because you're, you're relying on what other people say about things. So if there's access to this 9,000 word document, I'd like to see it. But on the other hand, in order to publish some role-playing stuff, I don't want to read a 9,000 word license and have to agree with all that. It addresses new technologies like blockchains, NFTs, and takes a strong stance against bigoted content, explicitly stating the company may terminate the agreement if third-party creators publish material that is blatantly racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, bigoted, or otherwise discriminatory. Now, see, technology is another thing that I think is important to address. Because I can see, I mean, a lot has changed in 20 years as far as technology goes. And that's why I would have said, well... Yeah, probably a new license is going to communicate a lot of, uh, is going to deal with a whole lot of new technology stuff. So if there's just a sixth edition and a new OGL for sixth edition, yeah, probably there's a lot of stuff we need to think about as far as technology goes. 
that um, was not even around then. Guitar Guy Nick says, I wouldn't recommend OSR due to their transphobia and Republican views. Rhino Watcher says, free marketing, uh, <clears throat> free marketing critical role gives WOTC is like saying paying an artist is expo in exposure has merit. Yeah, um, I I'm sure they're doing a major breakdown on that. Free marketing CR, the free marketing that Critical Role gives to Wizard of the Coast is like saying paying an artist in exposure has merit. Yeah, I, I can, Wizards of the Coast would take, probably take a lot of that, uh, that perspective. D&D, &D, the flamethrower. I'm not sure what that has to do. Uh, what that's a reference to. Stray says, uh, your inner light, LOL, come to think of it, I do need a new cult robe after that last fireball fall. Guitar Guy Nick says, sorry, not OSR. So this is uh, not OSR, but TSR, maybe? Okay, well, we'll see. Uh, Guitar Guy Nick says, as a uh, Pathfinder 2nd Edition player, they want to revoke the OGL that Pathfinder is created on. Um, so we've just been starting to look at Pathfinder 2nd Edition here on this channel. Uh, for some reason, it fell off my personal radar after first edition, and I've been trying to get back to that to see what it's all about, because the books are over here on my shelf. So Stray says, Guitar Guy Nick, it's funny uh, It's funny. I read what you put, but it registered as TSR, not OSL, no, OSR, LOL. Seems my brain pan agrees with you. I don't know anything about that side of it. Um, we're primarily, I, you know, when I'm looking at these things, I'm primarily just looking at the rules and stuff. Guitar Guy Nick, LOL. KL says, how much of this do you think is because of the fact that the president of Hasbro, the president of Wizards of the Coast, and vice president of Wizard of the Coast all come from Microsoft? Well, no, I didn't know that. Uh, I didn't know that. Uh, so that's interesting. That, well, <laughs> if that's the case, that does seem to shed some additional light on that, right? Um, because that's what I'm talking about with corporate geekdom. You know, whether or not, well, you know, the, the idea of corporate geekdom and what it is that a, a disconnect between corporate leadership and what uh, the people who are enjoying this and actually the, the consumers and the player base want. So there's that disconnect. When you get those things right, you can really create some amazing things. But then if you don't, if you get that wrong and you start alienating your player base, which seems to, or, you know, your fan base in general, which seems to happen we've or we've seen instances where that's happened in several different properties and now all of a sudden we might be seeing it with dungeons and dragons you would think somebody would learn eventually guitar guy nick says i think the nerd immersion made the cynical point uh i think nerd immersion made the cynical point that the racism and transphobia is targeted at tsr for their outbursts so they can control their output not that they actually care about those things in a meaningful way See the Hadozy debacle? I, I don't know anything about that. So uh, I don't know anything about that. So uh, we'll have to, I mean, could be, I don't, uh, maybe somebody else knows. Uh, okay, so, now of course, you know, the pro but the problem with this is always um, who is adjudicating it. Now, of course, if it's your license and you're licensing something out, then who adjudicates uh, what would or would not fall under this category? It would be the person whose license it is. I mean, that would make sense. If it's Wizards of the Coast license, it's Wizards of the Coast. But it's it's not so much Wizards of the Coast in general. It's whoever is actually the person who is adjudicating this kind of stuff. Uh, okay. But one of the biggest changes to the document is that it updates the previously available OGL 1.0 to state that it is no longer an authorized license agreement. By ending the original OGL, many licensed publishers will have complete overhaul of their products and distribution in order to comply with the updated rules. Large publishers who focus almost exclusively on products based on the original OGL, including Paizo, Cobalt Press, and Green Ronin, will be under pressure to update their business model incredibly fast. So incredibly fast. And so when I was thinking about incredibly fast, I was thinking about, yeah, if this comes out in... Um, 2024, then 
yeah, that's pretty fast in order to have to make adjustments to, especially if you're doing print stuff. Now, it's still not easy to update like formatted and laid out PDFs and things like that. But also, you know, moving to print models, that's you may already have stuff in, in print and blah, blah, blah. That's, you know, a year would be fast to make adjustments, but they might be talking about even faster than that. So this is no mistake. According to the document procured by io9, the new agreement states that the open gaming license was always intended to allow the community to help grow D&D and expand it creatively. It wasn't intended to subsidize major competitors, especially now that PDF is by far the most common form of distribution. So, you know, at the time, I remember when we were talking about the original OGL license and what that was trying to do. I remember there being a concern way back then. Of course, there was there was excitement, of course, but then there was concern that, oh, this is actually wasn't that Wizards of the Coast at the time that was after Wizards of the Coast had bought uh, D&D from TSR or bought TSR. Uh, yeah, it was. It was. So I thought so there was some concern then that, oh, the OGL is a way to drive off, excuse me, to drive off competitors, right, to destroy competing things that are not D&D, because everybody will want to be making rules that are game or game supplements that have to do with the D and D rules. And so all there will be is D and D that we're about to enter a zone where, you know, any of the independent kinds of games so much as it was, because that was still mainly print distribution at the time uh, are just going to be uh, cut off at the knees. So there was some concern. I remember that the OGL was intended to eliminate competition for other game systems. So now I think it's interesting here that we've got this idea that potentially the OGL has subsidized the competitors to D&D. &D. And see, that's what, what is D&D? &D? That's a very different, the answer to that question is very different than what is Forgotten Realms or what is Dragonlance, right? What is D&D? &D? At, its, as it, as its core, is D&D &D only a set of mechanics? And I think that has to do with one of the reasons why I don't feel particularly brand loyal to d and I mean, I've, I've enjoyed d and I like d and um, But Dungeons & Dragons itself is not something that I would want to make part of my lifestyle. It's Tabletop gaming would be. Tabletop role-playing gaming in general ob obviously is. I run this channel and I do this show. <laughs> but uh, my the any type of identity, should we say, I don't. it's not surrounding D&D specifically. So the sentiment is reiterated later in the document. The OGL wasn't intended to fund major competitors and it wasn't intended to allow people to make D&D apps, videos, or other things that printable materials while use in gaming. We were updating the OGL in part to make that clear. And that's why I said if it was just a revision for the OGL for the sixth edition, <clears throat> I would get it. Like there weren't D&D apps, videos, and all that in 2000, whenever that first one came off. So that's something that probably should be addressed. Paizo didn't comment. See, and this is Chris Promise. Promise, founder of Green Roden Publishing. There isn't any benefit to switching to the new one as described. So he's definitely taking in that <coughs> a switch. Like, you're not going to unauthorize something, but why would I switch over to something? So Wish of the Coast declined to comment. I hadn't said this. A spokesman directly directed to the 09 blog to a blog post the company published in December, which reassures the community that will not materially affect the majority of people working in the industry. So I do want to bring that up because I read that, but I didn't get a chance to talk about it. So the <clears throat> so what will happen to the original OGL? The original OGL granted perpetual worldwide and non-exclusive license to open game content commonly called the system resource document and directed that licensees may use any, un any authorized version of this license, any authorized, well, okay. So any authorized version of this license to copy, modify, and distribute any open game content originally distributed under any version of the license. But the updated OGL says this agreement is an updated to the previous available OGL, which is no longer an authorized license agreement. So I guess that's our key terms, right? So it seems like, okay, you get under the OGL perpetual, worldwide and non-exclusive license to use the system re system resource document. And again, I think it's important again to say that's what we're talking about. Not the mechanics, right? But the text 
of the, the, the resource system resource document, the open game content system resource document, right? You get perpetual worldwide and non-exclusive license to do that. But it doesn't say, and this seems to be a key word. Now, looking back, looking in retrospect, I'm looking for these different words. And these are words that other people have brought up, not my analysis, but other people will look at in just a moment. Uh, could be, uh, well, I don't have the notes here. But that it doesn't say that it's non-revocable. So if you're given perpetual worldwide and non-exclusive license to do something, that sounds pretty good, but it could still be revocable. If you are given perpetual worldwide, non-exclusive, and irrevocable license to do something, that would be even better. And now we have this word right here, may use any authorized version of this license to copy, modify, and distribute. And so is that another way to get out of it? That, well, who determines whether a, a version is authorized or not? Well, Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro would undoubtedly say themselves. So is there more room in what happened here than we in, in this language than we may have first been aware? I think it's an interesting topic here. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we got some more information on the Hadoos uh, on here. Let's let's skip that. Uh, so, but okay. So on the subject of the OGL, Grim Hild says before the OGL, before Wizard of the Coast, TSR would legally attack any website with third party D and D homebrew. That's okay. So that seems to be part of what's going on here, um, which I was not aware of, and I certainly wasn't aware of at the time. That one of the things that TSR did was be very heavily uh, litigious, I guess is the word, against third-party material or fan content or, or things like that that was using stuff from Dungeons & Dragons. So is that the case? Uh, and so I, I had been reading then that the OGL and the system resource document was a, 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 another, another reason that may have come about was saying that we're deliberately not doing that right? That we're deliberately not doing that. Um, and we're going to be much more welcoming to other people in the community than had previously been the case. So I, I don't know how that, like without the internet, that would have been largely pre-internet, right? So I don't know how I would have gotten that information. I would have also been much younger. Stray said, as far as the information regarding uh, TSR's um, legal tactics, I wouldn't have had access to necessarily. Stray says, what's D&D? &D? Well, you see, a dragon loves a dungeon very much. <laughs> Grimhild says, I started college in 92, and that was when the web was new, and we used a lot of FTP sites and used it before the web made it easier. Back then, homebrewers were upset and started calling them T uh, dollar sign R. I do remember, I think I do remember that. Because, yeah, the internet was around. Um of course, you know, of course, in 2000, but it wasn't uh, doing the things it's doing now, obviously. But I do remember, I do remember that moniker, T, um, the T dollar sign R. I, I remember also the, um, but, you know, I, I just remember generally liking the TSR stuff. And so when all of a sudden, like, I, I just remember, oh, TSR is going down. I remember being, oh my God, like how terrible. And that Wizard of the Coast is buying them. Of course, they had uh, Magic the Gathering, and I wasn't into Magic the Gathering. And I remember then kind of like, uh-oh, corporate, I didn't have the term, but it would have been the same sentiment. Uh-oh, corporate geekdom, right? <laughs> corporate geekdom. Wizards of the Coast is coming in to buy TSR. Guitar Guy Nick says, Hasbro are doing a capitalism, and they want to monetize, monopolize the space so that they are the red dragon in the TTRPG space. I hate it. My new BBEG is Wizards of the Coast, and then it's Hasbro. Grimhild says, when Wizards of the Coast took over and released the OGL with D&D 3E, a lot of people were relieved. Right. So those are the two sides of the coin. So the relief with that, right, that, oh, my God. So if that was, if that was all the case, when I wasn't aware of that at the time, all of the TSR legal situations, I can definitely see that the release of the OGL and the SRD with D&D 3E would be a major weight off people's shoulders. That would have been incredible. 
there would be the counter to that, that, oh, here's another way to take to take out competing systems because everybody's going to run to that. But in that case, I can definitely see it being a relief. And if you were one of those people who thought, oh, my God, here we have the relief, then all of a sudden what's going on now or being rumored and leaked, I can see being a major concern. Uh, let's see. The new document clarifies further in the warranty section that this agreement governs your use of the licensed content and unless you other, unless otherwise stated in this agreement, any prior agreements between you and us are no longer in force. So is an agreement then the use of the license? According to attorneys consulted for this article, the new language may indicate that Wizards of the Coast is rendering any future use of the original OGL void and asserting that if anyone wants to continue the use of open game content of any kind, they will need to abide by the terms of the updated OGL, which is far more restrictive than the original OGL. Wizards of the Coast declined to clarify. If the original license is in fact no longer viable, every single licensed publisher will be affected by the new agreement because every commercial creator will be asked to report their products old and new to Wizards of the Coast, which is not something I would be interested in doing. <laughs> like that right there alone is not something I'd be interested in doing. Additionally, while the OGL did not specifically outline what kind of content third-party creators could make available and profit from, the updated OGL is very specific. The updated license only allows for the creation of role-playing games and supplements in printed media and static electronic file formats. It does not allow for anything else, including but not limited to things like videos, virtual tabletops or VTT campaigns, computer games, novels, apps, graphics, novels, music, songs, dance, and pantomimes. The, the inclusion here of pantomimes, that's what, what does that refer to? I mean, I know what pantomimes are, but in the context of Dungeons and & Dragons and tabletop games, what does pantomimes refer to? Who's doing D&D &D pantomimes? That sounds like something I need to check out. <laughs> Let's see what that is. I don't know. Uh, why is that one being included? Um, you have to have a separate fan content policy agreement. The fan content po policy includes fan art, videos, podcasts, blogs, websites, streaming content, tattoos, altars on your cl clerics, deity, etc. Okay. Oh, oh, so this so on my first pass, I missed that. So here's our date, right? The leaked OGL 1.1 draft indicates which the coast may not give licenses, a lot of licensees, a lot of time to adjust or agree to this new policy. This document reads, uh, if you want to publish SRD based content on or after January 13, 2023 and commercialize it, your only option is to agree to the OGL commercial. Like, what is this? This is already the sixth. I mean, I was thinking that a fast uh, update would be a year, but like next week? <laughs> See, that, that also is surprising to me because like, like if this is a draft thing, this is leaked. I mean, that date, like they would be putting something out or, or a comment or something like that. I mean, they'd have to publish this like Monday or something like that or Tuesday. Maybe they're judging the reaction or whatever in order to make that kind of adjustment for next week, because that just seems shockingly fast. So that's where that January 13th date comes from. Like, what? OG, uh, uh, io9 source indicated that the final version of the document was originally intended for release January 4th, which is still not a lot of time at all, which would have given companies and creators seven business days to agree and comply. Like, what are we talking about? That's, that's fast. Uh, I think that's about the Hato situation or something. I don't know anything about. Okay, so David62, welcome. Uh, welcome, David62. I played every edition of D&D &D as well as Pathfinder and Starfinder and other OSR games. In our OSR game, we had three men, one openly gay, three women, and one who identifies as other. Nash Wise. Uh, Nash Wise. Hey, Heath, are we w welcome? Welcome, Nash. Good to have you. Hey, Heath, are we going to be mad at the new license? I've already got my pitchforks. OK, <laughs> well, wh I, what I'm trying to do is make sure we've got the information and discussing information as it is right here and also trying to assess some type of credibility here, because uh, this certainly affects um, me and a lot of people that I know who publish OGL stuff like that's that right there. We were just looking at if that were true. I, I don't even know what like, first of all, it means that I would not choose to publish any OGL stuff out of the, the material that I'm making. But also, like, 
I've got two friends I can think of immediately who have works out in the OGL. And like that, that was, that would be insanely fast. So, I mean, that would be ridiculous. And because I've got those books that were written with OGL content that have not been published yet, I have no idea what happened there. So uh, if these kinds of things come to fruition, uh, it's definitely going to have an impact on me and other people. If your OSR game is marginalizing others, it's your community, not the game. Uh, well, Interlight says no need to be angry about it. If you don't like it, don't use it. There are other systems out there that might have your own open, might have their own open gaming license. And I think there are, right. Um, yeah, there, so there's a distinction here between definitely the players as well and then also the publishers. So yeah, I like this is not going to be a topic. I, I'll probably consolidate my thoughts and we'll put out a separate YouTube video on it. But this is one of those things that like how much, it, how much should we talk about it? We're in a situation where maybe if this was leaked to judge community reaction, that talking about it does help, right? But there's a distinction between the players and also the publishers, right? Um, for players, if you don't like it, the situation is easy. Let's just play something else. We've, we, we go over a, like several new RPGs every week. We've been looking at basically one a day for the past two months here on the Morning Grind. So there's a lot of stuff out there to use. There are other open gaming systems. Um, that you can use and you can but see if you're a player, that doesn't even matter, right? If you're a player now, it might matter from what type of material you get from publishers, but if you're a player, um, whether or not a particular system that you like is open and you're not planning on publishing stuff because your homebrew stuff, you can all do, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a non-issue. The, the question is what's this doing to publishers? So I can see more concern about, yeah, and maybe even anger. <laughs> yeah, if you're a publisher, especially if you've got books in the works, or books that are already being printed, you know, or books that are being you know, have layout being done and all that kind of stuff, like seems to be the case with people I know and me, because I've got a book, got two books written, um, actually three, two books that I wrote and one book that I edited that have not been published yet that are supposedly under this license. Um, and now all of a sudden things are changing. You know, that's that's a different kind of situation. Lynn Dark Knight says, uh, access your inner light. Try to think about wrath and glory. So hoping it's a good departure from the D20 system. In the original OGL, all they needed to do was put in a two-page credit to how to use it now. Hasbro wants royalties. Mike Hansford says, this may be one of those scenarios where it winds up in the courtroom. TSR, Watsi, Hasbro may not like the eventual outcome. Well, they might not. Uh, and so I'm wondering who's going to do that, because I'd be very interested to know how this goes in court. But who has the resources to fight Hasbro? Right. I mean, that, that's that's a, a thing about the system is that there is a situation with what is the legality of the situation? And uh, could we get some kind of determination on this? Maybe this is something that a court should determine uh, to really look into this. And you would ideally like it to, you know, competent lawyers on both sides to make their arguments and then comp a competent judge to evaluate all of this and then make a competent decision that comes down. Ideally, that's the way you would like it to happen. Uh, but even before it gets there, you've got to go through the, the issue of the money that it would take to fight something like this. And can, can, can Paizo or Critical Role, if they decided that they wanted to um, uh, go to court with Hasbro, uh, compete with their financial resources. I was thinking about this the other day because uh, it, it might be possible because you would, you would expect then that what would happen is that, well, I don't, Hasbro might not want it to go to court. And so they would just stall and they would just stall and they have the resources to just stall things out. And then eventually the cost would become too, too uh, large to bear for uh, some other, wh whatever company is bringing the suit. Right. But it might be the case that in social media world today, that that company, that kind of strategy wouldn't be as um, wouldn't be as viable in the past because it would be all about how Wizards of the Coast or Hasbro is stalling. Like we want this to be adjudicated in a court. You know, here's our argument. We want it to be heard. And Hasbro, for all these different reasons, or Wizards of the Coast or whatever, is not allowing is, is using stall tactics to try to prevent it from being heard. That would generate even more ill will toward them in the social media sphere. Now, maybe it's the same people who were already upset, so maybe they wouldn't lose anybody. But it seems like uh, in a social media environment, if you are um, 
stalling and not allowing a decision to come out. Maybe that's maybe that's a way to compete here or well, a way to get that done. We are now using a tiered earning systems. There is also some clarity about patron and tips. Basically, if your content is available for free elsewhere, but people can support you voluntarily without having their access affected, you're considered non-commercial. Uh, that's an interesting clarification there. So will OGL publishers have to pay royalties? Probably not. Unless they're making over $750,000, licensees get to keep their money that they earn. Uh, let me turn back on my uh, do not disturb. Uh, but the new OGL states that the commercial agreement covers all commercial uses, whether they're profitable or not. So if you go in the red on Kickstarter that earns $800,000 in backing money, you will still owe Wizards of the Coast, regardless of the fact that you did not profit from your venture. Now, uh, did, does this go into, it seems to be tiered. So taking a, a percentage cut, a license fee on $750,000 or above, could be all of a sudden a major shock and expense to somebody who's running a crowdfunding campaign. But I was reading someplace else that it's tiered. So if you make the, you, uh, you hit this license at $750,000. So if you hit, if you make $750,000 and $1, you only have to pay the license fee on the $1. Is that, is that true? Can people clarify that for me? Give me a fact check on that, that you wouldn't all of a sudden be paying 25% royalties on all $750,000, you would be paying royalties on $1 if you're $1 above that $750,000 threshold. Is that true? Somebody please give me a fact check so I can uh, uh, be clear on that because that would seem to make sense because all of a sudden, if you hit that threshold and then all of a sudden a 25% chunk leaves, that would not be sustainable. Uh, Kickstarters, like, you're not operating often on that large a uh profit margin anyway. So if you all of a sudden, all of a sudden have a very, uh, if people are ex in, insanely enthusiastic about your product and you take it to Kickstarter and all of a sudden your Kickstarter blows up and yeah, you do raise $800,000 in backing money. I mean, when we're running our, when we ran our Kickstarters or when I ran my Kickstarters that we were doing, I mean, you know, all of that is planned out in advance. How much has to be paid, you know, to different places and, and all of that in order to figure out if the Kickstarter is viable, if it brings in this number of backers and raises this amount of money and, and all of that's planned out on spreadsheets in advance to all of a sudden have a 25% additional expense tacked on to <laughs> uh, your Kickstarter uh, could be absolutely crippling. It could be crippling. Trey says, if they're not careful, Critical Role, CR, is already publishing their own material and if pushed, could decide to make their own RPG without any basis on the OGL. Well, right. That's why that's one of the reasons I would say that it seems to be a good idea for Wizards of the Coast to want to keep Critical Role on their good side. That either you would want to buy them, but if you can't buy them, then the next thing you do is you're very, very friendly to them because um, you know, the Critical Role, somebody else brought up Roll20. The Roll20 has a large connection to the community. Uh, as far as player base, it, you know, it's, it's mailing list. There are a lot of people who like what uh, Roll20, the tabletop thing, thing does. A lot of people use that. That has a big connected player base. And then, hey, maybe a, a combination of Critical Role and Roll20. That could be that could be a major thing in the community. Because, yeah, uh, Critical Role could decide to publish its own stuff. It's And that could be a large enough swing. That could be a very large swing. Wizards of the Coast bought TSR after they messed up Magic the Gathering. Oh, I didn't know they had messed up Magic the Gathering. I never, I, I am the most casual Magic the Gathering player you could possibly be. Uh, and I never was in the past. I had friends uh, who in that time were big Magic the Gathering players. I missed that whole wave. Today, I'm an extremely casual uh, Magic the Gathering fan. Or Magic the Gathering player. I wouldn't necessarily say a fan. I would say a very casual player of Magic the Gathering. Yeah. Uh, seven days? Yeah. David's talking about the amount of time before the license would come into uh, effect. David62 uh, says originally it would be seven days, not a year. And that's that just seems absurd to me. Like, again, I can see it if they were going to put it out with one D&D. &D, but 
that's so crazy to me. That's one of the crazy parts. Um, so here's where that you can reach out to, you can have a more custom and mutually beneficial licensing agreement uh, arranged with you. Indicating that WOTC is at least open to creating custom contracts and agreements, but at their own discretion. This could indicate that subsidized competition like Pathfinder may not be getting a great deal. So revenue tiers, initiate tier. If you have registered at least one licensed work, but haven't generated $50,000 or more in total gross revenue from the OGL, commercial products in a given year, you are at the initiate tier. Intermediate tier. If your licensed works have generated more than $50,000 in total revenue in a given year, but less than $750,000, you are at the intermediate tier. If you've generated at least $750,000 in total revenue in a given year, you are at the expert tier. So according to the document, if not only if you are generating a significant amount of money from your licensed works, the revenue you make from your licensed works in excess of $750,000 in a single calendar year is considered qualifying revenue. You are, wait, in excess. Okay, so here's what we're looking for. So it does look like, according to this document, that's true. The revenue you make from your licensed works in excess of $750,000 in a single calendar year is considered qualifying revenue, and you're responsible for paying us 20% or 25% of that qualifying revenue. Okay, so okay, so this is where I saw that, yes. So the draft goes on to explain that if you make $750,001, you will owe Wizards of the Coast 25 cents because they are only asking for royalties on the $1 made in, in excess of the expert tier. And they're expecting less than 20 companies to be in that expert tier. But it is still total, which means gross revenue. Gross revenue. So that's why even if you are not profitable, you still owe it. Rhino Watcher says, yeah, to it, TSR sued everyone often. And I didn't know that. I didn't know that. TSR sued everyone often. They even sued Gygax after he left for making a game called Dangerous Dimensions. TSR, Lynn, uh, Dark Knight says TSR had no chill, which is, this has become entirely new information to me uh, as far as what happened back there uh, with all of that kind of stuff. Oh, guitar guy, Nick, see you later. Have to go. Got some guitar teaching to do. Well, have fun. <laughs> yeah, you have fun too. Sounds interesting. KL says, um, it's interesting that Wizard of the Coast removed alignment from monsters before they revealed that they were in fact a business monster. From now on, we should write it Wizards of the Coast, typically lawful evil. <laughs> so uh, Andrew Andrew has some information on pantomimes. Thank you, Andrew. So re-pantomimes, sometimes contract language is lifted wholesale from other agreements. It's shocking when you push back on some terms and realize the drafter does not know why a clause is used. I can completely believe that. So that, that could totally be the case. Maybe it, was maybe it wasn't uh, thought about uh, specifically in terms of maybe it's something that was pulled from something else. Because probably maybe something else uh, that was pulled over that this was based on or something thought they needed to distinguish pantomimes from movies or something like that splinterverse good to see you and, and hey thank you for being here andrew good to see you splinterverse says the leak could be deliberate it could be it could be and it could be judging our reaction which we are giving right now hey we've got 39 people here so welcome welcome i we might have actually reached up and touched 40 people for uh just a moment i'm seeing so welcome everybody it's so good to have you here Welcome. Please, please do like and subscribe if you enjoy it. And hey, there is a Discord server link in the chat. Would love to have you on the Ravenkeep Discord server as well. So the link could be deliberate, right? Uh, yeah, it could have been done so that we could judge uh, what the reaction is going to be. And that's maybe why we don't have a statement from Wizards of the Coast, I was saying, uh, because they're all just watching. So Zeblik, welcome Zeblik. Zeblik says, pantomime is the art of imitating, presenting, or acting out situations, characters, or events through the use of physical gestures and body movements. Well, right. Yeah, I know what pantomimes are. I was wondering if there was a specific example of somebody doing well with D&D branded or themed pantomimes that they were might specifically be thinking about. Um, Richard Franzen. Welcome, Richard. Richard says, I think th that time frame demonstrates their confidence in this holding up in court. They're hoping they can pressure creators into agreeing before it's challenged in court. Well, that's an interesting perspective. 
Thank you, Richard. So there's that's a that's a good point. That if they thought, well, no, you said I think the time frame demonstrates their confidence in this holding up in court. So you're saying that it you think that it demonstrates lack of confidence because if it did if it was going to take place in a year, they said, listen, this is the way it's going to be. It's going to take place in a year that would allow people to organize like a lawsuit or a legal challenge, right? And so if they were confident that it was going to hold up and you've got the year, then the lawsuit might come and they the, the lawsuit people are bringing the lawsuit lose and then it takes effect. So perhaps you're meaning here they don't think this would hold up in court. And so they're hoping that by a fast time frame, they're playing, they're just trying to get it, uh, get people to agree to it out of panic or, you know, just rush them because they've got books in print and all this kind of stuff before it gets challenged. So that's, that's very interesting thinking. Thank you, Richard, for that perspective. Splinterverse says our books take months. Yeah, mine too, or years. <laughs> we already have a project in the works where we've spent money well in advance. Yeah. Um, I, I can't imagine already having books at the printers. I don't at the moment for, uh, so thank goodness. And I'm not sure. I know that I have friends who already have books printed. I have one friend who probably, you know, the books, the infinite black publishing the books that I've written, maybe, um, I don't know what their status is. So it might be early enough to change. I don't think it's, you know, being laid out right now. I don't think probably art is still being done, but yeah, if you already had it laid out and you were, man, you, you could be out a lot of money. Like I'd be wondering what in the world do we do? I'd be taking a serious look at this and figure out what you do as a publisher. Access Your Inner Light says, I think pantomime is being used because it's the most basic form of visual performance with all other visual performances building on them, but still considered pantomimes. Well, it could be. That could be it too. That could be it too. There, there's got to be some, um, some reason. Uh, that somebody needed to make that legal distinction. Oh, we just hit 40 people. We just hit 40 people. Hey, let me drop uh, the Discord server link again. That way you don't have to go searching for it. Ready to keep Discord server. We'd love to have you. Uh, let's see. See, who has to register? The updated OGL says that no matter what tier you are in or how much money you believe your product will make, you must register with us any new licensed work you intend to offer for sale. This is just adding um, This is just adding overhead. There's already so much overhead you have to do if you're going to be a publisher. Because we talk about that on the channel as well, that there's the creative side of things and there's the business side of things, right? And so if you want to be a creative because you want to start creating your own, uh, well, in this case, specifically, we're talking about RPG stuff. There's all the time you need to spend in the creative activity of creating, but then there's all this other time you got to spend in the business side of stuff, which is not being, you know, your core creative activity. You got to separate your core creative activity from your business side of stuff. And, you know, hey, let's add something that has to go on in the business side of things to the um, yeah, to the stuff you have to do, which means you can't be doing your core creative work. Because most companies like this are going to be small, possibly just one person, right? So, um Add registering your products, including a description of the licensed work. We'll also ask you for your contact information, information on where you intend to publish the licensed work, its price, among other things. Just, just adding. See, that to me seems to just be discourage people from doing it. It would discourage me from doing it, right? Just adding overhead. Creators will also be required to use a specific badge in order to publicly and obviously identify their work as covered by the updated OGL, and they have to give WotC a copy of the publication. The early draft uh, suggests that many of these processes will be handled through the company's official digital tool set, d d Beyond. So, right, yeah, a, a huge advantage of the original OGL is you don't have to do any kind of reporting. While it makes sense that Wizards wants to monitor those who are using its opening game, open game content, it feels like an impossible task. People are selling their work across dozens of platforms, and sometimes one product is being sold on multiple platforms. So yeah, yeah. What, whatever the reporting system looks like, the biggest burden will likely be on the smallest creators. Yeah, right. You're putting, this is a huge problem that you encounter with general bureaucracy in the world today when you were trying to be a small creator, um, that you just don't have the resources to do all this kind of overhead and stuff like that. Okay, now this right here, Kickstarter is D&D's, let me go to the comments, but Kickstarter is D&D's preferred crowdfunding platform. I think this is pretty interesting. As somebody who's used Kickstarter extensively, uh, I think this section is kind of interesting here. 
Pan Smith. Hey, Pan, welcome. Good to see you. Pan says the damage has already been done. If this were a trial balloon, they rolled a one. A one. Good stream. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, see, I'm inclined to agree with you here as well because of what I've been seeing just on my own feeds and things like that. A lot of people are already canceling their pre-orders for new D&D books that are being pre-ordered and that are out uh, or, or, or the pre-order is out, you know, but not the book yet. I've seen people canceling their pre-orders. I've seen uh, fire sales on fifth edition books from publishers. Uh, I've seen um, a lot of people recommending other rules and systems and things like that. So it does seem to me as well that a lot of damage is being done and that's another reason that you think Wizards of the Coast would want to get out in front of it if this is not true. So we're, we're trying to assess credibility here, too, as well. Because we're not saying that we know what's happening because we got the leak and blah, blah, blah. So we're, just ta we're talking about this in, in that context. But what is true is what Pan is saying here, that a lot of damage is already being done. A lot of damage. I mean, um, so Wizards of the Coast is not out in front of this at the speed at which the Internet moves, especially if it's not true. Um, so yeah, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, this is, this is probably, this may be a watershed moment in the tabletop gaming industry, whether or not they even choose to revise later. So, I mean, if they choose to pull it all back, the fact that this is something that could happen is now on the radar and it's going to change the way people operate. I think it already has. Lynn Dark Knight says the pitchfork sharpening stream. It is once it's over, we can then decide to break out the torches. <laughs> My, my intention here is to, is it's, I don't think <laughs> there, there's a lot of stuff here that would make me like, I'm also evaluating this in the context of what would this do for me as somebody who has written uh, and was cons written OGL stuff uh, is considering would consider in the past publishing more OGL stuff. And then also friends who are doing it, like what, what happens to them? Um, and probably they'll leave. I, I want to talk to, I've got two friends who I specifically want to talk to about. It. I wonder if what they're doing. And one of those friends was actually one of the ones who was posting and said, I, uh, who has published OGL stuff has already said, I'm canceling my OG, my uh, D and D pre-orders and has played a lot of D and D and written stuff for D and D and all that. Building Persephone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good to see you here. Anyone who would have the legal power to fight this with Hasbro would likely be offered a special arrangement, leaving the smaller creators to twist in the wind. That's a great point, too. Uh, that's a great point, too, that the people who uh, would have the legal power to do that, those might be the people that Hasbro uh, or Wizards of the Coast wants to make sure that they are still allied with and are on good terms with and uh, might offer them the custom arrangement. They, you know, somebody saying, oh, listen, we're going to court, right? This is, uh, we think this is not right. This is not how this is going to work. Well, and then Wizard of the Coast says, well, rather than do all of that, here, here's a custom arrangement. It could definitely be that. And then who does that? Because why would somebody with a large interest like that, uh, if they can get covered, why would they, by a separate license agreement, why would they... Um, go to court and spend the money to help out the smaller creators. They're the ones who will, who don't have that and will be left twisting. I think that's a great point. Thank you. Building perspectively. Uh, thank you. Building Persephone. Great point. Rhino says one of the things a lawyer brought up, the new OGL makes it to where they can change the agreement at any time. And for any reason, obligations, the publisher uh, obligations, uh, the publisher to destroy products with the old OGL. Yeah. See, that's, my coffee's gotten cold. I may have to refresh my coffee in just a second. Um, so that's true. See, if you can change the agreement at any time, I wouldn't want to be operating as a publisher with that type of licensing agreement. If it can just change at any time, you can have the rug pulled out from you at any moment, right? And um, so, yeah, I, you know, I, I wouldn't operate like that. I wouldn't operate that. And building perspective says, hi, by the way. Oh, hi. Yep. Hi. Thank you for being here. So let's take a look before we go to more comments. Let's take a look at the D and D because also this gives us some a verification on credibility. So I've got a tweet up here. So let's look at uh, crowdfunding and then look at this Twitter, uh, this tweet. So D Kickstarter is D and D's preferred crowdfunding platform. Online crowdfunding is a new phenomenon since the original OGL was created, and the new license attempts to address how and where these fundraising raising campaigns can take place. 
The OGL 1.1 states that if creators are members of the expert tier, if your licensed work is crowdfunded or sold via any platform other than Kickstarter, you will pay a 25% royalty on qualifying revenue. And if your licensed work is crowdfunded on Kickstarter, our preferred crowdfunding platform, you will only pay a 20% royalty on qualifying revenue. This means the updated OGL is directly encouraging Kickstarter over other platforms. Why? Including private company sites, as any non-Kickstarter revenue over 750K will, inclu will include a 25% royalty and only Kickstarter revenue gets a break. There is no reason stated in the OGL 1.1 why Kickstarter is Wizard's preferred crowdfunding platform. Okay, so this is, oh, so this is the tweet. Oh, it's already in here. This is a very comprehensive article. So, however, John Ritter, director of games at Kickstarter, responded on Twitter. I think this here is the, the tweet. I found this uh, independently here. Uh, Kickstarter was contacted after, so Linda, so Linda is the uh, writer of this article, says Kickstarter will be the official preferred crowdfunding platform of Wizards of the Coast. If you fund through Kickstarter and you make greater than 75K, you will only owe 20% of royalties. No explanation is given in the OGL 1.1 as to why Kickstarter projects get this kickback. So John Ritter says Kickstarter was contacted after Wizards of the Coast decided to make OGL changes. So this is some confirmation then that there's stuff like this is going on, right? Because Kickstarter was contacted directly by them regarding OGL changes. So we felt the best move was to advocate for creators, which we did managed to get a lower percentage plus more being discussed. No hidden benefits, no financial kickbacks for KS. Yeah, I wonder, I, she used this word kickback right here. Um, I don't think I, it didn't sound like we were actually talking about a kickback to necessarily, but it says no financial kickbacks for KS. But there's clearly a, a break in the royalties owes. No financial royalties owed. No financial kickback for KS. This is their license, not ours, obviously. Okay, so that is the original tweet there. So there is also a section in the updated OGL directed to conditions surrounding crowdfunding. Even for initiate and intermediate tiers, there are strings attached to using any crowdfunding platform, not just Kickstarter, to get a project off the ground. Two main points are that you may only use crowd... You may, you, the two main points are you may only crowdfund the production of licensed works and that no infringing material are given out as perks or rewards. Oh, okay, so... Oh, oh, so that means, so if you want to, oh, this impacts uh, one of my friends who makes this kind of stuff because he puts out, well, see, I wonder how this influences him. Okay, so this is interesting. So he does uh, create uh, the campaign guides and will crowdfund them. But then one thing that he does is he creates virtual tabletop stuff, such as for Roll20 as well as part of the rewards. So if you want to do virtual gaming on the tabletop, you can not only get the PDF of the book, you can get the nice hardback copy of the book, but then also get uh, virtual tabletop supplies, um, whether, whether that's tokens or maps or whatever else it is, that is also part of that uh, Kickstarter campaign. So does that mean he can't do that anymore? I think that's interesting because, you know, is this going to be able to stop you from making your own tokens? It doesn't sound like that's that would be ridiculous because does it require an OGL to make your own tokens? You know, if he's got his own art of his own worlds, and if you clip out like the different photographs of the art that he created and make those into tokens, mm, that that's his own, right? That seems like his own. You wouldn't that wouldn't require the OGL for him to be making roll twenty virtual tabletop stuff from his for his own world and his own art. I'll have to talk to him about that. Grim Hild says, going through the courts would take a long time and a lot of money. And in the meantime, which of the courts would ask for an injunction to prevent third party publishing until it's decided in court? Yeah. Uh, but see, that's one of the things that could you get away with that? I mean, I agree with you. I think that would be the, the strategy there. In the meantime, which of the courts would ask for an injunction to prevent third party publishing until this is decided? Could Wizards of the given the state of the internet today, could Wizards of the Coast survive that and social media? If Wizards of the Coast had said, All right, we're 
just we're, we're asking for an injunction against all third party content. Even if they got it, what type of impact would that have on which is the coast? Like, I think that that seems like you'd be going to war against your fan base. Now, I'm not saying they wouldn't try it because just in gen the general idea of corporate geekdom, I don't know anything about them particularly, but um, just in general, the attitudes of corporate geekdom, like we've been talking about, I can see somebody trying that. But that seems like one of those flubs between the administration and management and then oh, the whole fan base. That seems like you'd be going to war against them. Uh, building Persephone says the first legal step would be going through arbitration. Yes. And then Wizards, Grim Hild says, then Wizards of the Coast stalls as long as they can to kill the third party publishers. But but would that would that take them out? Would that take them out? Like who who would like if that happened? Who would buy a Wizard of the Coast D and D product again? Like if, if that's something that happened, I would say I would not. Uh, so uh, you know uh, they would lose. Uh, seems like a huge chunk of people, but uh, maybe they think they can get more people back. I don't know. Uh. Yeah, and here we go. So this is the, the changes. There's no mention. So while there's plenty more to parse, the main takeaway from the leaked OGL draft document is that Wizards of the Coast is keeping power close at hand. There's no mention of perpetual worldwide rights given to creators, which was present in Section 4 of the original OGL. So that, that means they must have thought that was at least a problem. Perpetual worldwide rights not mentioned anymore. So if it's not mentioned anymore, then does that mean that that was a problem for some reason? Maybe. And one of the caveats is that the company can modify or terminate this agreement for any reason whatsoever, provided we give 30 days notice. Which, again, is not a lot. If you're a publisher who is printing, laying out books, uh, commissioning uh, potentially text, uh, layout artists and things like that, deciding that, oh, something big is changing within 30 days is still not a lot of notice. Now, here is also a big thing. Wizards of the Coast can get the right to use any content the licensees create, whether commercial or non-commercial. What? Wizards of the Coast also gets the right to use any content the licensees create, whether commercial or non-commercial. Although this is couched in a language to protect Wizards products from infringing on creators' copyright, the document states that for any content created under the updated OGL, regardless of whether or not it is owned by the creator, Wizards will have a non-exclusive, perpetual, irrevocable, worldwide, sub-licensable, royalty-free license to use that content for any purpose. What? <laughs> Okay, let me read that again, because I have to try to soak that in. The document states that for any content created under the updated OGL, regardless of whether or not it is owned by the creator, Wizards will have a non-exclusive, perpetual, irrevocable, worldwide, sub-licensable, royalty-free license to use that content for any purpose? Well, now here we're using the words perpetual and worldwide, and notice they've added that word irrevocable, which we were just talking about, right? So here is non-exclusive and perpetual returning what in favor of them, in favor of them, and saying this is irrevocable. Like that is an obvious no-go. I mean, so there are reasons why, like, okay, well, we're looking, you know, because we're creating worlds and stuff and, and game systems here on this channel, right? So up until, you know, up until all this was happening, I was like, well, you know, possible on the list of possibilities is making some stuff for fifth edition, uh, you know, using the OGL, I, you know, as it stood, you know, up until this release, you know, pretend this is, this is a leak. So it's not something that's actually changed yet, but this is just a leak. But up until this leak here, well, of course I'm, you know, so the, the overhead of trying to submit licenses to them, even if you're not hitting the, the, the monetary threshold. Putting the monetary threshold aside at the moment, even if you're not hitting that, the overhead of trying to submit all of my work to Wizards of the Coast for their approval, I guess, uh, or at least their documentation and entering their database, is not something that I'd want to do. That's just too much overhead. But on the other hand, what is this? That actually this is going the other way? It's the ability for Wizards of the Coast to take 
what you're doing and your work and your IP to have a non-exclusive, perpetual, irrevocable, and sub-licensable royalty for like that, that's a complete no-go. Like I would not create anything like I with with a license under that. Uh, under those terms. Never. And I don't think any of my friends would either because you know, I've got friends who are trying to do basically the same thing that I'm trying to do. Uh, some of them all, at all different stages of the work about world building, trying to put out IP. And a lot of us want role-playing games to be a part of that world building and that whole spread of things that are created for worlds. And a lot of us really, obviously, really value our worlds as uh, intellectual property. And there's just no way, no way that you would sign anything like that. You would publish anything like that under a, um, under an agreement like that. Absolutely no way. So there are a lot of implications in this extended policy and the ramifications of the updated OGS. So this is, I mean, this was, this would be huge to me. And I haven't seen that quite talked about explicitly on Twitter, but it could just be me. There are a lot of implications on this extended policy and the ramifications of this updated OGL could have a chilling effect on new licensed products. No kidding. As only static products are included, all work that publishers do for virtual tabletops may have to be offered as non-commercial free products. Well, that might might be some way uh, that somebody could put out a non-commercial free tabletop stuff. But you should be able to get paid for your work. You do all that work. It's your world. I don't think there's anything, like I said, I could be wrong because I've never made virtual tabletop stuff for Roll20. People tell me that I should, but I haven't gotten it yet. But it, you, you could make stuff for that that doesn't include the anything that has to do with D&D which disincentivizes their production. The royalties associated with any company making over 750K could also prompt publishers to hold back extra products or scale down projects if they stay under the expert tier. But that can be difficult. I mean, that'd be very difficult on something like Kickstarter because if you've got a really hot product that 10,000 people want, like you can't stop people from pledging, <laughs> right? So all of a sudden you go over that tier and all of a sudden you get all this. Uh Wizards of the Coast is clearly expecting these OGL changes to be met with some resistance. The document does note that if the company oversteps, they are aware that they will receive community pushback and bad PR. Well, that seems to be happening. And we're more than open to being convinced that we, we have made a wrong decision. Well, maybe so. But as we were just talking about, as Pan was talking about, brought up here, the damage may already be done. Trey says... Critical Role has the cartoon on Amazon, so that would mean that Critical Role Amazon would have to pay Hasbro for retroactive money. I do not think Wizards of the Coast Hasbro would want to go against Amazon, CR, and Court. That, hey, we just hit 45 people. Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad to have you. We This is a record-setting morning grind live stream. Welcome, welcome. I'm so glad you're watching and hope you're enjoying it. Uh, I'll say again, please do like and sub if you uh, have not yet and you are here. I'd absolutely love to have you for more. So, but yes, Trey, now that is an excellent point that Trey is bringing up here. I had forgotten about that, that, that not only did Critical Role do so well on its uh, crowdfunding campaign and its first season of its show, all of a sudden Amazon picked up its second season, right? So Amazon, so there's somebody who could, <laughs> so there is somebody who actually could fight um, Hasbro. I think it would be no problem for Amazon to fight Hasbro. So, but again, now there's a situation where, where Wizards of the Coast would have to punch up at Amazon. Amazon would be punching down at Wizards of the Coast. So I think and might be uh, easily done. So, but then again, because Wizards of the Coast probably knows that, looking up at Amazon, who's got this TV show, uh, Amazon... Um, that that is is extra gives extra incentive for Wizards of the Coast to offer Amazon and Wizards and uh, Critical Role one of those special deals uh, that's independent of this. But that's excellent thinking, Trey. Excellent thinking that Amazon does have a stake in this potentially because Amazon funded the second season of the Critical Role show. Yeah. Rhino Watcher says, it makes physical books pre-printed a huge liability because of the clause to destroy products with old OGL versions. And that's why I think I've seen the fire sales, right? I've seen uh, fire sales going by on Twitter saying like, uh, hey, because we, we have those books, fire sale time, let's get rid of them and, uh, and never return. Never return. KL says... This is the beginning of them fixing their under monetization problem. They have uh, the D and D it's easy for them to go after third party publishers first and then squeeze the player base for the privilege to play second. 
and uh, which I would hate to see. I would hate to see. I would hate to see. Uh, my uh, this is this is now a record breaking long morning grind live stream. But the, my problem is my coffee is ice cold. Give me 30 seconds to grab coffee. Just one second. I, there's more I want to talk about. And then I want to go into some other stuff. But my coffee is ice cold and I need to warm it up. Just one second. Okay, thank you. Got warmed coffee again. The Witch's Brew coffee. I, well, oh no, my God, I just dropped it. Witch's Brew coffee here. Now, all right, so where were we? So we're talking about KL was saying this is the beginning of them fixing their under monetization problem. Yeah, and what exactly does that mean, by the way? You know, it could mean a lot of things. Uh, and people have been talking about that. Did that just mean, hey, they want to sell more T-shirts? Well, probably not. That's what KL is talking about right here. Uh, it's easy for them to go after the third party publishers first and then squeeze the player base for the privilege to play second. I just I don't see. And I that's what I was saying with brand loyalty to Dungeons and Dragons. I just don't think that there is enough brand loyalty to Dungeons and Dragons itself for people to tolerate that. Guitar Guy Nick says it's like 25 percent at 75K. Yeah. So people. OK, so I'm trying to catch up here. Let me, uh, yeah, so it's 25% on everything over $750,000. It's not on profit, though. It's on revenue, as Building Persephone says. Yeah, it's on ro revenue. And if you haven't ever calculated that before, which I know some people who are more business-minded will, but if you are a third-party creator, a small creator on Kickstarter, I've seen some people have deals based on total revenue that they really didn't understand. And it's just ridiculous deals that people agree to that can absolutely cripple your ability to make any money whatsoever on what you're actually trying to do. I know that some people will be like, oh, listen, they're raising all this money on Kickstarter. Listen, behind the scenes, when you're looking at numbers, uh, you know, manufacturing costs, freight costs, which went through the roof, of course, I think freight's coming back down a bit now. But, you know, for a while, freight was through the roof. Shipping is more expensive than ever, of course. You're talking when you start breaking down numbers, and then you add on an extra 25% on revenue, gross revenue that can hurt. Grim Hild says, What makes it worse is the royalties are probably based on gross income instead of net profit, right? That's what we're just, yeah, we're just talking about net profit would be better, but I can also understand why no one wants to go through that hassle because if somebody were negotiating the other way with um, a license, how exactly you define you have to be very careful about how you're defining profit if you're going to be um, taking a percentage out of profit. Because in some ways, you know, I'm thinking about like um, films who say that um, an actor will get a certain percent of the profit or something like that. But the idea of the, the distribution of films can be so corrupted or have such corrupt accounting that um, there are a lot of films that are like, yep, this film didn't make actually, it didn't make any money. We don't owe you anything else. So that's why people want to go gross instead of net because Wizard of the Coast does not want to have to get into people's like accounting to make sure that they're calculating net the right way. And they probably, even if you're not making any money, they might still not want you selling their D&D products, you know. Um, so that's the thing. So that's why you set a limit on the Kickstarters of 749000 But how can you do that? I, is that something new on Kickstarter? I haven't actually looked at all of the Kickstarter stuff um, lately, but I've never seen, I haven't, because I haven't been trying to, I actually, I do have uh, a project that's loaded into Kickstarter, but I'm not ready to run it yet, which is not D&D related, so it's not an issue. But um, seven, but there's no, there's no way that I knew of when I was running my Kickstarters 
that you could actually tell it, I don't want to raise more than this amount of money. That actually sounds like something that GameFound might do. Uh, GameFound's been innovating with a bunch of different... GameFound, if you don't know, is another crowdfunding platform that's dedicated toward games. And so it sounds, it sounds like if this is a big deal... Um, then some creators may not wa may want to set exactly that threshold. So it sounds like something GameFound might choose to do. Yeah, 20 25% is huge for royalty. It absolutely is. It absolutely is. Uh, I, I was at... Um, why can't I ever uh, call the name of this anymore? But the trade show for board games, not Gen Con or Origins, but the, the one for publishers. And they were talking... I went to a workshop on royalties. And yeah, 20, 25% would be huge. That would be huge. Commandant VHS. Welcome, Commandant. Good to see you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. W, uh, Wizards of the Coast wants to destroy OGL publishers. It seems like this is a good way to run to... If, if this were published in its form, for the reasons that I was just talking about, uh, it would run me it would run me away and it would run a whole bunch of people away. It would just, it, yeah, it, get rid of them. It makes, it makes us all go away, like not using this stuff. KL says this is also an issue for players who are current who currently play on VTTs like Forge, like the Forge that use the OGL SRD to allow players to run their games on their platforms that have no Wizards of the Coast agreement. Uh, I see, I see. So I don't, I'm not familiar with the Forge specifically, but so, uh, so what you're saying is, and I, I can see how it would be this way. I played on Roll Twenty. Uh, I played on a lot on D and D Beyond. Uh, but then also I have played a game on uh, Roll20. So if you want, so is there a way in Roll20, for instance, or the Forge, where you can go over and get the rules of the SRD brought up in a window or something like that? If so, then this would be uh, a problem. Building Persephone says they uh, want to corner the market like Disney has done. Well, that's... There are issues with corporate geekdom and Disney, right? Same kind of problem. If they weren't trying to go the Disney route, they they may fail. <laughs> I mean, Disney has obviously got a lot going for it in terms of its revenue through sources from a whole bunch of different places. More so than Hasbro has got. But um, as far as dealing with its fan base, Disney has a problem from the corporate geekdom perspective. Grim Hill says, yeah, yeah, gross revenue, not net profit. Yeah. Uh, Commandant VHS says, if you use any OGL, you're a fool. If this comes through, if, if version 1.1 were published as we're looking at it and trying to, or reading about it here in terms of this leak, unless you have a, a sweetheart deal, I, I wouldn't do it. Roll20 also owns OBS. Splinterverse says, Roll20 also owns OBS, which is behind DMs Guild and Drive Through RPG. Okay. Uh, I talked about uh, OBS. I talked about, or mentioned this when we're talking about under monetization. And when somebody said in the comments that Roll20 owns OBS, and when somebody said OBS, I was immediately thinking of the software streaming, the, the streaming software that you use. And um, that's not true in this context. OBS means one bookshelf, which is behind Drive Through RPG. I did not know it was behind DM's Guild. That's really interesting. So I did not know it was behind DM's Guild. So that's another layer to this. So Roll20 owns OBS, which has this connection to, which is the coast then, because it's behind the DM's Guild. That's interesting. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, Commandant VHS says you can't copyright game mechanics, only patent it. We were talking about that earlier in the stream. Troll Lord Games is having a fire sale on all their 5e books. They are one of the fire sales that I saw go by on Twitter. Building Persephone says you can't copyright mechanics, but you can copyright terms and phrases as used in game mechanics. Like So saving throw, DC, CR, etc. could all be challenged under the license. Grim Hill says, Trey, the Critical Role series on Amazon Prime was based on their live stream D&D campaign one, but for the animated show, CR removed any Wizards of the Coast D&D specific references, so I'm not sure. Really? I have not watched this show. Maybe, maybe that's why. Maybe somebody said that, hey, we're not going to use D&D &D specific references in the second show. So I'm not sure which of the coast could go after the, the Critical Role animated series. Very interesting. That's very interesting. So many, so many layers to all of this, right? So many layers to all of this. Uh, 
how many okay let's uh i got some other things to go through but i want let me try to catch up on some comments uh Ramel smith welcome welcome Ramel. excellent good to see you welcome glad you're here uh pantomimes so more information on pantomimes here building persephone says pantomimes is a term that defines a term that defines a satire as a specific form of entertainment general satire is typically protected free speech a pantomime is not so pantomime is a term that defines a satire as a specific form of entertainment. Interesting. Generally, satire is protected free speech, right? But a pantomime is not. Lynn Dark Knight says they could if they show a beholder or some other copyrighted monster in an episode. Um, that goes back to the pantomime thing. So that's interesting. Or red, uh, red, green, black, and bronze dragons? Well, Smog is a red dragon, right? Or Smog the Golden? Goliath, Bard, Cleric, Rogue. I mean, some of these terms have gotten, uh, you know, I, some of these terms existed before Dungeons and Dragons, right? That So that if it's a prior term, right, uh, then it probably, it's not something they can claim copyright to. Splinterverse says, I'm guessing there's nothing stopping a person from forming multiple companies. One LLC is for OGL and one for the new agreement. You wouldn't be able to promote the other, but it's best of both worlds, maybe. Well, maybe. Um, so that you only have to deal with it. But see, that's, I mean, if, for any type of third-party publisher, running, like, I don't, like, personally, I'm not going to run, run two different game publishing companies. That's not something I need to do. I just need one of those. Trying to set up and run two of them, not something that's going to happen. Inner Light says, I just checked Shadow of the Demon Lord does not use the OGL. So it's an entirely original work, which other people have made materials for. All right, so we may need to check that one out. Andrew Andrew says, Hasbro missed third quarter expectations and revenue. Toy prices went up. They took heat on the, in Andrew's opinion, overly priced HasLab, their own Kickstarter model Marvel vehicle that failed. They are looking for money. So that's another wrinkle to this. So Hasbro missed third quarter expectations and revenue. Um... Yeah, they have their own Kickstarter model a v and a v Kickstarter Marvel vehicle failed. I didn't know about that. I haven't been following Marvel. Uh, only in my opinion, as I know, Hasbro has very ardent fans. Really? I didn't know that. I don't feel any type of brand loyalty to Hasbro specifically, personally. So I would not say that I'm a, a Hasbro fan, but maybe there are. Building Persephone says, if they want to sell your work on D&D &D Beyond, they can set the price at whatever they want and force you to match it. If they set it high, you'd have to set it high. But on the other hand, uh, if they uh, set it low, then the place you'd buy it is D&D &D Beyond, right? And then you'd be undercut. So that, actually, that'd be another way. Whoa, that would be bad. If they have non-exclusive, uh, like, but uh, perpetual and worldwide license to, license to whatever you're making, and then they decide to say, hey, I tell you what, let's just take all this stuff and let's make it free, then you're undercut. And that's another way to potentially run people off. They could make money off of it, or they could drop its price really low. Building Persephone says, um, and then they would have the ability to offer it at a much more flexible rate via membership tiers, offers sales, essentially undercutting you. Yeah, that's exactly, okay, that's exactly what I was thinking. Luis Silva says, I am a player looking at other games due to not wanting to support Hasbro hassling small creators. And I think a lot of people are. Welcome, Lewis. Welcome, Lewis. Great to have you. I think that the issue here, uh, yeah, is that as we talked about earlier, a lot of damage has already been done. And a lot of people are just like you, Lewis, who are now looking for other things to uh, play. David62 says, as I understand it, yes, it's over and above 750K, but it's subject to change. Yeah, always. Stray's agreeing here. It looks like a lot of people who are on board with you. Lot, I see that all the time on social media over the past, like last night and, and this morning. Lewis Silva says, suggest starting mass searches, best fantasy tabletop RPGs besides Dungeons and Dragons to create a brand. Uh, oh, yeah. Check our Discord server. We've got <laughs> in the other RPG section. Uh, Trey has been posting a lot of different uh, RPGs. And yeah, this channel, the Morning Grind, basically for the last two months, we've been going over other RPG systems. Not specifically for this reason, we just because I like looking at rules for other RPG systems. So if you like live streams about uh, role-playing games, uh, check out. I've got a playlist. I need to update that playlist, but there's still a lot on the Morning Grind playlist that you can just go through it and you can look at a whole bunch of different uh, RPGs. 
OSR, Pathfinder, Conan, uh, Shadows of the Demon Lord, GURPS, Fate, the Index Card RPG. Uh, have we looked at Shadows of the Demon Lord on this stream yet? I don't think we've looked at that on this stream yet. But we've looked at all of those on this stream. So you can definitely check those out and like learn how to play and go along with us as we were learning as well. Uh, and Mork Borg. We did look at Mork Borg on the stream as well. And Savage Worlds. Yep. Recently picked up Errants. I don't know that one. So, uh, Kilo Echo November. Welcome. 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 Kilo Echo November says, Hasbro stocks price plummeted by almost half over the last six months, in large part to the way they've been handling Magic the Gathering. Even this didn't make Hasbro Wizards of the Coast blink. They just keep setting fires. Well, now what's happened there? I don't know. Um, I because I don't like I said I'm the most casual Magic the Gathering player you could possibly be, and I haven't played in a while. So, Wizards of the Coast has been setting Magic the Gathering on fire too. Uh, Dragon Warriors. Access Inner Light says, tons of games out there other than Hasbro, Wizards of the Coast created ones. Absolutely. And many of the games rooted in the OGL may have a strong enough IP of their own that they will break free. Lewis says, doing the searches would set fire under the search engines. It was just a suggestion to flag the issue. Uh, Building Persephone says, you're Inner Light. I hope so. It does sound like they're hedging to be able to go after anyone if they wanted it to, though. David62 says, I've already gone on D&D Beyond and deleted all my homebrew and characters. I've logged off for the last time. Yeah, we'll see. I wonder, I've got, you know, that's a good point too. Uh, I know friends who have put a lot of homebrew material on D&D Beyond in order to run the campaigns with, right? Uh, that's been an important part of using D&D Beyond. Uh, I've got, you know, I, I play both ways as far as technology goes. I play in some games where technology is forbidden at the table and it's all uh, pen and paper. But then I also played in games that fully embrace digital tabletops. Uh, you know, I created on the on the, the uh, channel, I've got a video where I create one of those uh, TV screens for the uh, table. And so we've used that as well and fully integrated D&D Beyond. And in those games, lots of homebrew material is going in so we can all pull it up. And it's been great. Uh, hey, he's got a BRB screen now. What is it? What is a BRB screen? Oh, I'll be right back screen. Yes, yes, I've got, yes, 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 I know. I'm getting fancy. I'm getting fancy. I know. So I've got a BRB screen. I need a BRB screen for the, um, the plugged in gaming stream. But yeah, I made one, I made one of those. I'm getting fancy here. It's like a, like a real streamer. <laughs> uh, they probably have backups somewhere they can use if they wanted to. Yeah, that's probably true. Yep. Homebrew issues there. Yeah, it's, that's an issue too. Building Persephone says, it would hurt me deep in my heart to see influential creators like Critical Role, uh, Cobalt Press, or Paizo take a special deal and not try to fight or boycott this attempt to monopolize the community. Can they do that? Uh, from the, I mean, they can obviously do it from the technical and legal perspectives and things like that. But I wonder, would that hurt them hard enough socially? I wonder what their fans would think. Well, you know... I, I don't know. So that's an interesting thing too. It would hurt. Yeah, it would hurt. Okay. But if you're a fan of say Pathfinder second edition and that's what you want to play, because that's what they're publishing right now. And you're a big fan of that. And the options are for Paizo and Paizo is offered a special deal. This is all hypothetical. And Paizo is offered a special deal that will keep Pathfinder second edition going. What do you as a fan of Pathfinder second edition want Paizo to do? probably take the deal and keep second edition alive. You know, keep the take the deal, keep second edition alive, keep it going, or have Paizo try to fight and potentially lose and potentially hurt what the game that you're playing and enjoying and, and getting published for. That's an interesting uh, uh, thing to think about because you can think, you know, if, if you're not a fan of uh, Pathfinder second edition, for instance, you might think, hey, I really want Paizo to fight this. But on the other hand, if you're in Paizo's community, you might not. Rhino Watcher says, Critical Role specifically scrubbed the IP when they did the cartoon. No spell names, locations, or characters owned by Wizard of the Coast. I think that's a smart move. Uh, that's probably, in retrospect, thinking about that, if you're planning the scripts, if you're writing scripts for that kind of thing, that probably is the kind of thing you would do. They already said they're not doing the Vecna arc. Zach. Welcome, Zach. Good to see you. Zach says, this is also a way to steal the creative content of all creators and resell it as they did their... as." their own, which the new OGL allows. They see this as selling well, uh, what they see is selling well and can just resell it themselves, which is 
no reason they're ever going to do this. Or, or why you should publish under that. No one who's trying to create their own P would pub, IP would publish under that. Rhino says, I noticed Critical Role uses a lot less Wizards of the Coast IP on Season 2. Onward, no Vecna, Dis, no City of Brass. I think they're trying to protect themselves. Uh, smart move, smart move. All the alienating that Wizards of the Coast is doing, so uh, Raymel here says, all the alienating that Wizards of the Coast is doing is going to make people not want to even look at their product. Yes, oh, Stray, yes. Please do give a thumbs up, everybody. Please do hit a thumbs up on the stream if you are enjoying this. Maybe get some more attention out there and uh, bring more people to our community here, here in the Geekverse. Would love that. Please do give a thumbs up and uh, subscribe. There's more to look at over here. This is, uh, there's more to go on. Zimblick says, is there any official word from Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast regarding the OGL? Not that I was aware of at the time I started this stream. Now, that doesn't, of course, I might have just missed it. But if somebody does see that... Um, Somebody has posted something or a tweet or something like that. We definitely want to look at it. Uh, okay, so definitely let us know if somebody sees something like that while we're live, and we'll go over there and take a look at it. Thank you, GM Hilt. I didn't realize I was that far behind. Uh, all right, so do we go? See, is there more over here? Okay, so no, that was the end of that article because that was a good time to catch up. That was the end of that article. So then, see, I had up this tweet, so we looked at that. So this right here, now see, this is what was put out by D&D. &D. So I, this, I, I didn't get to really look at this, but it might be interesting to look at this in the context of what's going on with the leak, right? So this was posted on December 21st. So a while back ago, but not all that long ago. So if they were putting together this 9,000 word document and... Um, changing this up this is what they put out on december 21st so they did attempt to make some clarification so let's see if what they put in here was accurate or not so ogl says or the uh, D, D see posted where is this posted so this is on the D, D beyond blog i guess their posts under ogl's srd and one D, &D. We love the interest and passion the community has for D&D. &D. Hey, let me see if I can... It's a bit large. There we go. Uh, we love the interest and passion the community has for D&D. &D. We love D&D &D too. So when we see the D&D &D community concerned about rumors and misunderstandings, we want to clear the air and share the facts with you, even if it's a bit earlier than our original plan. You all matter to us, and we want to provide transparency on how D&D &D will continue to be supported by third-party creators. So here are the facts. Now, be aware, if you're just coming into the stream, this is from December 21st. So this is not something that was issued in response to the latest link. Leak, this was issued prior to it. So will one D&D &D include an SRD be covered by an OGL? An OGL. Yes, they say. First, we're designing one D&D &D with 5th edition backwards compatibility. So all existing creator content that is compatible with 5th edition will be compatible with one D&D. &D. Second, we will update the SRD for 1D&D &D as we complete its development, development that is informed by the results of play tests that we're conducting with hundreds of thousands of D&D &D players now. So this is another claim to the backwards compatibility. So it's not the break I would be expecting that they would want to do if they're planning on doing all this OGL 1.1 stuff. All that content is compatible with 5th edition, and then we will have a 1D&D &D SRD. Okay, now... Will the terms of the OGL change? They say yes. We will release an a, a re, we will release version 1.1 of the OGL in early 2023. Oh, so back in on December 21st, so that was a while back ago, but not that long ago. They were telling you that this version 1.1 of the OGL is going to be coming in early 2013. So a release of January 6th with an implementation on January 13th would be very early 2013, 2023. If I was if I was reading this back on uh, December 21st, I would think that would mean first quarter. That would still surprise me, uh, but I would go, oh, that probably means first quarter 2023, possibly in like March. But that would still surprise me if I were a publisher going, oh my God, in the first quarter, early 2023, some type of new license could be coming. So the OGL needs an update to ensure that it keeps doing what we intended it to do. Allow the D&D community's independent creators to build and play and grow the game we all love without allowing things like third parties to mint D&D &D NFTs and large businesses to exploit our intellectual property. See, I think in, in general fairness, 
I think you would say that, um, you know, after 20 years and new technologies and things like that, maybe some things do need to be updated. Maybe there's new technologies that are getting away from the intent of the, of the license or whatever. So generally saying, hey, something might need to be looked at is not a problem, but it's what's changing and all of the massive change that seems to be the problem. So what's changing? First, we are making sure the OGL 1.1 is clear about what it covers and what it doesn't. OGL 1.1 makes it clear it only covers material created for use in or for tabletop RPGs, and those materials are only ever permitted as print material and static electronic files, like EPUBs and PDFs. Other kinds of content, like videos and video games, which they don't specific, they didn't specifically mention VTT here, are only possible through the Wizards of the Coast fan content policy or a custom agreement with us. To, to clarify, outside of printed material and static electronic files, the OGL doesn't cover it. I think if they had... Did people talk about virtual tabletop games when this was released? The virtual tabletop simulators and stuff like that when this was released? Because it's, it's absence of being called out here is... Uh, Oh, no, no, here we got this. Here we got VTT. So here we go. Next paragraph, actually. This will affect the D&D content. And, oh, will this affect the D&D content and services players use today? They say it shouldn't. The top VTT platforms already have custom agreements with wizards to do what they do. D&D merchandise like minis. So that's interesting. The top VTT platforms already have custom agreements with wizards to do what they do. So... But that doesn't mean that a third-party publisher does, particularly a small one. D&D merchandise like minis and novels were never intended to be part of the OGL, and OGL wouldn't change that. I don't know that I would have uh, yeah, thought to I mean, publish a novel. But, uh, but you don't need the OGL to publish a novel anyway. Because uh, we were looking at uh, the World of Ataltus on the channel, uh, which is done by Mark Tassin, published by Mechanical Muse. And he started out, well, actually, there wasn't an, an a small RPG adventure first, but then I got the book over there. Otherwise, I would get up and get it, but it's way over there. But he wrote the book. He didn't write the book. He commissioned an anthology of short stories from a bunch of different fantasy authors. And the book is called The Champions of Ataltus. So he's building a world in multiple media, which is what we're doing here on this channel as well. Lots of friends, like I said, who want to do this. Actually, God, Mark is another person who this influences. I should talk with Mark about what his situation is. Maybe we could have some creators talk about what they're planning on doing. Well, at least once it's, if this comes to fruition and it's public, we might get um, uh, Brian back on the channel. Brian Colon, he's the uh, guy who runs... Uh, Creature Curation and has been doing the Vast Grim RPG. Lou Anders does the Thrones and Bones RPG. Uh, Mark Tassin does the the uh, World of Ataltus uh, campaign and RPG. We could talk to them about what type of influence this is having. Because uh, they're, they're doing great work and we want them to be able to continue. But my point is that I don't think anything... That, that World of Ataltus novel... Excuse me. That World of Ataltus, uh, Ataltus anthology has nothing to do with the OGL. That's just the world of Ataltus, a fantasy world. So, I mean, that should, there's no reason why that should even come up. That's just short stories in that fantasy world. Uh, creators wishing to leverage D&D for these other forms of expression. And, and, and like I said, even if I, were to, if I were creating something like that, which I am, stories, it wouldn't have even occurred to me that I need the OGL. I don't. Creators wishing to leverage D&D and those forms of expression will need, as they've always needed, custom agreements with us. Second, we're updating the OGL to offer different terms to creators who cr choose to make free, shareable. We're updating the OGL to offer different terms to creators who choose to make free, share-alike content and creators who want to sell their products. What does this mean for you as a creator? If you're making share-alike content, it's very little is going to change from what you're already used to. If you're making commercial content, relatively little is going to change for most creators. For most of those who are selling custom content, here are the things you need to know. Accept the license terms and let us know that you're offering for sale. Register with them, right? Report OGL revenue related annually. So your overhead is not only reporting everything you're offering for sale, but then also reporting your revenue annually as if taxes aren't enough when you're an independent creator trying to report revenue. You also have now have to report it to um, which is the coast if you make more than $50,000 a year and include a creator product badge on your work. Um, let's go to the bottom of this, then we'll go to uh, chat. 
If we, if, by the way, if you're just coming in here, this is a statement that um, Dungeon that uh, Wizards of the Coast released on December 21st. So in advance of this leak, this is not a response to the leak. This is released prior to the leak, and we're trying to evaluate it in the context of the leaked information. Again, and we're still uh, the 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 information on the leak, we still talked about its credibility uh, and it's not final. It's not its final form, even if it is credible and it, even, well, excuse me, even if it's true, cred credibility and truth are different things. So even if um, the leaked information is the actual draft version of the document, it may or may not be the one that's actually officially released. But uh, we are just evaluating this and saying, what did they say? Because I didn't get a chance to look at this earlier on. What did they say? And does that line up with the information that's potentially in the leak, in the leak? So they say, when we roll out OGL 1.1, we will also provide explanatory videos, FAQs, and a web portal for registration to make navigating these requirements as easy and intuitive as possible. We'll also have to navigate, uh, we'll also have to help available creators to navigate the new process. We will also have help available to creators to navigate the new process. For the fewer than 20 creators worldwide who make more than $750,000 in income in a year, we will add royalties starting in 2024. So even for creators making significant money selling D&D supplements and games, no royalties will be due for the 2023 and all revenue below $750,000 in future years will be royalty free. Bottom line, the OGL is not going away. You will still be able to create new D&D content, publish it anywhere, and, your, and game with friends and followers in all the ways that make this game and community great. The thousands of creators publishing across Kickstarter, DMs Guild, and more are a critical part of the D&D experience and we will continue to support and encourage them and do that through one d d and beyond. So that was their statement in uh, December 2021. How does that line up with what we know? It's probably carefully worded. Probably carefully worded. Right, let's go over here to the chat. Inner Light says, this is kind of what happened with 4th edition. And see, during 4th edition, I wasn't gaming. So I completely skipped 4th edition. I didn't skip 4th edition because I didn't like it. Now, of course, there are lots of other issues with 4th edition that some people have. I didn't skip 4th edition for that reason. I just skipped 4th edition because I wasn't in the gaming space at the time. So I don't know much about it because I was totally out of it. Uh, Inner Light says, hey, hey, we got 48 people watching. We have now hit a new record uh, on the morning grind for live stream watchers. Thank you. Thank you so much. That is incredible. Thank you so much for being here. If you will hit the like button and subscribe, that would be huge. And I will stick the, um, uh, we get, well, we got a new record here. So I might as well go ahead and stick the uh, discord link back in the chat. Uh, Raven keep discord. We would love to have you there. So thank you for making a hitting, helping us hit another record. Maybe if we hit enough likes and, uh, on the stream and stuff like that, uh, more, even more people will show up, and that would be amazing. So thank you. Thank you. This is completely unexpected. So Inner Light says, this is kind of what happened with 4th edition. When they dropped the OGL for 4th edition, not many people looked at 4E and Pathfinder blew up like crazy. Uh, so they did have uh, an OGL when they, oh, when they dropped, as in when they got rid of it. I thought somebody said something like there wasn't an OGL for 4th edition. So when they dropped the OGL for 4th edition, not many people looked at 4th E and Pathfinder blew up like crazy. Yeah, there was like a perfect storm that caused Pathfinder, uh, Paizo to be able to do what it did with Pathfinder. Uh, that's a really interesting story. And I did get to have lunch with the head of publishing for Paizo uh, once. And it was, uh, and he was kind of telling that story. And it was a, a really interesting thing that, yeah, you know, they had been publishing Dungeon and Dragon magazine and, uh, you know, that license got pulled uh, and all of a sudden they weren't going to be able to publish those magazines anymore. And he was telling me that he didn't want to go in and tell everybody that, oh, my God, we just lost the our ability to publish these magazines because he said if, if that happens, people are going to, uh, you know, go. Uh, so I've got to come up with something else for us to do and, and publish and work on. And then the idea for Pathfinder uh, was was hit on. And then, of course, it all blew up. So, I mean, there were so many things that came together in a really neat story for Paizo to be able to do that. Uh, no, uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Building Persephone says, everything is out of date already. Even this leak seems to be a rejected draft. Well, see, it may be. See, that's, that's the case that we have to think about in terms of credibility. Because we can't say, we cannot say that this is the way that it's going to be. Because we don't know that. 
first of all, is the leak credible? Is the so credibility and truth, like I said, are two different things. So is the information we're looking at credible? That's the first kind of judgment you have to make. And then, you know, something can be not credible, but it can end up being true. And something can be credible, but then also not end up being true if, you know, it's a credible leak, but then the information isn't true. And that's what you're talking about. Is there some type of rejected draft or something like that that we've got to hold up? This is not the current thinking. It, it, if it's a rejected draft, it was at least somebody's thinking at some time, but somebody could have gone, here's my draft. And the other person could have gone, oh my God, we're not doing that. People will go crazy. <laughs> you know. So, uh, you know, that's that could have happened too, right? We don't know. We don't know. But so that's why I'm holding. I, I think it's best to hold judgment on a lot of things until the official release. Right. Except for, as we've been talking about, a lot of people are already um, running. Right. That a lot of damage is being done. But then again, if, if that's the case, if this if this draft, if, if this draft were written and somebody's thinking, and somebody turned this in and said, hey, here's what I'm thinking about for our no new OGL. What do you think? And the person receives it and goes, oh, my God, this is terrible. We can't possibly release this. Get rid of this. Draft rejected. If that had happened in Wizards of the Coast and then this particular draft got leaked, you would think we would have heard something by now, at least on Twitter or something. And if we have and this is coming out while we're live, please do put it in the chat. And I want to see it because... If the, the rate of the speed of the internet moves, if this was a completely rejected draft and completely wrong, that this is, or, or, or is not real, if this is not a draft that was leaked, you would think Wizards of the Coast would want to say that immediately. I, I would think, I would think. So we were trying to look at everything in context here. Uh, Cal Vanoni, uh, Van Oni, welcome, welcome. Good to see you. He says, good show. Cal says, good show. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so glad you're enjoying it. Andrew Andrew says, I hope people stick to their guns, but I have seen many proclamations about I will never again use, buy, endorse, insert thing here, but it doesn't stick. People like what they like. That is so true, Andrew. That is so true. Yes, there's always, it always seems, especially on Twitter, like some type of, and social media in general, but especially like Twitter, what is outrage of the, the day or the week, but or even the day? Oh my God, I will never do this again. Um, yeah, that's true. And then, and then how much does that stick? That's that's true. On the other hand, there are so many options. There are so many options out there to go to. And like I said, that has to do with our people brand loyal to, to D and D. And how much do you really love the fifth edition one, one D and D rule set? To me, brand loyalty is not really a thing. And as we've been going through on the morning grind and looking at a whole bunch of different systems, they're probably better. I mean, I, I like the fifth edition system. I think there are problems with it, but I like it. I've certainly had a lot of fun with it. I played it, uh, had a lot of fun with it, but there are certainly other things out there that may do what I want much better. And of course we look at them all here on this channel. So Interlight says it's kind of what happened from Amazon. When borders died, I vowed to never buy anything on Amazon again, but eventually it got to the point where the only place I could find stuff was on Amazon. Uh, yeah. I do order a lot of stuff from Amazon. The convenience factor is a definite thing. And then, yeah, I mean, they've got stuff that, well, where else can you find it? That's true. Now Barnes and Noble is in trouble. Yeah. And, you know, I've got friends uh, who talk about this and the impact on general book publishing. And you know, I've got to think about that because I've talked to different people about what is the right strategy for book publishing in general now. Is it online? Is it self-publishing? On the other hand, there are still some advantages to traditional publishing, even though that may be on its way out. And bookstores and the collapse of bookstores, that's an issue too. But there are still some, some advantages with traditional publishing. But where are we going? Uh, now Barnes & Noble is in trouble. And I used to love going to Barnes & Noble. I used to love going to Barnes & Noble. And I am proud to announce that my Prime subscription ends at the, ended at the beginning of December. I still do have a Prime subscription. But I understand, I understand why some people don't. Trey G says, I do not hate D&D &D in general. I just have not seen any innovation in the rule set. Other games are more interesting to me. D&D &D rule set is like a tuxedo. Lightly outdated. Good for formal games. Well, and also it's, a lot, it's, it's what a lot of people know. And you can't discount that. that. That was one of the reasons why David, when we were doing the Journey to the Tree of Sorrows RPG, or when I was writing that, he ultimately made the call. It's his world. So uh, he made the call and he was like, all right, I think from the 
the perspective of letting people, uh, even if this rule set isn't perfectly adapted to Journey to the Tree of Sorrows, the story in general, the advantages of having people know that rule set outweigh those other elements. So familiarity and not having to learn something else is 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 something you can't discount. But video, I think, helps with that. So if you are trying to learn something else, of course, there are a lot of people on YouTube who are putting out videos about how to play other games. So you don't have to, you know, <laughs> like against the dark master I have sitting right here. You're not, you don't have to read through this tome. But, you know, I've done looks at against the dark master and how to play uh, on this channel. In the morning grind, we're always looking at, at new kinds of games. So video probably helps people get into new games as well. Because, you know, I can put on a video and learn uh, you know, the basics of a game while I'm cleaning house and don't have to go through all the reading. Building Persephone says it's worth, uh, it's also worth pointing. It is also a point worth making that the whole concept of updating or evoking the previous agreement is highly questionable. The previous terms were perpetual. Yeah, right. Yes. Well, that's what I think we've been, that was one of the first things that was kind of a question mark in my mind. And I think a question mark in a lot of people's mind, that was the first, because I was like, well, which we did talk about this, but I was like, oh, well, if they make a sixth edition and there's a new version of the OGL that goes with it and it's just a complete break, the sixth edition rules are all new uh, and there's a more restrictive um, OGL for sixth edition and they're going to try to make as many people make the jump over to sixth edition as possible, but hey, some people will still keep going with fifth. With fifth, That would be one thing. But trying to stop trying to revoke the previous OGL like is questionable. I'd want a lot more information on that as well. Uh, it did say the previous term was perpetual, but then there's also the word that is that the word that was missing was unrevocable and the um, authorized license. So there seems to be some wiggle room, but I'm not a lawyer. We, I've got uh, something else to read from a lawyer in a moment. So let me go through here. Fifth edition made a few big jumps and I felt like it uh, and it felt like OSR in some ways. But that was back in like 2016, something like that. Like I said, I skipped 4th edition. I didn't get back to Dungeons and Dragons until 5th edition. I played a lot of AD&D and, &D and uh, 3.0 and 3.5. And uh, so when my friends were all playing 5th edition, I picked up 5th edition. And there were things about it, especially at the time, that I was like, oh, this is a lot like AD&D uh, &D and the D&D &D that I remember. So, I mean, there were reasons. I mean, there were reasons to like it and there were reasons to play it. Uh I wouldn't have gone back to play like AD and D. I just would have picked up fifth edition because that's where everybody was playing. And there are things about this modernized. Rhino Washer says the statement of a new OGL to protect them from novels and video games is a misleading statement. The OGA OGL never imperiled their IP rights unless you consider a printed game as a novel. See, that's, that's what I'm, I'm thinking too. And I was the, the not the inclusion of the word novel there is weird too. Um, for the reasons I talked about that, that's, that seems to be a completely separate kind of issue. Innerlight says, still waiting for all the setting books they promised. We we have Ravenloft, Ravenloft, Spelljammer, and Dragonlance. No birthright and no planescape. Uh, yeah, we got Ravenloft, didn't I? I think I bought Ravenloft. I brought Van Richter's Guide to Ravenloft. Yeah. Uh, now, I hadn't. I didn't buy Spelljammer. I never Spelljammed. Um, we had the Spelljammer book, or the friend of mine had the, or box set, or whatever it was for AD&D. I don't think I ever Spelljammed. Um, and I'm not as big into Dragonlance as other people. I know people love Dragonlance, but I'm just not familiar with it. But they put out they put out Spelljammer, right? And then people had a big problem with that because it didn't even include things like spaceship combat or something like that. Uh, Mike says, "Do it through do th do it through one D and D and beyond. If do it through one D and D and beyond, which if it's pay to play, yeah." I'm not, wait, I'm not sure exactly what the meaning is uh, here. Uh, Building Persephone says, I don't think, sorry about that, Mike. I don't really quite understand. Uh, Building Persephone says, I don't think any court would consider a game book a novel as there is no narrative thread. Yeah, I, I, those, I think those are separate things. Those, I, I, think, I think you're right. Uh, Mike says, 29 thumbs up. I think it is the most of any morning grind. I'm sure it is. That is probably breaking the record for most thumbs up as well. If you're here and you have not hit it, let's try to set a record there. Let's try to make the record go even more. I'd be very interested to know. So 29 thumbs up, I believe, is a record for the morning grind. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the minute. I don't have the, the um, YouTube uh, actual screen up when I'm broadcasting right here, so I can't see. So 29 thumbs up. Awesome. Can we get it to more? That would be awesome. So Kilo Echo November says, 
It's interesting minis are called out because most in the business of minis like Hero Forge or other or uh, or those on my mini factory are fantasy race creatures aren't w aren't wizard of the coast ip orcs are an example of this yeah i, I agree with you with the miniatures there as well because i wouldn't have even connected miniatures to wizards of the coast coast anyway and the ogl i never would have connected that because okay yes so we would know that you can't make there are certain monsters that are the wholly created by wizard of the coast and so forth there right um, and you can't, so you can't make your own and sell a, what like beholder is one of the examples, right? So you can't make your own beholder miniature. Okay. Got that. Got that. Because a beholder is the intellectual property, uh, trademarked and whatever of wizards of the coast. So I can't make a beholder miniature, but yeah, I can make orc miniatures all I want. And I can make elf miniatures all I want and dwarf miniatures all I want. Like that wouldn't have even thought you don't need the OGL to do this. It almost seems like they're trying to reach out. Uh, and, and and imply that a lot of things imply that you've got to have this license in order to do a lot of things that you actually don't. Yeah, like the the Im impact on the miniatures you make is minimal, right? There's nothing I'm missing there, right? Uh, Kilo Echo November says, "Be careful of using Hero Forge. They have some crazy terms and conditions of their site that make everything you do their own IP." Really? Oh, I didn't know about that. Uh, I have made some Hero Forge miniatures for some custom custom characters in uh, Lou's game, which I need to paint. But I didn't know that they uh, got some crazy conditions as well. Mike says that's true, Ken. But there are a number of other folks out there that are making stuff that are D&D related, such as tieflings, etc. cetera. Uh, that may be in a response to Kilo, actually. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ken is uh, Kilo Echo November. Yeah, so if you're out there trying to make tieflings, then, or beholders, okay, I can see that would be an issue. Zach says, I would love to hear other creators take on OGL 1.1, if it comes to be as the leak says. Well, uh, I mean, of course, I'm one of them, but... Uh, and I would say that I would, and I'm not planning on putting out, I would not put anything out under this 1.1 license, but if this comes out and I think it's, well, we, I mean, we could talk about it um, in terms of the leak, but yeah, I think it's better to say if this leak actually is true, whatever actually happens with 1.1, it would be interesting to talk to Lou, talk to Mark Tasson, Lou Anders, Mark Tasson, Brian Colon. We've had him on the channel before. We can talk to him again and see what they're doing. Uh, David62 says, adding to your hypothetical Paizo uh, Watsi can take Paizo's material in their license and sell it themselves royalty free. Adding to your hypothetical, yeah, Paizo, uh, hypothetical Paizo, Wizards of the Coast can take Paizo's material in their license and then sell it themselves royalty free. I mean, yeah, right. I mean, if that's what we're, if what we're talking about here, with uh, everything published under the OGL 1.1 becomes the property of Wizards of the Coast. Does that mean Wizards of the Coast is planning on just taking Pathfinder? I mean, that's <laughs> insane. <laughs> it sounds to me. Grimhild says, tin foil hat. All right, tin foil hat theory. All right, let's, let's take a look at it. What if Wizards of the Coast deliberately leaks an overly aggressive draft of the OGL, knowing that it will uh, get a lot of uproll? uproar, but they do this deliberately with the plan that their final OGA, OGL 1.1 won't be as draconian. That way they can see how far they can push and then look like the good guys by appearing to listen to their fan base. Okay, so let me read that again. What if Wizard of the Coast deliberately leaks an overly aggressive draft of the OGL, knowing that it will get a lot of uproar, but they do this deliberately with the plan that their final OGL 1.1 won't be as draconian. That way they can see how far they can push and they can look like the good guys appearing to listen to their fan base. Possible, possible, right? Um, but as we've said, this has already done a lot of damage. They, if they, if they did that, they must have uh, not anticipated the amount of damage that could be done within the initial, this is still like the initial 24 hours, right? And of course, Andrew's right. You have to actually see how much of this actually continues over the next weeks, months, and years, but 
you would think that if they had intentionally deliberately released this overly aggressive draft, and now there's a lot of, lot of backlash against it, they would be instantly ready to say, to, to play the part of the good guy and say, no, that's not right. We would never, you know, that was drafted by some attorney uh, and who was trying to, you know, overly protect our stuff. We rejected this draft immediately. Uh, pay no attention to it. They'd be immediately ready to play the good guy, wouldn't they? Splin Corinth says, uh, just call it robbery. If the scenario that David 62 is uh, promoting comes to uh, fruition, and that was taking the taking Pathfinder. I guess they have to be thinking about that. Do they not? I mean, if you're the publisher of Pathfinder uh, and you read that, I, like, I do wonder what's going on. Uh, I think, didn't I read someplace or didn't we already read that there was something that wasn't, that, that Pathfinder had not, uh, or Paizo had not put out a statement yet when I can understand why they wouldn't. I mean, this is first of all, a leak. It may or may not be true. And second of all, they're probably doing a lot of thinking and a lot of reading over things and a lot of looking at scenarios. So I can completely understand that they wouldn't release a statement that, um, uh, or, you know, and other publishers probably wouldn't be releasing statements. Uh, we did see the one from green road and games, but that was kind of brief, probably be a while before we actually have, uh, publishers release more statements about what they're going to do first to make sure that this is true and it actually comes to fruition and then actually to develop a new strategy. It just takes time. DM toolbox, DM toolbox says beyond welcome DM toolbox. Good to see you and good to have you in the chat. So beyond just D and D I'm worried for all the other systems that are built using the OGL. I don't know if they can make this revoking of the OGL one point, uh, 1.0 a stick, but they can try and make it hard for everyone. Right. Yes. And the making it hard for everyone is what is going to be the worst on smaller publishers, right? That even if this is, even if it's not true and they can't actually make it stick, like you're talking about making your life miserable for three, six, 12 months, may be enough to just cause it to end anyway. And that's extremely sad and terrible. So DM Toolbox says, I have heard from two different IP lawyers, and one said that perpetual and revocable are two different things. The other said they are not. So who knows, right? So, okay, but thank you so much for bringing this up, DM Toolbox, because that does seem to be like we were talking about earlier when we were reading through that. And going back and looking at the terms of terms of this license, um, some key terminology because we knew the word perpetual was in there and then that seems to be the thing that comes up. So is perpetual the same as irrevocable because we know the license is perpetual, non-exclusive and worldwide. Does that mean it can be revoked? And see, here's the thing. Here's the thing about X. So, so what would you immediately do in the situation? And this comes up so often when you're trying to analyze all kinds of technical situations in an area of expertise, right? Exactly what, because we don't, we need a definitive answer. So somebody give me the answer to that, right? Well, how do we determine the answer to that? I know, let's talk to a lawyer. Hey, I know, let's talk to a very specific kind of lawyer. Let's talk to a lawyer who is specifically uh, uh, specialized in IP law. That sounds like exactly what you want to do, exactly what DM's toolbox is saying right here. And in this case, so let's talk to an expert. Well, in this case, we talk to two different experts, DM's toolbox is saying, two different IP lawyers experts, and you get two different answers, <laughs> right? So who knows, right? That's the way it often goes, right? Oh, let's, let's hey, wait, we got a question here about a technical thing in IP law. Let's go talk to an IP lawyer. Do you get an answer from the IP lawyers? No, you get multiple answers. <laughs> So, right. So one of them said that perpetual and revocable are two different things. The other one said that they are not. So where does that leave us? Right. Where does that leave us? That's enough ambiguity right there. So if you've got IP lawyers on both sides of the issue, how is anybody else supposed to know? Right. How is anybody else supposed to know if IP lawyers can look at the facts on the ground, specialists in IP law, and give you two different opinions, two different opposing opinions on the situation. How does any independent third-party publisher have any idea about how exactly to go about this, right? Because you go to the experts and you get two different answers. <laughs> so, uh, hey, oh, look, I see we just hit 49. 
49 people in the uh, uh, watching live. That is another record for the morning grind. Thank you all so much for being here. Please do hit the like and subscribe. Maybe we can hit a record on the number of likes, uh, a new record for the number of likes uh, on the morning grind. Can somebody put in the chat how many likes we're up to? Be great if we had that. So yeah, so th I think this is going to be the issue. I expect to be seeing exactly what DM Toolbox is saying, uh, going back and forth on Twitter, in different blog posts, in different videos. Probably that's exactly what's going to happen. We're going to have two, we're going to have IP lawyers who are going to give us uh, completely mutually contradictory answers to this question. And so the answer is, well, maybe a court will have to make this determination. Surely, though, there are court case precedents about whether or not perpetual and revocable are two different things or not. That seems like something, at least as a matter of fact, we should be able to establish uh, as far as precedents in court cases. At least that seems that way. Sply Corinth says D&D is blessed by being owned by good companies. TSR Wizards of the Coast. I believe that's ironic. Grimhild says Hasbro may not care whether or not a court would decide. Let me read that again. Take a drink here. Grimhild says Hasbro might not care whether or not a court would decide to say that they can't revoke OGL 1A. In the meantime, they just process. And in the meantime, just the process could cause so many problems for third-party publishers that third-party publishers might not survive anyway. Right. Yeah, I agree. That enduring the legal challenge, I mean, that's a negative of our legal system, right? That um, simply going through it can destroy people who might even be right anyway. So that's a big negative. Kilo Echo November says, regarding to Mike Hansford, Wizard of the Coast may not own the word and backstory of tieflings. Oh, oh, excuse me. Wizard of the Coast may own the word and backstory of tieflings, not the concept of a devil-blooded or infernal corrupted people or humans with horns. Too many similar creatures that predate, predate, predate tieflings. Oh, right, right. Yeah, I would agree with that. That, yeah, if you've got a miniature and you're saying, this is a tiefling, then that could be one issue. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, they don't own the idea of a, right, a devil-blooded person, right, with horns, right, they don't. Hey, if, if you would share this, we're getting close, it would be really neat, we're up to 50, 49 people, uh, but if you would share the link someplace on Twitter or something like that, it would be really, really cool if we ended up with a, a record of 50 people uh, on the stream at one time. I would really appreciate it, it'd be fun, it'd be neat, neat to see 50 people watching. Uh, Access Your Inner Light says, Grimhill, do you think that's what they're trying to do? Uh, just kill third-party publishers? Uh, the only way to pay to play is our way? Raymond Smith says, the one thing I hate about 5e is how vague it is. Third-party content creators do their job for them by adding in content that should have been in the game from the start, and Wizards of the Coast give, gives them the finger. Well, I, yeah, see, I don't think that, uh, I don't, you know, I've enjoyed playing 5e, I don't just bash 5e for the point of bashing 5e, which I don't do for anything. But I played 5e, I enjoy it, but there are some problems that I have with it. Third-party publishers have addressed some of those problems. One of the problems I have with it is that the book seems so badly organized. I do talk about that a lot. I had to like do all kinds of highlighting and note-taking and annotating and actually fixing things and adding things to the index in order to really make the game, the game book something that I can easily reference at the table. I wonder with OGL 1.0, 1.1, is what is the coast targeting Reaper miniatures? Oh, well, that's interesting. I don't know. Uh, are you, uh, I don't know what's going on with Reaper. I haven't been following Reaper lately at all. Are they using Wizards of the Coast IP? Like, sure, maybe. I don't know. Are they using, are they publishing Beholders and Tieflings? Rhino says, Sandy Peterson has an interesting video on how IP issues are resolved in gaming from someone who was in it for a long time. Sometimes they send a letter to you uh, to get you to do something via intimidation. Well, yeah, no, I know that. Uh, that's happened to me before. Because that's that's one of the things that that's another part of the legal system. Uh, first of all, are you right? OK, but that's actually at the top level. Like if you're actually in court. Well, actually, there are three different <laughs> several different levels. First of all, are you actually right? Uh Second of all, can you get a court to agree that you're right, <laughs> right? Because uh, sometimes the court makes decisions that might be incorrect. So are you right? Will the court agree that you're right? 
Can you survive enough legal litigation and the expense to get to that court? But then second of all, can you endure the intimidation? Because that's that certainly happened to us. Uh, uh, in fact, one of the first products, the first Elder Dice products, I won't go into this in detail, but one of the first Elder Dice products, uh, the, the first line of Elder Dice that David and I were putting out when we were just, actually before we'd even formed Infinite Black as a company, uh, but the first Elder Dice products, we're sitting there making our Elder Dice, and then all of a sudden we get this letter from one of the tabletop game publishers telling us to uh, cease and desist, right? And we're like, what? This I mean, it was completely ridiculous. It's completely ridiculous. We just, it was not anything that was valid. Not anything that was valid. Uh, but we got one. So that was obviously somebody trying to intimidate us right there and trying to get us a way to stop us from making those dice. Um, so we just carried on and nothing ever came of it because it was ridiculous. But other people might be intimidated. Actually, I've gotten that uh, 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 with uh, another thing as well. Somebody sending us very, uh, sending me uh, something very uh, nastily worded and intended basically to intimidate, right? So yeah, that's that's one level right there. Intimidation is definitely one. The the because the prospect of trying to go through lit litigation and all that legal stuff is enough to chase some people away. Zach says this feels to me like the perfect off ramp opportunity for D and D. Fifth edition has pretty much all it needs from Wizards of the Coast. One D and D is invalidating subclasses from all old books, so why rebuy everything from one D and D? I don't know. I'm buying stuff, <laughs> buying stuff all the time. I don't really, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to see. You know, if it were just an issue of the rules, and you know, none of this were an issue, I would definitely take a look at the new rule set. In fact, we, I was looking at the pre play test material on this stream. Spline Corinth says, I think that with Pathfinder 2nd Edition may have been enough of its own beast to not bother with the OGL. Uh, let's look. Does it, can we get any um, a confirmation on that? Uh, I've got the Pathfinder 2nd Edition core rule book right here. Let me look in the back here. Oh, it, nope, it does. The very back page. Well, where am I looking? Right here. Right here. Boom. Very back page. This is the Pathfinder 2nd Edition core rule book. And in the back of it is uh, Open Game License version 1.0a. So this does have the Open Game License in the back of it. So we do have information about um, product identity, external tools, open game content. Well, anyway, this tiny font, but the open game license is in the back of the uh, Pathfinder second edition rulebook. Cold Kane says, I own a Discord server with over 300 people and I run paid games along with a few other friend DMs. A few other friend DMs. We buy a lot of the books and bring lots of new people to D&D. We are looking on going over to Pathfinder. Speaking of uh, Discord servers, love to have you on the Ravenkeep. Let's if you are new here or coming onto the stream, Raven Keep Discord server. It's a lot that I want to do with that in this coming year. So, uh, yeah, I'd be interested to know how that uh, how that goes. Um, how about how you're using uh, Discord to run uh, games? And also, the, the idea of paid uh, DMing is interesting to me. So, Cold Cane, welcome, welcome. It is uh, it's good to see you. Paid DMing is uh, seems to be controversial in the gaming community. But I don't, I don't personally have any type of philosophical problem with it. Uh, so yes, I'm looking at going over to Pathfinder. Uh, we were look, we were looking at the second edition Pathfinder box set here a few days ago on uh, the Morning Grind, and it's a, it seems like a great box set. Uh, if they run us off, they lose thousands. And Cold Kane's talking about the uh, people who are on his Discord server. So yeah, that's you know, and and how many people are? I don't know, but this is just a question. How many people are there like Cold Kane? who are running things like that. Mike tells us we are now at uh, 39 thumbs up. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. That is a new record. I'm going to keep track of that. 30, 35 thumbs. And uh, our record watchers viewership was 49, at least across all of the different uh, channels. We're streaming on uh, Facebook, YouTube, and also Twitch, and also out to uh, Twitter. But predominantly, I think most people watch on uh, YouTube. YouTube is our is kind of my, my mainstay here. 
Uh, Building Persephone says, perpetual refers to the length of the terms of a license. Irrevocable refers to the rights of the license holder. Perpetual uh, licenses exist for per perpetuity in perpetuity, but could be revoked unless specifically but could be revoked unless specifically stated otherwise. See, that's the way I think about it right now. The, uh, upon going back to that and reading the, that terms of the open license, uh, the open uh, gaming license 1.0a, that's what the way that I would have interpreted. As a non-expert, as a non-expert, I would say that I can give you a perpetual license, which means that it's not going to stop because you know the opposite would be here's a 10-year license. Or here's a license until you published three game books or made two movies or something like that. That would be one thing. Perpetual returns to link the license. But just because I give you a perpetual license to use my stuff doesn't mean that I couldn't revoke it. So irrevocable refers to the rights of the license holder. So a perpetual license could continue to exist and go on and go on and go on, but it could be revoked. So, I mean, that's, that's how me, how I as a non-expert in the field of IP law would look at it now, especially going back and looking at that and going, well, now, wait a minute, what's the difference between perpetual and revocable? We might actually, there might be some issue here. So that's, that's would be my layman's interpretation as well. Uh, building Persephone. Oh, Grim Hilt says, Oh, weird. I only see nine. Oh yeah. I saw that you said there were nine likes so far. Maybe I don't, maybe it needs to be refreshed. I don't know. Uh, so we'll take 35. So irrevocable licenses can be limited by time. So, right. Yes, you could say, right. Yes. Yeah. I mean, this makes sense to me. So you could say, here is a license for the next 10 years and it's irrevocable for the next 10 years. You've got it for 10 years. But then, I, so I cannot take it away from you for the next 10 years, but it ex expires the 10 years later. Kilo Echo November says, fun fact, Wizard of the Coast doesn't own the IP rights to the concept of dungeons and or the concept of dragons. They may own mechanics, but they can't actually do much, don't own as much as they seem, as they, let me say it again. Fun fact, Wizard of the Coast doesn't own the IP rights to the concept of dungeons, certainly not, or the concept of dragons, certainly not as well. They may own mechanics, but they actually don't own as much as they like to imply they do. And they might not even own the mechanics. They might own the expression, a certain expression of the mechanics, right? So th I think that you could be right. You could be right. Guitar Guy Nick. Oh, Guitar Guy must have been back from his uh, gu giving the guitar lessons. We're still here, which is insane. This is definitely the longest morning grind live stream ever uh, by far. I typically go for one hour on the morning grind live stream or sometimes sometimes an hour and a half. So this is definitely the longest live stream ever for the morning grind, longest morning grind live stream ever. It is not surpassing the record for the longest live stream, though. One of the after parties, one of the cultist after parties uh, was that. So Guitar Guy Nick says, I fully believe they are destroying the hobby, but intentionally or unintentionally? Surely they're not intentionally destroying the hobby because they're in the hobby, but I uh, believe they're destroying the hobby. That's uh, Frank B. Welcome, Frank B. Good to see you, Frank. Frank says, that's why Reaper Minis calls their tieflings something like Hellborn. Well, right. So that seems to me like what they would be doing, right? That there's no way, like it's not no way, because anything's possible. Mistakes can be made, especially. But it seems like if I were Reaper and I'm making miniatures for d and I wouldn't make tiefling miniatures. You just rename it Hellborn miniatures, because they, they don't have a copyright over some type of demon-blooded creature, human-like creature with horns and a tail. Hellborn, done. Grim here, it says, uh, Reaper has a lot of miniatures that look like w uh, WCCs, but they try to change things enough. Uh, right, file off the serial numbers. Right, yeah, yeah, exactly, Grim Hilt. Inner Light says, I just checked Reaper miniatures. They don't have any trigger words that I could find. Beholder, Tiefling, although Drow, Dark Elf is mentioned. Isn't that D&D &D specific? Um, drow might be. I think Drow might be. Uh, yeah, now their their mind flares are Bathalian. Yeah, mind flares are another one, right? Guitar guy Nick, uh, Pathfinder two guy here, ask away. Oh, so yeah, going to Cold Cane. So yeah, come on, Guitar guy Nick, uh, Guitar guy, are you in on the um, uh, Discord server? I mean, you can definitely get touched by the Raven Keep Discord server if you guys are both on the Raven Discord server. Hey, we just hit fifty. 
watchers. I'm just looking up. So 50 people across all the different platforms are now watching. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. That is incredible. I just saw 50 go by. So if you will, please do hit uh, hit the like button. Uh, this is incredible. So this is the most watched uh, uh, morning grind ever. It does, but may have avoided the OGL. Uh, that may have been regarding Pathfinder. Uh, Frank B says, not that I'd ever print it, but I'm glad I got my homemade system. I'm glad my homemade system isn't OGL based. Well, that's... Um, that's one of the, well, I want to make my own RPG system just because I want to make my own RPG system, but I don't want to base it. I wouldn't have based it on OGL anyway, but you know, uh, it's called faded edge and we've been building that here on the, uh, on the channel and on Tuesdays we've been looking at uh, RPG mechanics and how to build out uh, RPG mechanics. So I've been looking at building out faded edge, but especially in light of this, I'm like, you know, I'm glad I went ahead and started working on faded edge because might just need it. It's better if I uh, have my own system that uh, we can work with than uh, Raven keeping on this channel. Cal says, Wizards of the Coast is using intimidation gunboat diplomacy. This will backfire. When will the per uh, Then the Perkins will say some crap to smooth it over. Uh, I don't know who that is. I, that's somebody, is that the, are you talking about uh, like one of the people who works for Wizards of the Coast? I, I, something, I re recognize the name Perkins. Intimidation and gunboat diplomacy. What do we think about that? Building Persephone says they did successfully force Gary Gygax to change his game system name, though from dangerous dimensions to dangerous journeys, because D&D &D is an infringement on the trademark. Interesting. Congrats on, thank you, thank you. Congrats on 50. Thumbs up and still climbing. Now at 38 thumbs, 38 thumbs. Making note of that. Con thank you. Thank you all so much. Subbed. David says subbed. Thank you so much for subscribing. Yeah, Chris Perkins. That's who I thought you were talking about. I think I see him. I don't know much about him. I think I've probably seen him go by on Twitter, though. Thank you. 50 simultaneous uh, so watchers. Yep, that's what we hit. So thank you. Hey, let's go over here. I'm not quite done yet. I, quite done yet because there were some other things I wanted to look at. Let me go over here that I had pulled up anyway. Now, this is also an unofficial opinion. I saw this. Now, can we get this is this is also like did this actually come from who we think it did? Um, I don't know who is posting this. So we also have a, we have to evaluate this in terms of credibility as well, and then also expertise. But Ryan Dancy. So this person says I re Hasbro cannot deauthorize OGL. I reached out to the architect of the original open gaming license, former VP of Wizards of the Coast, Ryan Dancy and ask his opinion about the current plan by Wizards of the Coast to deauthorize the current OGL in favor of a new one. He responded as follows. Drink time. Yeah. My public opinion is that Hasbro does not have the power to deauthorize a version of the OGL. See, that's an, the deauthorize is also an interesting part that we talked about. Because it says any under any authorized version of this license, is that um, a loophole to get out? Because what does it mean to be an authorized version of the license? And who has the power to deauthorize it? So there, there are two issues. There's the perpetual and irrevocable issue. So that's one. But then a deauthorization issue. So they're explicitly deauthor deauthorizing something, right? Can you deauthorize a version of the OGL? That's another question. So there, there are a few different questions that are overlapping and layered on top of this. But this person, um, Ryan Dancy, uh, says, yeah, my public opinion is that Hasbro does not have the power to deauthorize a version of the OGL. If that had been a power that we wanted to reserve for Hasbro, we would have enumerated it in the license. I'm on record numerous places in email and blogs and interviews saying that the license could never be revoked. So now, of course, this is his opinion, and it's interesting to know the intention. I think it's very interesting to note the intention here, um, because Hasbro's lawyers may have a very different opinion. But I think it does give some insight into the way the, the, the philosophy behind the OGL when it was originally released. So if deauthorization had been a power we wanted to reserve for Hasbro, we would have enumerated it in the license. I'm on record numerous places in emails and blogs saying the license could never be revoked. So this doesn't have legal weight, but I think it's interesting to look at. 
Ryan also maintains the Open Gaming Foundation. As has been previously noted, even Wizards of the Coast in its own OGL FAQ did not believe at the time that this license could be revoked. So uh, so I, I would like to see... A, oh, no, wait, here it is. Here's a link. Let's figure out where this... Well, well, we'll read it and then figure out where it came from. So, seven. Can't Wizards of the Coast change the license in a way that I wouldn't like? The FAQ says, yes, it could. However, the license already defines what will happen to content that has been previously distributed using an earlier license in Section 9. As a result, even if Wizards made a change you disagreed with, you could continue to use an earlier acceptable version at your option. In other words, there's no reason for Wizards to ever make a change that the community of people using the open gaming license would object to because the community would just ignore that change anyway. That's really interesting. So let's go over here to open. So this is, what am I on? Oh, I'm on the web archive. So this is on the archive. So this is where this came from. So this is Open Gaming License Frequently Asked Questions, version 2.0, January 26, 2004. So this is very interesting regarding their insight in 2004. So this is their FAQ about the Open Gaming License. So does Wizards of the Coast copy? Well, let's just look at this. So what is the open gaming license? Some of this we might need to go over. What? Uh, where can I read the text of the OGL? What are the penalties for violating terms of the license? Okay, this is interesting. What did they say? You are potentially liable for three groups of people for various types of lawsuits. First, you could be sued by anyone listed in the copyright notice section related to any open game content you copied, modified, and distributed. Second, you could be sued by anyone who receives open game content from you and relies on you to ensure that your work conforms to the terms of the license who subsequently discovers problems with the open game content they are receiving from you. Third, you could be sued by someone with a copyright or trademark interest in the work you've distributed, even if you did so while relying on a previous publisher's representation that they had followed the terms of the license. Okay. You could be sued for copyright in infringement. You could be sued for misuse of trademark. You could be sued for breach of contract, and you could be sued for any other number of torts related to those three actions. Um... If you have concerns about the scope of your liability under the license, consult with a legal counsel. Okay. Why does Wizards of the Coast hold the copyright to the license? Wizards of the Coast wrote the license and wants to control the right to make changes to the license in the future. Does, Wiz does Wizards of the Coast copyright to the license mean that anything I publish using the license is owned by Wizards of the Coast? No, they say. The copyright on the license pertains to the terms of the license itself, not to material distributed under the license. How can I distribute the license if Wizards of the Coast owns the copyright to the license? Wizards of the Coast has granted a free and unrestricted right to, to distribute exact copies of the license. Okay, can't Wizards of the Coast change the license in any way I would like, in a way I wouldn't like? So this is where that answer came from. Yes, it could. However, the license already defines what will happen to content. See, I thought we were going in a slightly different direction, and I, this is probably the direction that, that Hasbro wants it to go now. The license has already defined what will happen to content that has been previously distributed using an earlier version in section 09. So you could say, well, if it's already been published, if it's already out, now that does leave people who are like uh, in limbo because they're doing layout and they're getting books printed and all of that. You could say, well, you published that under an earlier license, so you just get to keep publishing it and it's no problem. That was published under that license, keep going. Now it seems like they're going backwards on that. But it says, but as a result, this is the fascinating part, as a result, even if Wizards made a change you disagreed with, you could continue to lose to use an earlier acceptable version at your option. So then why doesn't everybody just stay with 1.0? Now that doesn't cover some other system reference document, right? So if they put out the, let's call it sixth edition system reference document, you wouldn't be able to use it right? Because it might be covered by a different license, but you could still keep using the fifth edition, uh, the 1.0a and use the fifth edition SRD. In other words, there's no reason for wizards to ever make a change to the community, the community of people using the open gaming license would object to because the community would just ignore the change anyway. What do we think about that? I mean, because that's exactly, you know, this, this, if this was their thinking in 2004, this, what's going on now, if the leak is true, 
And if they go forward with it, that seems very counter to that. What is enhancement? Uh, what is o- open? Is open game content limited to just the game mechanic? No. The definition of open game content also provides for an additional content clearly identified as open game content. Well, now this is interesting. Is open game content limited to just the game mechanic? A. Answer no. The definition of open game content also provides for any additional content clearly identified as open game content. You can use the open game license for any kind of material you wish to distribute using the terms of the license, including fiction, artwork, maps, computer software, ECT. Wizards, however, rarely releases open content that is not just mechanics. Uh... Could I? Yeah. Uh, can't. Why can't any terms be added or subtracted from the license? This clause ensures that each person that you distribute open game content to will get exactly the same rights that you received when you got the open game content yourself. Note that this clause means you can't restrict others from adapting your open game content or limit who can distribute open game content in any other restrictive term. Likewise, you can't alter the terms of the license to remove sections that you might find objectionable, like product identity definition. So, to be clear, does this mean that Wizards of the Coast could make could take open game content I wrote and distribute it for free, put it into a Dungeons Dragons product, and make money off of it? Yes. So that means that if you write open game content, distribute it for free, Dungeons and Dragons could publish it. So that's, but, but there is the way here. You've got to clearly distinguish between what is open game content and what is product identity, right? So you do that. So the product identity is separate from the open game content. So we've seen different things that say, this is open game content. This is product identity, right? So if open game content, open game content could loop back, that could loop back to D and D. Wouldn't they have to ask my permission to pay a royalty? No, they wouldn't. That's what open game content means. So we typically think probably of open game content as being something that goes from Wizards of the Coast down to something that you are creating and then distributing down to other people who are making more stuff off of it. But that does mean that it can loop back around. It can go up. Uh, Isn't that pretty unfair? If you don't like the terms of the open game license, don't publish open game content. Since the terms of the license are public knowledge and they apply to everyone equally, including commercial publishers like Wizards of the Coast, your decision to use the open game license means that you are you consent to abide by the terms freely and without coercion. That's about as fair as anything ever gets. So this has been going on for 20 years, right? Uh, and everybody seems to have been okay with that. I mean, obviously, lots of people have been doing this. So does Wizards of the Coast get copyright to my open game content? No, they do not. When you distribute open game content, you must assert a valid copyright either on your own behalf or on behalf of those who do... Who do who, whoever does own the valid copyright for the material. You do so by adding your copyright information to the copyright notice section of the license when you distribute the license with your open game content. Wizards of the Coast has to follow the terms of the open license just the same as everybody else. That means if they want to use open game content that isn't something they own outright or have a separate agreement with the copyright holder, they'll have to include a copy of the OGL in the work where they've used open game content, they'll have to clearly identify what content is open game content, and they'll have to preserve the copyright notice section of the OGL you used when you distribute your work originally. You will retain full copyright to your open game content regardless of who redistributes it. Okay. I want, I was about to say, maybe that's all we need to cover, but this says, I want to distribute computer software using the OGL. Is that possible? Answer, yes, it's certainly possible. The most significant thing that will impact your effort is that you will have to give all the recipients the right to extract and use any open game content you've included in your application, and you have to clearly identify what part of the software is open game content. The way is to design your application so that all the open game content resides in files that are human readable. 
that is in a format that can be opened and understood by a reasonable person. Another is to have the, all the data used by the program viewable somehow while the program runs. Distributing the source code is not an acceptable method of compliance. First of all, most programming languages are not easy to understand if the user hasn't studied the language. Second, the source code is a separate entity from the executable file. The user must have access to the actual open content used. Interesting. Interesting. Let's go to the chat on that. A guitar guy, Nick, did you see my link? Uh, maybe I did not. Are you talking to me? I might. I think I must have missed it. Uh, DM Toolbox says, I missed some of the streams, so I assume you saw the statement from my lawyer friend that Ted at Nerd Immersion shared. Uh, my lawyer friend, that's, <laughs> this is going on and on, but the last thing that I had open was to look at something that was written by Noah, my lawyer friend. Uh, so I want to look at that here in just a second. Uh, that statement. But I missed some of the streams, so I assume you saw the statement from my lawyer friend that Ted at Nerd Immersion shared. Is that the same statement? If that's the same statement, then yeah, that's what we're going to look at. Uh, if not, uh, we'll take a, uh, I want to take a look at it. Send me the link. Frank B. says, I've hated Wizards of the Coast ever since the 1990s when they were, <clears throat> when they were using Walmart-like tactics to bury other game systems and drive uh, friendly local gaming stores out of business with their mall stores. All of this is nothing new. Uh, really? Were there there were Wizards of the Coast mall stores? I don't remember that. DM Toolbox, I, t DM Toolbox says I also saw a three page statement from a lawyer to Wizards of the Coast that DM D, uh, DM Dave shared. Oh well, can I get a link to that? I'd be interested to know. Uh, if you can send me the link, we'll check it out. DM toolbox, like here in the chat. Put it in the. I've only got the chat up. I'm not like checking Twitter right now, uh, or or even the Discord server. But it would be great if we could put it in the Discord server so that other people can check it out too. Links would be great in the Discord server because that maybe people can go over them a bit more time. But uh, if you post them here, uh, we'll check them out. So DM's toolbox says the other IP lawyer I mentioned was just via tech via text between a friend of mine, and that is a publisher and a lawyer. So okay, so that was so this is the other IP lawyer. I mentioned was just via text between a friend of mine that is a publisher and the lawyer. So that was replied to my text with the following. I agree. The OGL didn't have a clause that would allow it to be terminated by Wizards of the Coast, Hasbro, or any other entity. Unless you voluntarily accept the terms of the new license, I don't see that as enforceable. Yeah. So uh, DM uh, Grimhild says, DM Toolbox, I've seen the same letter from DM Dave. So, but again, that seems to that seems to kind of go with my intuitive understanding as well, right? Uh, I, I think that unless you're voluntarily accepting the terms of the new license, I don't see that as enforceable because I, I'm pretty sure I, I must have been reading this FAQ a long time ago. Like 2004, I probably was probably going through that. And that's probably why it's stuck in my head that, wait a minute, Wizards of the Coast can't terminate the OGL. That, that's probably why it is, because I'm sure we were going over all kinds of stuff online. Like, oh, what's going on with this OGL stuff? So it, it had been lodged in my brain that the OGL was not revocable, that you couldn't all of a sudden get rid of it. You couldn't un-OGL something. That was my understanding. And it may have come from this FAQ uh, exactly. Building Persephone says, yeah, that's the point of stating or not stating revocable or irrevocable. If it's just perpetual, then it's just perpetual. Yeah, seems reasonable to me. GM Hild says, yeah, it would probably be a big mistake for anyone to accept the OGL without serious, the OGL 1.1 without serious thought. Building Persephone says, I think the interpretation that Wizards of the Coast is trying to force is that 5E and 6E are the same and fall under the new license will result in overlapping licenses, which isn't possible. Oh, well, that's interesting because I was wondering, it, it does seem cleaner, like, and I, I've mentioned this before, but it does seem cleaner if 6th edition was just its own 
you know, uh, one D&D is sixth edition. It's its own complete new rule set. that has been written from the bottom up. And if you want to use it, here's its SRD with this particular license. And it can be as different as draconian or not draconian or whatever as they want it. But maybe, but we've got this backward compatibility issue and we've got this, this issue, you know, that this kind of fifth edition is to carry on. So maybe building Persephone, that's a very interesting thought here that maybe they are the same. Maybe the idea is they're trying to make them trying to fall under the same license. That That's interesting thinking. So that is a very interesting angle. I, this is one of the reasons why I love the community and the live streams, because the different things that come up, this is why it's so much better than, hey, let me sit down and think about everything I can and make a YouTube video. The conversation, the dialogue, the information that everybody's got, so useful. So David62 says, Pathfinder 2 has the OGL. Yes. Building Persephone says, this seems to me to be the reason they are so hot on calling it one d d Ah, well, could be. Because actually, I, we talked about uh, in some video, we mentioned like, what is the meaning? Or maybe it was the comments or something like that. What exactly is the meaning of the term one d d What exactly does that mean? Uh, uh, and actually, some of my other friends had mentioned that too. So yeah, I don't know that we have clarification on exactly what the meaning of that one D&D is, but it must have had something, the people who were trying to make it. So there was a, obviously a deliberate decision to not go um, sixth edition. I mean, obviously, I mean, this, these decisions are made for a reason. So there was obviously a deliberate reason to not call it sixth edition. So what is the meaning behind the word one D&D? Obviously, it seems to be a consolidation. I, I would have said okay it's a consolidation as well and now it seems especially to be a consolidation in terms of all of this but even outside um even before i knew anything about this leak you know and anything else i would have said that what we have here uh we could be implying a kind of consolidation we're all moving together oh mike says we have 40 thumbs up 40 thumbs up so that is a new record if you are here and you haven't hit the thumbs up button please do hit thumbs up that would uh, that's incredible. That's a record for thumbs up for a morning grind live stream. 40 thumbs up. Thank you all. Val says Perkins, if you've seen him, he looks almost plastic. Okay. DM Toolbox says, in reference to this Q&A, we should keep in mind that it's a Q&A, not a legal document. However, can be seen in court as an admission of intent. So this helps in the case against Wizards of the Coast. That's how I was taking it. And that's a very important part to point, thing to bring up DM's toolbox. Thank you. So this is not a legal document. This is not the statement itself. It is, however, I'm uh, using it for the purposes of trying to get into the mind of Wizards of the Coast um, at that time. Yeah. What, what was the intent? What were they thinking? Uh, why are we operating under some of the assumptions that we are? Well, I, I, like I said, I'm sure I must have read that FAQ way back in the day. And so probably that FAQ has formed a lot of our thinking on it, understanding what their intent is and um, forming, yeah, forming the basis on which we have been operating for the past 20 years. You also can't copyright game mechanics, right? You can't copyright the game mechanics. You can copyright expressions of them, right? Uh, Max Headroom. Uh, Shinpai Kuga says, uh, well, I would, I would save the content. Well, I would save the content of the FAQ before it disappears. Paranoid thinking and all. Well, this is on the internet archive. So it looks like 61 captures. So that there's the link here. In fact, here, I'll put the link to this in the chat so everybody can get to it, but it is on the internet archive. But if you want to, uh, look at it yourself or, or download in PDF, uh, I just put it there. But yeah, I'm already looking back on the, the Wayback Machine Internet Archive. Uh, GM Hill says, I posted the letter in your Discord. Um, DM Toolbox, let me, uh, they may have already done this, but here's where in the Discord server. Oh, oh right here. Uh, I think I may have, uh, I think I may have found it. Oh, wait, that's a video. Uh, we'll check that out later. Uh, that's another YouTube video. Oh, right here. Okay. Uh, I see it. Okay. Okay. So I'll, uh, we'll pull that up in just a moment. Thank you. I got it. I got it. It's in the D and D section, uh, link to the discord server. Somebody else may have already done it, but let me drop that in here as well. Uh, so there you go. Just dropped it in the link again, uh, DM, uh, DM Toolbox. 
Jose, welcome, welcome, good to see you. Welcome, 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 good to have you here. The problem is, wait, so, uh, yeah, I'll have to look at, I'm gonna have to look at that later. We may wanna watch that later. Uh, Jose says, the problem is what you do Problem is, what do you do if you get a, a cease and desist order, deceased letter from Hasbro? Well, see, that's the thing. I mean, that's the question. We talked about intimidation. And what do you do? Even if you think you're right, can you afford the litigation? What do you do? Crow Goblin. Uh, Crow Goblin says, apparently it's only non-revocable if the OGL specifically mentions it's non-revocable. And it doesn't. Perpetual only means like it isn't time limited. There's no end. Thank you for being here, Crow Goblin. Right, that seems to be the distinction that we're we are coming to. Uh, apparently, it's oh yeah, it's non-revocable only if the OGL specifically mentions it's non-revocable, and it doesn't. Perpetually only means that it's time limited. There's no end. Uh, Grimhild, YouTube won't let me post a link to Raven Keeps Discord, but if you want to scroll up a bit, you'll see the invite. Okay, I just posted again. You can't post a link. Uh oh, I didn't know that. Uh, Rhino Watcher says part of the teeth of the new OGL is that you will most likely have to agree to it to use the Wizards of the Coast distribution. Yeah, there are Wizards of the Coast distribution platforms like online environments. It wouldn't surprise me that you would have to in order to distribute uh, through them. Crow Goblin says, so there's nothing stopping them from re revoking uh, 1.0a and replacing it with 1.1. Chaos Incarnate says, that's what I was considering. The underlying meaning of the name. The next stop, uh, they may, in fact, yeah, Chaos Incarnate, it may have been you exactly who was talking about that in the comments section. I remember that. Uh, that's what I was considering. The underlying meaning of the name, their next step, uh, the next step they were taking with D and D Cal says, watch a company kill all their goodwill next on Ripley's believe it or not. Well, that, that seems to be what's happening. Sarah. Welcome, Sarah. Welcome. Will wishes the coast now come into my home and steal my DM notes asking for a friend. Well, hopefully that's not happening. Hopefully we don't have the wishes of the coast you know, Gestapo <laughs> coming to your door. Uh, Sarah, uh, D and D channel, scroll to the bottom. Oh yeah. Okay. Yep. Got it. Okay. That was, yeah. It's then the D and D channel of the Raven of the Raven keep discord. Uh, building Persephone says, uh, yes, but the revocability has been stated within, but revocability has to be stated within the existing license. It can't be revoked by a different license. See so many different layers here. Revocability, so we, the new comment here is that revocability has to be stated within the existing license. It can't be revoked by a different license. Yeah, it would. I, I agree with that, that now whether or not revocability is implied or not, but that you can't use a different license to revoke something else. It would have to be, the revocability would have to be addressed within that license, to me as a non-expert, within that license or be otherwise implied to exist or something like that. Okay, let's look in that. Uh, this whole revocable thing is covered in the My Lawyer Friend post. Let's go right there and do that right now next. Good evening from England. Hope you're all safe and sound and gaming hard. Hey, Five Starman, good to see you. Good to see you from England. We're all, I, I'm safe. I hope that we're all safe, even though there seems to be an uproar. But all right, so yeah, let's go over there and do that right now. So this right here, let's take a minute, more drink right here. Let's take a minute to talk about D&D's Open Gaming License, OGL. Hi. Hi, all. My name is Noah Downs, a.k.a. My Lawyer Friend. I'm a licensed attorney. Do I need to increase this? There we go. I'm a licensed attorney with a focus on business and intellectual property issues in the tabletop and digital gaming industries. There is a lot of confusion and misinformation floating around the Internet regarding Wizards of the Coast new Open Gaming License, OGL version 1.1, and what it means for the future of D&D content creators. So I want to take a minute, a few minutes, to answer some of the common questions I see out there about the OGL. OGL basics. So let's get some terms out of the way first. Work. A copyrighted work, or for simplicity, work, is an original creation, such as a graphic, book, video, song, or program that can be protected by copyright law. Copyright holder. A copyright holder is the person who holds the specific rights to a specific work. This can be the author of the work or whoever received ownership from the author. Open license. Copyright holders can choose to issue an open license to their work if they want others to freely build with them, customize, or improve the work. 
Open licenses give permission to anyone to use the work without cost and minimal restrictions on modifications. A perpetual license. Here we get into perpetual and revocable. A copyright holder can issue a perpetual license, which is a license to use the work indefinitely. Indefinitely. How long is indefinitely? Is that a long time or a short time? Well, we don't know, right? It's indefinite. This only means that the license does not have an inherent expiration date. It can still be terminated or evoked. Let me read that again. The copyright holder can issue a perpetual license, which is a license to use the work indefinitely. This only means that the license does not have an inherent expiration date. It can still be terminated or evoked. Revocable license. A license can be revocable or irrevocable. If a license is irrevocable, then it cannot be revoked by the copyright holder. If a license is revocable, then you guessed it. It can be revoked by the copyright holder. If the license does not say it is irrevocable, then it is revocable by default. Okay, so that's what I was talking about, that either that license would have to say that it is revocable, or there is something about revocability that would have to be inherent within the license, right? Even if it doesn't specifically, because you can't, yeah, I agree that you can't use another license to revoke this license. That wouldn't work. But uh, even if this license doesn't say it's revocable, there had to be something inherent about that license that would make it revocable anyway. And here, my lawyer friend is saying, if the license does not say it is irrevocable, then it is revocable by default. All right. Third party creators. Third party creators in this case are individuals or companies that make their works based on copyright holders' open license to a work. Okay. So what's happening? Okay, Wizards of the Coast, WT uh, has a private has privately released the open game license version 1.1, which has now leaked. Excuse me. OGL 1.1 is Wizards of the Coast attempt to revoke and replace the open game license version 1.0A that has been in place for over two decades. The OGL 1.0A is perpetual, but not irrevocable, open license that allowed third-party creators to build a thriving tabletop industry that we have all enjoyed from players to publishers and everyone in between. So he's saying the third, the OGL is a perpetual, but not irrevocable, open license. Companies such as Paizo, Alchemy RPG, Kobold Press, Hit Point Press, The Griffin Saddlebag, DM Dave, Loot Tavern, and many more have sprung up or experienced significant growth because of the terms of OGL 1.0a. OGL 1.1 is not an open license although Wizards of the Coast tries to claim that it is. It's, severely, it's a severely restricted set of licenses, commercial and non-commercial, that grant Wizards of the Coast broad rights to the works of third-party creators and requires incredibly high royalty percentages. We were just talking about that, that 20 to 25% is an incredibly high royalty percentage. In exchange for continuing to create, third-party creators who agree to... Third-party creators who agree to the OGL 1.1 grant Wizards of the Coast the right to reprint, distribute, and otherwise exploit third-party creators' works without any compensation and also require the third-party creators to pay Wizards of the Coast a royalty if the third-party creator finds enough success with its work. What followed is a huge industry discussion about what OGO, OGL 1.0 means for third-party creators, which I suppose this live stream is a continued discussion of, established and fledgling, as well as the tabletop industry as a whole. I would like to answer a bunch of the questions that have been asked in this discussion, as well as other questions I've received while working for third-party creators. Who does this affect and why should I care? OGL, OGL 1.1 affects companies, creators, and fans alike. Virtual tabletops, such as Alchemy RPG and, Virtual, and Foundry VTT, will be unable to host D&D content and modules at all, which will only be available on Roll20 or Fantasy Grounds. Oh, really? Now, that's interesting. I didn't know that. We were talking about Roll20 before. So, uh, and it did say that some of the larger VTTs already have different um, agreements with Wizards in place. 
So this says that it will only be available on Roll20 or Fantasy Grounds. So I guess those are two of the uh, virtual tabletop things that have other agreements already in place with Wizards of the Coast in order to host uh, D&D stuff. So that's interesting. And as we said, that Roll20 is the one who owns the open bookshelf system. And we just found out in the stream that uh, that runs the DM Guild as well as Drive Through RPG. So I guess it would make sense that Roll20 then would have some type of license to be able to use information, uh, uh, D&D stuff on their virtual tabletop software. Third party, I'm not as familiar with Fantasy Grounds. I haven't ever used that. Uh, third party creators such as the Griffin Saddlebags, DM Dave, Loot Tavern, and Mage Hand Press are also subject to those fees, but in addition, risk losing control of the work they make to Wizards of the Coast. D&D based Kickstarters will also be subject to a royalty that makes them all but unfeasible. Especially if you hit a certain, a certain level of, of funding, if you actually are successful. <laughs> All of this only serves to chill and limit the growth of the tabletop economy and community, limiting the amount of D&D content made by third-party creators for fans and serving as a gatekeeping measure for the industry and hobby as a whole. So that's what I would say that if I'm thinking about writing stuff and putting stuff out, yeah, I would say chill and limit is definitely the kind of thing I'm thinking of. But that just means I got to uh, work on Faded Edge some more or use other systems that have are more generous. I am a third-party creator. Should I sign OGL 1.1? I cannot tell you whether to accept OGL 1.1 or not, but I can supply you with information to help me, you make your decision. Here's a breakdown on important points. Any third-party creator that signs OGL 1.1 will be bound by the terms of OGL 1.1 as currently written and subsequently updated. Agreeing to OGL 1.1 means that you have to, one, report what works or your community are making to Wizards of the Coast, two, report revenue from your works to Wizards of the Coast, if above 50000 and pay, which is the coast, a 25% royalty, huge royalty, on certain on revenue over a certain threshold, currently $75,000 for your works. You will own your own content and works and can distribute them to certain places. However, which is the coast will receive a perpetual, irrevocable right to use your works and to allow others to use your works without additional payment to you. This would allow which is the coast to publish these works in places you would not be able to allow to and will allow others to do the same. Your works are the core of your uh, your works are the core of your business, and it would be generally a bad idea to give someone else near unlimited rights, uh, unlimited access to your business. That right there is a uh, undeniably true, right? You're talking about children, like, oh, well, you know, should should I do this? Oh, no, right. And will my friends do this? No, they will not. The people who I know who are working on their own worlds and their own IP and their own stories, and their own tabletop games would never allow that to happen. Wait, seventy-five thousand dollars sounds like seven hundred. Excuse me, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars sounds like a lot. Doesn't this only affect a few large companies? No, no, not necessarily. For several reasons. While seven hundred fifty thousand dollars seems like a large number, that is based on gross revenue, which we have already been discussing. Gross revenue is the total of all money generated from a work, without taking into account any part of that total that has been or will be used for expenses. And if you ever have ever run a publishing business or any type of business at all, you know that expenses can be high. <laughs> In many cases, a third party creator's annual profit will be less than 25% because of expenses for artists, writers, marketing, etc. In addition, third party creators have to pay platform fees for distribution, approximately 7% for Kickstarter. Kickstarter could be 7 to 9%, but if you're up at that rate, it's probably about 7%. 8% for Patreon, 50% for Royal 20. Well, 50% for Royal 20? Therefore, a 25% royalty on gross revenue can actually cause a third party creator to lose money, even if they try to make the works in the first place. Yeah, that's huge. That's 25% on gross. The $750,000 amount is the current threshold for Wizards of the Coast to impose royalty. That number can be freely changed by Wizards of the Coast anytime simply with an email to you. It is likely that Wizards of the Coast will rely on the $50,000 reporting threshold to determine how much to reduce that $750,000 threshold by so they can incrementally increase the number of third-party publishers subject to this license. That's exactly what I would expect to happen as well, right? So they're, getting, they're compiling a data set by requiring publishers to report revenue to them at the $50,000 reporting revenue, right? So then once they've got this data set and they've got all of your contact information, they can change it anytime they want. And there's just a simple optimization calculation that would have to be have to occur to figure out, now, wait a minute, 
where exactly should our threshold be in order to maximize the revenue from third-party publishers? Kickstarters have no cap on revenue. And that's what I was saying earlier, right? Yeah, th how can you stop yourself from raising more money if you've got a highly successful product that people want to get? Kickstarters have no cap on revenue. You can, uh, you can raise for your project. So if you kickstart a successful campaign, you may end up accidentally crossing the $750,000 threshold and then suddenly having a new expense that you did not account for in fulfillment of your project. And we've been over a bunch of different Kickstarter stuff, right? And that's exactly what we're talking about. If you're planning on laying out your Kickstarter, like I talk about when we're talking about the business side of things, accounting for everything you need to account for in order to make sure that your Kickstarter can be done and it's going to be successful, all of a sudden hitting that threshold and having another expense can potentially be devastating. Although, although it does mean that you're only paying on the money above that, which is still not, I mean, it's still a chunk, but it would be, it would be absolutely, utterly crippling and unable to do it if all of a sudden you owed 25% uh, uh, of $750,000 as soon as you hit that. That would cripple your Kickstarter. You would, it would be absolutely crippling. It's been over 20 years since the OGL was updated. Why is Witches of the Coast now doing this? Wizards of the Coast, no, Hasbro owns Wizards of the Coast and on December 8th, 2022, announced to investors that although D&D has never been more popular and has really great fans and engagement, this hobby is under monetized, aka Hasbro Hasbro's not making enough money on it, despite Wizards of the Coast nearly $1 billion in revenue last year. In order to increase monetization, Wizards of the Coast can do two things. It can either invest in a team of writers, creatives, or creators to increase the publications and offerings Wizards of the Coast publishes each year, or it can take money from third-party creators by subjecting them to a royalty. The OGL 1.1 takes a foundation document that creators have relied upon for two decades and replaces it with something that Wizards of the Coast monetization of D&D at third-party creators' expense. Now, isn't it also the case, um, just thinking about the uh, an inherent nature of something, that if there's ambiguity in a license then or any other kind of legal document and there's ambiguity then the it should default to the person who did not write the license the understanding should default to the person who did not write the license so if there's ambiguity in when this whether or not this is a revo revocable it should default to the third party publishers right uh like you know in 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 favor of them especially maybe in light of that uh uh, FAQ document, which we said is not a legal document, but does give insight into the intent and what they were telling people. Maybe, maybe it's another way. So why not just continue using the OGL 1.0? So my lawyer friend here, it seems to be definitely saying that, uh, it appears to be saying that which of the coast is going to be able to win this. Unfortunately, the OGL 1.1 exp expressly revokes 1.0a despite what this FAQ from Wizards of the Coast claimed. Oh, so he brought, brings this up. So that's what we say in the FAQ. He says, I do believe that there are potentially legal challenges to the revocation of the OGL 1.0a, uh, especially given the length of time third-party creators have relied upon OGL 1.0a and the speed at which Wizards of the Coast has taken action to revoke it. However, these challenges would have to take place in court. So it's... Right. And that's expensive and time consuming. And many third party smaller publishers won't be able to uh, endure that. And some of the larger ones might get uh, deals to keep that from happening. So I have to say, so if I'm a third party creator, I have to agree to 1.1 OGL 1.1. If I wanted to continue to make licensed content using Wizards of the Coast is claiming to own. Correct. That's what Wizards of the Coast is saying. And if I don't, am I at risk of getting sued? Yep. That sucks. You're not wrong. There has got, to, uh, has got to be something else that we can do. Agreed. Several third-party creators are building out their own open licenses and system reference documents that will become system agnostic, a.k.a. you can use the works they publish there without any compatible system, whether it's D&D &D 5E to Monster of the Week to the Marvel Multiverse RPG. In addition, you can support third-party creators by telling fans and fellow players, we need an open D&D, &D, hashtag open D&D. &D. I've been seeing that hashtag going away to continue this to grow this game that we love. And he is at uh, my lawyer friend uh, on Twitter. Okay, so in conclusion, this is a complex issue that is still unfolding. However, the main things you need to know are one, the OGL 1.1 is not an open license and it imposes many restrictions on the use of works Wizards of the Coast claims to own under relevant copyright law. It's the difference between the proper name of something and what it actually does, right? If you are a third party creator, 
the OGL 1.1 gives Wizards of the Coast a perpetual and irrevocable, now here they're using that word irrevocable, license to your works, so Wizards of the Coast can fully exploit and allow others to exploit without additional permission from or payment from you. That's a complete no-go. I, I, I want to get on, I'm going to uh, message some of my friends who are doing OGL publishing and see what they say. Uh, and then like, if we can have a conversation on stream later, a uh, different stream later, if, uh, if this comes to fruition, we can have that conversation. The $750,000 threshold affects more than just large third-party creators. We can be lowered at any time, and you can expect it to be lower incre lowered incrementally as Wizards of the Coast seeks to profit off third-party creators' works. Wizards of the Coast is a cool company that publishes one of our favorite pastimes. However, they are not your friends, and if we do not find a way to hashtag open d, &D then it will probably diminish this incredible game we have come to love. And be aware that this is not legal advice. What do we think? Lots of comments. Let's go to the comments. Chaos Incarnate says, I like they're at least honest in their vocabulary with exploit. <laughs> we are going to exploit your work. Guitar Guy Nick says, honestly, Fantasy Grounds and Roll20 are the worst VTTS. It's a shame they didn't come up with a deal with Foundry. I tried tweeting the CEO of Wizards of the Coast to fix that. I didn't expect this. I didn't expect this response. Sigh. Oh, is there a? We'll see if we get a response. Um, uh, I, I've used Roll Twenty. I don't have a whole lot of experience with the different VT, D, VTTs. Building Persephone says, I believe that Foundry is at least partially open software with community created modules like the ones that I import that import D and D beyond content. Yeah, it's not it's not all D and D stuff, right? It's just saying that maybe. Uh... Oh, are oh, you talking about Foundry here? So Foundry is the one that does not have the license. Uh, <clears throat> Kilo says, after reprinting Magic the Gathering cards that were on the reserve list last year and now revoking the OGL 1.0A. WotC has lost all integrity and seriously damaged their credibility going forward. Grimhild says, if OGL 1.0a goes away, which of the coast may send a cease and desist order to Foundry to remove the 5th edition SRD support? Could be, could be. And Building Persephone says, yes, and they would make them pay a royalty for anything they could even marginally interpret to be infringing on those licenses. Yep. Is that gross per year or since forever? That's gross per year, Cal. Uh, I believe we said that's in a calendar year. So that's talking about how we uh, gross gross per calendar year annually. Yeah. Grimhild. And would it kill third party modules for VTT, Foundry VTT that can download info from D&D Beyond? Probably. Yep. It's going to kill D&D &D on Foundry, period. I got to check out Foundry. Uh, I don't know anything about it. EOL for all uh, EOL for all unofficial VTTs. Funneling players to pay to play, pay to flare official VTTs. Oh, v and DM's toolbox here says I'm a Foundry developer, so yeah, this sucks. I got to find out more about this. That sucks. Well, and we that was covered in this document, right? This sucks. Yep, you're not wrong. <laughs> Uh, Grim Hild says, and removing access to 5e would really hurt Foundry VTT, which has a much better features than Roll20 or other VTT I know of, and will be a direct competitor to the upcoming Wizards of the Coast VTC. Well, then probably they want to take it out. Although I don't think, DM's Toolbox says, I don't think it's a direct competitor because there are very different styles of VTT, but it would definitely hurt them bad. Foundry VTT should be very careful about accepting the terms of the OGL 1.1. I guess they probably won't if everybody's, if everybody's saying here. Uh, maybe, maybe then if they've got such great features, they can become our alternate. Maybe, maybe then it's, um, maybe then it's not a uh, critical role and role 20 then, but maybe it's critical role and foundry VTT. I wonder if uh, Cobalt press works with uh, foundry VTT uh, Cobalt press, you know, we've been talking about them. They're the Midgard people. Does uh, Cobalt press have stuff on foundry VTT? Grim Hild says, and I don't think was Watsy, would be interested in creating a licensed plugin for Foundry VTT, even if they could monetize the SRD for Foundry, because which of the coast would be able to control or monetize other third, monetize other third. 
Building Persephone says, guaranteed that Wizards of the Coast will challenge the interpretation of 5e content as outside the scope of the 1.1 agreement. Probably, absolutely so. I've seen some demos of really cool stuff with third-person 3D plugins for Foundry. Maybe maybe one morning grind. We've looked at software on the morning grind before. Maybe one morning grind we need to look at uh, Foundry VTT, since everybody seems to be uh, recommending it so much. Guitar Guy Nick says, as I said, this is hyper-capitalism versus people wanting to just have some fun and have a hobby they enjoy and to have income without a huge corp draining all of the fun out of it. Inner Light says, well, if we don't have D&D on Foundry, guess we'll be playing something else. I agree. We'll just play something else. Uh, DM's Toolbox says, Kobold Press does work with Foundry. I developed it for them. Oh, really? Oh, okay, great. Uh, I've done playtesting for uh, Kobold Press. So I, I definitely, okay, so definitely putting this, let me make, make note of this. Check out Foundry VTT. That might be someplace I want to develop virtual tabletop stuff. I'm not really, a, I'm not, I'm not a software developer, but maybe that's the place if we're going to put VTT stuff for uh, Rabavania or Theophany, put it there. So I made a note to check that out and the uh, Kobold Press stuff. And one of my friends writes for Kobold Press. Dave W. says, yes, Kobold Press does have Foundry VTT stuff. Cool. Uh, Building Persephone says, I expect they will push more and more automated features for their VTTs, even pushing out the DMs altogether and making players buy all the content directly. Basically a version of Baldur's Gate. Well, we already have um, apps taking the place of like Zargon and HeroQuest, right? <laughs> and, you know, apps in... Um, uh, the Lord of the Rings game and also uh, Ma Mansions of Madness. So, you know, games can, and you know, AI is coming strong. AI is only going to get better. I mean, it's, there's only so long that we only have a certain amount of time before an AI is going to be able to completely DM us in a game of Dungeons and Dragons or whatever, or any other system, right? I mean, we're coming up on time. So like you're talking about basically a version of Baldur's Gate. When we want to take bets on when that'll be <laughs> or place a pool on that. I mean, you know, we, I've been, Obviously, AI art is just coming along strong and improving all the time. The text-based uh, language models. I mean, right now, I tried to have a, a, one of the chat bots. It's more than a chat bot. One of the massive uh, language models, like chat GPT, right? Uh, DM me. And, of course, it's it couldn't really do it. But this was several months ago. But there's only so much time before that's going to be able to DM you anyway. And, you know, rules it will already be good at. So, and also, uh, Paizo works with Foundry? All right, got to check out more about Foundry. Guitar Guy Nick says, I can give a tutorial on Foundry if you like. If people want that, that would be a good place to put out in the uh, uh, Discord server. DM Toolbox. I do reviews of all their books and have run their games at Game Cons. We're talking about uh, Cobalt Press here. They have a pretty good relationship with uh, Cobalt Press. I know several of their writers as well. Jose Paizo are partners with Foundry. This is interesting. Uh, feel free to hit me up offline if you want to talk Foundry stuff. I'm in the Discord now too. Okay, excellent, excellent. Will do. Um, I'll check. I want to check this out and figure out exactly what it's out because people keep telling me do virtual tabletop stuff, and I just I just haven't. Uh, I'm playing a hex crawl game with. Oh, really? With AI right now? Interesting. Uh, Guitar Guy Nick, just FYI, AI doesn't really exist. Machine learning does, but AI does not. Well, this seems this is not, not I mean, I understand the distinctions between these terminologies that uh, Guitar Guy Nick is trying to uh, make here. And we have deep learning. Uh, deep learning seems to be doing a lot of stuff for us, but this probably is not the right place to get into the uh, differing terminology and the differences. What is commonly, let's put it this way, what is commonly referred to as AI uh, on uh, the internet and social media is coming for a lot of this. Although maybe one day we may get to, to true general AI with consciousness. Maybe, but we'll talk about that later. Frank B says, if I wanted to play a video game, I'd play a video game. And you're using uh, chat GPT to do a hex crawl? That is interesting. That is interesting. I mean, I separate them too, uh, Frank. But, you know, uh, there's pro there's undoubtedly a blending coming. But there were those people, there will still be those people who are like, no technology at the gaming table. Please do. Please do post the results in the Discord once I'm done experimenting. Uh, 
I would love to know what's going on there. 45 thumbs up. Oh, oh let's write that. If you, if yes, thank you. So that is a record for thumbs up on the morning grind, 45 thumbs. So if you are here and you haven't hit thumbs up, please do. That would be awesome. We are now at a record. Thank you. I'll drink to that. It's coffee, but you still deserve it. Uh, okay. Well, Well, see, Bernard says, not really concerned about all of this. It's pretty clear that this license issue will only affect 6E third-party material going forward. Well, that's what's being discussed. It seems like that, it's, it seems like that isn't so clear. If that were the case, I don't think uh, there would be so much concern. But uh, we will see. That's what's kind of being discussed right here. So 45 thumbs up. So the only other thing that I want to look at, I want to go over here to the Discord server. Uh, to pull up, I'm gonna have to catch up with a bunch of stuff on Discord. But uh, let me see if I can save what Grimhild sent us, um, and just look at that because that seems to be something else people sent that we should look at. Let me see what this is. Oh, there's a lot here, but on the other hand, kind of going strong. <laughs> so uh, let's let's see. I'm downloading it now. Oh, it's it's, a, it's only three pages. It's a letter. Let's see here. This is something I can share, right? Let me see what this is. Yeah, yeah. I was about to say that. Yeah, that's not clear at all. That's the whole discussion that we're having here. If they revoke the 1.0 license, then it affects everything. If they didn't do that then what you're saying is, could be true. But if it's a, revo a revocation of 1.0 license, which is exactly what we've been discussing a lot here, and Grim Hill uh, says, Wizards of the Coast is revoking the OGL 1.0A, which will mean that no more third-party fifth edition stuff with the third-party material you know, not accepting 1.1. Bernhardt Bernhardt says, there have been many responses from lawyers, including from Roll 4 Combat, who leaked it initially, and it's, and it's close to impossible to do that. Well, that's exactly what the discussion is. That's exactly what the discussion is. But there, uh, so we've been having on this, uh, this stream. That's exactly what we've been talking about. Because there do seem to be different opinions on this, which is the case with uh, so many things. I figured there'd be people on both sides of this. Okay, so what here is, okay, so is this this January 5th letter that is from, that it was in the Discord server, is this okay for me to put up on stream? Because is this, uh, is this open and public? Does anybody know? This is, uh, I, I represent, I represent Sad Fish Games. Is this okay to talk about? Is this public? Does anybody know? Can we get clarification on that? Let's see. This is what Grim Hill posted. Where did, where did this come from? Oh, so these images were taken from DM Dave's Facebook post. Okay, so let me go to see what DM D Dave said on his Facebook post so we can see. Whoopsie. Okay, so wait a minute. Uh, so this is already out there? So I guess it's okay to look. We're not like disclosing somebody's private conversation or something like that, are we? Or legal document or something. Okay, uh, oh. what happened to my window? Ah. Okay, that window. So we're saying, um, yes, it's okay. Uh, it has been shared publicly. Yes, it's open. It's been shared publicly. Okay. Uh, yeah, good to share. Okay, well, then let's go ahead and look at it and just see what it is. I still, I'm getting a second wind here, but this is probably the last thing we'll go over. <laughs> I did have other things to do today, but this is a really interesting topic. So let me bring this up then. So what does this letter say? Uh, well, that's, yeah, it's public on DM Day, DM Day, but no idea how safe it is. Well, we'll just see. Uh, so Building Persephone says, that's why we'll come down to a tort challenge in court. Most disputes won't get to court, though, as they will be decided in arbitration under NDAs. All right, let me uh, remove this and stop sharing and then go to the other one. So 
So this is something that was sent to Wizards of the Coast. Concerning Open Gaming License 1.1, deauthorization of Open Gaming License 1.0, and demand for a more definitive statement. To whom it may concern, I represent Sad Fish Games, LLC, and Prudence Holdings, LLC, DBA, Prudence Publishing, two U.S.-based publishers of the tabletop gaming materials. I've tried to reach out under more cordial terms by a phone and ordinary Witches of the Coast customer service support channels, but I have not received any response or have been declined communication with the appropriate staff. On December 2021, Wizards of the Coast put out an announcement indicating a new version of the open gaming license would be released. The statement was brief, vague, and as I'm sure you know, caused quite a bit of disruption in the broader gaming community. Notably, however, the language suggested an intention to effectively repudiate the 1.0 a version of the license, presumably in an effort to compel publishers to make use of the new 1.1 license. While Wizards of the Coast has been silent since December 21, 2022, you are likely aware of various alleged leaks of draft language from the proposed 1.1 license, some of which appear to be an attempt by Wizards of the Coast to repudiate and restrict the use of the 1.0 license, as well as to compare the shelling of sell sharing of financial data with Wizards of the Coast and potentially pay a royalty share to the, open co to the company for use of open gaming content. Section 4 of the 1.0a Open Gaming License grants for contributors grants from contributors to include Wizards of the Coast and everyone who has used the license since a perpetual, perpetual worldwide, royalty-free, non-exclusive license with the exact terms of the license to use the open game content. It is quite clear from this language that the license cannot be revoked, nor can Wizards of the Coast stop its future use. So this seems to be counter. So it seemed like the... Uh, our friend lawyer, okay, was talking about, well, uh, maybe. So this is going the other way. So th this is good that we've got the counter here. This is what I'm talking about, the different arguments here. So this, this seems to be the counter. So this person says it's quite clear from this language that the license cannot be revoked, nor can Wizards of the Coast stop its future use. All right, hang on. I got to go to another one. Um, another. These are individual JPEGs. So let me go to this. Stop. Oh, what? Nope. So, uh, present continuing on here, it says Section 9 authorized wizards to publish updated versions of the license. Section 9 authorizes wizards to publish updated versions of the license, but also grants permission to use any authorized version of the license to copy, modify, or distribute any open game content originally distributed under any version of this license. Let, let's, um, let me grab, what's a, like, Midgard would have this, right? Let's go to the Kobold Press. Or actually, no, this should, this should. Where can I, where can I find? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It is. It is right here in the back. So this is referring to section nine, section nine specifically says updating the license. So this is the whole section nine here, updating the license wizards or it's uh, wizards or it's designated agents may publish updated versions of this license. You may use any authorized version of this license to copy, modify, and distribute any open game content originally distributed under any version of this license. Well, see, that right to me, oh, I meant to put this up on screen. So that's what we're looking at. So, that, But that's the uh, section nine. So that's why I guess that language deauthorize is so important. Because like I would consider what is an authorized version of the license? Like I, in my mundane understanding of that, would be an, a license that is officially published and released by Wizards. That's an authorized version of the license, not a leak, not a draft, you know, nothing like that, but that an authorized version of the license is one that is, you know, complete and released, you know, publicly by Wizards of the Coast. That's an authorized version. The language here then says, well, can you deauthorize? Can you deauthorize a license and in what circumstances? 
I, I would say there's nothing about deauthorizing a license because we've got several different terms. We've got perpetual, we've got we've got perpetual, we've got revocability, but then also the third thing to think about is this authorization. So there are three different levels to this. Or three, I don't know if there are levels, but three different angles on this. Is it revocable and is it deauthorizable? So do we have um, from a legal perspective, we understand some information about what perpetual means. We probably know a lot of information about what perpetual means. We also know from a legal standpoint what um, revocable and irrevocable means. Do we know from a legal standpoint what authorization and deauthorization means? Or is that specific to this case? Okay. So we're saying Section 9 authorizes Wizards to publish and updated versions of this license, but also grants permission to use any authorized version of this license to copy, modify, and distribute any open game content originally distributed under any version of this license. Some leaks suggest Wizards intends to claim that 1.0 license is no longer an authorized version, forcing future contributors to use the 1.1 license. Notably, authorized version is not a defined term in the license. Which, right, so that's exactly why I'm saying my interpretation would be of that. But what does it mean to be an authorized version? And what exactly, I gave my opinion, but what is it, uh, and then is deauthorization possible? Notably, notably, authorized version is not a defined term in the license. As you know, ambiguities and agreements such as these, such as these offer, uh, such as these office, uh, such as these, whenever a distribute whenever a, distribute, a, a distribute, <laughs> dispute arises are interpreted against the drafter, the drafter being Wizards of the Coast. Okay, I talked about that a moment ago, right? So that's why I would say I'm confused about what an authorized version is. Um, we have our understanding that's been used for the past two decades. I'm understanding an authorized version being one that's actually officially published and released by Wizards of the Coast. Then it's authorized. Like I said, it's not a draft, it's not a leak, but an officially published version. And if we're and if the concern here is what that means, it should be interpreted against the drafter. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. Even read charitably, Section 9 clearly does not empower wizards to compel others to use only a new version. Quite the opposite. It appears to empower the contributors to use either version if desired. Section 13 sets forth the sole condition of termination of the license, namely a failure to cure any breach of its terms within 30 days of notice of a breach thereto. Outside of what is given, Wizards has no authority to terminate the license, both with respect to prior published content and future published content under the license. Okay, let me look that up. Section 13. Section 13 is termination. This license will terminate automatically if you fail to comply with all terms herein and fail to cure such breach within 30 days of becoming aware of the breach. All sublicenses shall survive the termination of this license. And that's all it says. All right there. So it's saying that this is the sole condition of termination set forth in the license, a failure to cure a breach in the terms of the license. Outside of what is given, Wizards has no authority to terminate the license, both with respect to prior published content, content and future published content under the license. The above interpretations are supported by case law universally ac across U.S. courts, and I suspect more strongly in European courts. Further, which is the coast conduct over the past 23 years also supports this interpretation. Oh, this Q&A is coming back again. For, see, for example, the following taken from Wizards' website in the past through verifiable means. Can't Wizards of the Coast change the license in any way? Yes, it could. Under the license already defines. However, yes, it could. However, the license already defines what will happen to content that's been previously distributed under an earlier version in Section 9. As a result, even if Wizards of the Coast made a change, you disagreed with. You could continue to use an earlier acceptable version at your as your option. In other words, there's no reason for Wizards of the Coast to ever make a change that the community of people using the open gaming license would object to because the community would just ignore that change anyway. This appears to be an admission of the correct way to interpret Section 9. Further, it is a statement many have also reasonably relied upon to, the, to their detriment if Wizards has changed their position on Section 9, suggesting Wizards is it stopped from enforcing a contradictory claim. There is no. There is also now over 22 years of conduct on the part of wizards that even if the above interpretation are factually or are facially incorrect, appears to have been ratified, appears to have ratified the conduct of publishers at large using the language liberally. Further, applying the doctrine of interpreting, interpreting ambiguities against the drafter, I struggle to see how wizards could believe a more restrictive interpretation will survive the scrutiny in court. 
I also have to expect that subpoenaed records and or depositions of the relevant persons that were involved in drafting the 1.0 license, something which will inevitably occur if we or other parties are forced to litigate this matter, will, ex will support notions that the intended interpretations were in line with more liberal interpretations above, not the alleged inter new interpretations wizards may be trying to support. Perhaps this is all a misunderstanding. I am so uh, I am so skeptical of the legal soundness and reputation revocation of the 1.0a that I suspect it may indeed be a misunderstanding. And let's go to the next one. This is like the perfect thing for rules lawyers, right? <laughs> if you're a rules lawyer, this is exactly the kind of stuff you want to get into. Wait a minute, hold on. There are all kinds of uh, legal stuff going on here uh about my game let's let's read all these contracts and rules lawyers unite <laughs> uh let's see window page three let me zoom in and then put this up okay so misunderstanding that wizards intend something different, such as the treatment of the 1.1 license as a new iteration entirely, while keeping the 22 long year long tradition of using the 1.0a license intact. However, while wizards has been silent, aside from the December 21, 2022 announcement, this continued silence in face of speculation and apparent leaks alongside Wizards community to repudiate said leaks or issue more clear statements suggests Wizards does indeed intend to repudiate the 1.0a license or otherwise seek to breach its terms by trying to restrict its future use. My clients can only interpret this as intent by Wizards to unlawfully breach the license, an action that will inevitably lead to my clients and probably many of the tens of thousands of contributors globally who have used the license since 2002, including Paizo, Free League, and other... Oh, yeah, Free League's in there, too. Uh, we've been looking at a lot of Free League stuff. Free League's been crushing it lately. Here on the... We've been looking at their stuff on the streams. Uh, we, I got the Alien RPG over there to look at. Uh, Free League and other major competitors to litigate this matter across the country and indeed across the world. This letter constitutes a demand for a more definitive statement from Wizards regarding their apparent intention to breach the 1.0 gaming license or lack thereof. If no response is received directly by my office within the next 10 days, my client will be forced to prepare preparation for litigation to the fullest extent allowable by law, including contacting major and minor publishers to join in a potential claim against Wizards for anticipatory breach and other claims. That's another way to do it. I mean, this could be something that even if you know we talked about who alone has enough financial resources and incentive to do it, but um, you know, collect uh, getting together as a group could certainly be uh, the case as well. We hadn't talked about that specifically yet, uh, but that would be another way to do it. Even though the collective power of a whole bunch of smaller publishers might not be enough to go against Hasbro as far as finances go, but there might also be lawyers who are willing to do it. There, there are lawyers who are gamers, right? There's, some, there's also a possibility that some lawyers out there, like, I just want to do it. <laughs> I just want to, I just want to take this to, to the court. I am confident this is not in the interests of Hasbro or Wizards of the Coast, as the law seems entirely unambiguous in its favor of the above description, above, above described interpretation of the license, notwithstanding the effect such litigation will surely have on the Wizards of the Coast brand and public perception, perception here too, which we've also been talking about here. It is not my client's intention to become embroiled in a legal dispute over two decade, over two decade old license terms. Quite the contrary, it is their desire to continue publishing and, as they have done for years, collaborate with Wizards to expand the tabletop hobby for the benefit of all publishers and players alike. Where this remains possible depends on Wizards' response here too. To be entirely clear, if it is the intention of Wizards or Hasbro to repudiate the 1.0 license and bully publishers such, that, such as my clients into accepting less favorable terms under the 1.1 license, creators are not going to be bullied. The courts will ensure this at the end of the day. Should you have any questions, please contact me directly at all of that's redacted. Okay. So that's the other side. <laughs> uh, so let's see. So DM Toolbox says, so Foundry VTT is not making any statement until OGL 1.1 is released. The only statement they made was from Atropos, owner of Foundry. Uh, and this statement is, we've been actively monitoring this situation and we're going to be proactively working on a path forward that will cover our use case and allow us to support one D&D. &D. Uh, okay, well, that's interesting. 
Uh, we are not, however, in a position to do so already under the terms of today's post. This is there is work to do. I mean, I would expect that to be from everybody. I mean, something like, first of all, this is a leak. We don't know its credibility. We don't know that's going into to action. But publishers have got to be publishers of all times and creators of all kinds have got to be looking at different um, potential things that could happen. Because, I mean, you should always be looking at that. Like, okay, if this happens, like looking in advance, that way you're not responding, you know, in panic at a moment. Okay, if this turns out to be the case, what are we going to do? Now, if this turns out to be the case, what are we going to do? I mean, that only seems reasonable. And nobody probably, that takes a lot of time to think about. Thank you, DM Toolbox, for the info. Yes, thank you. DM's Toolbox says, yes, regarding building Persephone. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, building Persephone says, no one can say anything official until Wizards of the Coast makes an official announcement with the finalized terms of license. Right. We don't know. And DM's Toolbox agrees. Yes, hopefully it does go to court. It only takes one lost court case to say that what they are doing is not legal and saving the entire community. Hopefully so, Building Persephone says. Also, as Grimhild says, thank you for the statement. Brilliant Persephone says, lawyers lay out arguments. Uh, lawyers' letters lay out arguments, not legal decisions. Right, yes, it's an argument. That's the argument. We've seen several different arguments here. Right, exactly. That was not a legal decision by a court. That was the argument that those lawyers are making. Of course. DM's Toolbox says, this is what I mean about all those lawyers saying different things. So far, it's up in the air. Exactly, <laughs> right. Right. You can't just go to, oh, let me go to an IP lawyer who's a specialist in this. I mean, I guess, I mean, obviously, I mean, I guess you would you would expect that Wizards of the Coast, you know, has its own lawyers, and they're probably saying, yeah, it's exactly what we're supposed to be doing. Alfie Matrix, welcome. Hi, great to have you on the stream. Great to see you on the channel. Welcome. Coming in from the UK. Great. Great to have you here. Building Persephone says, think of it like a negotiation. You go in hot and try to come out of it with what you hope for in the first place. So I wouldn't necessarily take the letter exactly as written. Yes, got it. Uh, Guitar Guy Nick, I think Chaosium and Call of Cthulhu has the open GL from Wizards of the Coast too. Uh, well, one open Cthulhu, one, I've got both. I've got both versions of uh, that. There's the Call of Cthulhu that's written with the Call of Cthulhu rule system, but there was a Call of Cthulhu that I've got over here. Uh, this one right here is based on third edition, right? So there were both, right? I think we already came up with what we need as far as the license goes. But, uh, yeah, I guess I would expect this would. Anyway, not important. For certain values of authorized. Right, yeah, what exactly does that mean? Uh, DM's Toolbox says, I'm curious as to why Call of Cthulhu is unrelated, right? Oh, that's what I was just saying. So Call of Cthulhu, this one right here. See, this one has the D20 on it. So they're, two, they're different versions. Um, this right here, oh, that's the Keeper's rule book. Uh, the Call of Cthulhu Investigator's Handbook right here. I would expect this one does not because it is its own rule system. This would have nothing to do with the OGL, at least my understanding would be. We got to look at Call of Cthulhu more on the stream anyway. Uh, so that, but that uh, this version, yeah, this version right here would because they made it specifically with third edition rules. It's got the D20 system logo on it. It's got the Wizards of the Coast logo on it. Well, it actually, this one actually has the Wizards of the Coast logo on it. So this is this version of the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. And then back here, it's got uh, D20 system, Wizards of the Coast, and Chaosium on it. Maybe that's why it doesn't have the license in it, because it's a co-published. I mean, it's actually got the Wizards of the Coast logo on it. I don't actually see that in the back here. That's interesting. I don't actually see that license in the back of this particular Call of Cthulhu book, but I do see Wizards of the Coast official logo on it. So that's interesting. Probably not terribly relevant to the discussion as far as the OGL goes, but interesting nonetheless. Building Persephone says, I can see if things go badly for Wizards of the Coast, D&D Beyond no longer supporting 5e content. Oh, if, if things go badly, right, if they, they're no longer supporting 5e content. Yeah, I could see that, too. I could see that, too, because now D&D Beyond is owned by Wizards of the Coast. The authorization, uh, Bernard Pos uh, Posset, Bernard, uh, Bernhard, 
uh, Bernhard says the authorization is very likely to related. The authorization is very likely to be related to where it occurs in the text section nine, updating the license. They exclude one point A from the licenses that you can use. Okay, is that the the one point one? Grimhild says that would hurt. I own all the books on D&D Beyond and pay for a pro account to share to my group for my online campaign. I'm sure they'd offer an upgrade to one D&D content. I'm sure they would. Uh, if you didn't know, Wizards of the Coast owns D&D and bought them. Right. So if, if they're trying to push everybody over to... But then, see, but then again, we've got this issue with backward compatibility. Right? Uh, but But on the other hand... Maybe you don't have access to anything in the fifth edition, just rule books now, like core book now. It's all the uh, sixth edition, one D&D core rule book. Uh, yes, then, right. So that's why uh, they might do that, right? I can totally see D&D Beyond uh, Wizard of the Coast doing that. Bernhardt says, there are other and better systems floating around. If this is one issue for you, you need to get over the sunken cost fallacy. Well, but see, okay, we got two, di but it depends on who you're talking about here, because we were talking about the the impact on different groups of people. So if you're talking about a player, and we talked about this earlier, if you're talking about a player, like what kind of sunk costs do you have? Well, I mean, you might have the, the book investitures and things like that, but I mean, you can go over, I mean, you can keep playing it. You can play whatever you want. You can do homebrew stuff. You can go to another system. You can keep playing fifth edition. I mean, what type of impact does that have? Uh people with much greater sunk costs are potentially publishers. Uh, Building Persephone says, shout out for the sunken cost fallacy, hard truths being dropped here. And, but yeah, I mean, even if you're a publisher and you've, well, you know, I, I sunk um, thousands of dollars into preparing all of these books or having these books printed and stuff like that, because that's what I, but now it's time to move on. So who knows? Guitar Guy Nick says there's an actual channel called The Rules Lawyer who is a PF2 guy. He's actually a lawyer. I bet that he was the one, The Rules Lawyer, is the guy who was, oh, yeah, you're talking about, especially in relation to The Rules Lawyering. Uh, I, I have encountered The Rules Lawyer in the chat because when I was unboxing and uh, taking a look at Pathfinder 2nd uh, Edition for the first time, like two or three days ago, I was uh, opening up the Pathfinder second edition starter box. And in the chat was the rules lawyer. I need to subscribe to his channel. Let me make note of that. Subscribe to the rules lawyer channel. He uh, had some great insight uh, into uh, rules. It's always nice when you've got somebody when we're looking at a new system and then in the chat, um, there's somebody who already is familiar with it and can add context or point me in different directions, things like that. When we're looking at a new system. And he was definitely doing that for a uh, Pathfinder second edition. Uh, on that stream. And I really appreciate that. If you're thinking about getting into Pathfinder second edition, I do recommend you take a look at the morning grind live stream where we opened up that box. Then we was like, I believe that was like may have been Monday or something like that. Wasn't all that long ago. And he was in the chat. Grimhild says too much effort to rebuild everything in a different system to continue our current campaign, which is so far 600 hours and double that for me behind the scenes, building maps, tokens, uh, handouts, etc. Yeah. But that, you know, that, uh, people shouldn't worry about not playing their own game. Like, you know, some people will say, and I don't want to spend more money and that's fine. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, if you're playing with your existing stuff and all of your homebrew stuff, I mean, unless you're trying to make some type of really serious statement, I mean, keep playing, especially you're in the middle of a campaign, all that, keep playing that. Bernhard says, yeah, never change system mid campaign. Just go to something different after it, after your roof's up. Yeah, exactly. I agree. Or, you know, if, if you enjoy it or go to something new, try something new or, Keep playing it. Uh, yeah, it would basically have to kill or end the campaign in order to start. I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't try to go to a new rule system in the middle of a campaign either. Chaos and Karna. Anybody else got a last will and testament vibe? Hasbro as a full steam on uh, Hasbro is full steam on burying D D alive. How do those talking heads get their job? People like them keep finding IP and ruining the surviving business. Happens with a lot of IP lately, doesn't it? Building Persephone says, fortunately, I'm a player from a player DM perspective. The cost of this new system, uh, cost of this new system is a long tail. So not much if you don't get sucked into their new systems. It really sucks for creators who we should support. 
Ollie Wright. Welcome, Ollie. Welcome, Ollie. Good to see you here on the channel. Ollie Wright says, great letter. Makes the legal problems with Watsi's actions pretty clear. I would say that lays out the argument pretty clearly, too. I would say that, uh, too. Bernhard says, uh, regarding Grimhild, Paizo shares all the rules online already, so no need to repurchase the rules. Plus, no need to rebuy VTT content or character builder since they are free as well. 13th Age is gearing up for 2nd D, e, and they have an SRD as well. We should look at uh, uh, 13th Age as well on the Morning Grind one day. I don't know anything about that one. Trey says, while Wizards of the Coast coming after a single third-party developer will be easier, it sounds like this letter is closer to a notice of a class action lawsuit. Yeah, that's what that's what I thought. And, um, and we hadn't explicitly talked about something like a class action lawsuit or all of the publishers getting together, which, of course, social media and the Internet makes really easy. So I can see something like that happening. I could see uh, some lawyers deciding, hey, look, we just feel like winning this because we're gamers and we're going to take this all the way. Let's get together all the third party publishers. So even if one of the larger publishers that has potentially more cash to fund a legal challenge decides to take a deal separate with uh, Wizards of the Coast and, you know, whatever, make their deal. How about we just don't <laughs> and we take this all the way? That would be interesting. Grim Hild says, so I started the campaign almost three years ago on Roll20 in 2021. I converted to Foundry VTT and we played there. And then some kind of update to Foundry corrupted my campaign. Oh, no. Oh, my God, that sucks. And we went back to Roll20. Kilo Echo November says, I hate this is something we were having to talk about, but I'm glad I found your channel. I'm glad you found the channel, too. Ordinarily, we talk about just geek. We talk about geek related stuff in general. On the morning grind, we have been very um, role playing game heavy, but that doesn't necessarily mean we always are. I talk about a variety of stuff in the geek verse. And then, well, I've also like one night a week, I stream some video games, uh, some retro games. I've been trying that out tonight. Tonight, we're going to have dinner and a board game. I run the show Dinner and a Board Game, which is uh, when I have everybody over to my house. And uh, we cook dinner and then we play a board game. It's an actual play show. So there's a playlist. Check out Dinner and a Board Game. So we'll be watching a Dinner and a Board Game tonight and then probably painting miniatures live on stream tonight as well. In fact, I'm going to have to get ready for that <laughs> uh, pretty soon. So lots of stuff here on the channel. Please do. If you're here and you uh, like what you see, I do organize everything on the channel by playlist. So you can hit up the playlist on my channel and kind of find the topic you're interested in and go through it all related to the geek verse, but there's a lot of stuff on role-playing games and board games specifically right now. And I'm making action figures. Oh, I should show those. Also some stuff on making action figures. I'm making my own line of action figures. These are my rabbit knight prototypes. These are just prototypes here. These are my uh, custom hand-painted uh, prototypes for a line of action figures that I am trying to release. So we talk about action figures too. So working on those. I've got an articulated prototype from a manufacturer. So there's a lot going on here. So uh, I hate that this is something we're having to talk about. I do too. But I'm glad, you're found, I'm glad I found your channel. I subscribed and turned the bell on. So in the words of the former governor of California, I'll be back. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kilo. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Grim Hild says, I've been wanting to rebuild again in Foundry, but so much work for the first time and everything is working in Roll20. See, that's I worry about that. Roll20 plus D&D Beyond plus uh, Beyond20 plug-in. Uh, I worry about the, uh, the, the setup time. And we've talked about the amount of um, GM overhead in online gaming. I've talked about that elsewhere. Because, you know, at, at the table, hey, I got these markers. I got these paper. I can just... Uh, uh, you know, run this game. Sometimes players are expecting much more out of the virtual tabletop. Uh, yeah, automated backups. That's nice that you can do it, though. I didn't, uh... Frank B says, this shows the importance of physical media. Owning digital copies of books and movies means you don't really own them. More like renting. Yeah, that's just true. Or, you know, like if you've got a PDF, that won't be changed. But if you've got something like a, a book on... Um, well, through some other type of service that, yeah, that can be updated. Andrew Andrew says, are there big RPG influencers? I don't know the community. I know Hasbro works with big toy channels. Well, a critical role as one. Who are our big uh, YouTube uh, Dungeons and Dragons um, YouTubers and podcasters? Uh, the Dungeon Dudes, I say uh, 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 Matt Corville, 
he publishes stuff. He's got a, a big channel, and uh, that allows him to put out things like strongholds and followers. This was a massive campaign. Critical Role, the Dungeon Dudes, I would say. Um, who else? Who am I missing? Also, Grimhill Pathfinder 2 is like D&D plus extra rules, really. It's like 60% D&D. Benjamin Decker. Welcome, Benjamin. Welcome, Benjamin. He says, I really don't get it. What's the problem? Just play another game. Most are better than D&D. Finish your campaign. If it takes 10 years, just keep playing with the 5e rule set. I would say that is the... Um, I, I would say that is a, a good attitude for people who are playing. It will be different if you're a publisher. Zach says, as players, we can always make our thoughts about OGL known in their next player's test, uh, in their next play test as well. The more pushback, the better, in my opinion. Yeah, we can do that as well. Definitely. Um, but, you know, it, if you are a um, if you are a player, though, and you are uh, relying and, and like and enjoy third party, a third party publisher's material and they and you're expecting more from that publisher, this would affect you in that way. Pathfinder 1 and Pathfinder 2 in print. I do too. 48 thumbs up. Oh, let me record that. Thank you so much, uh, Trey. So we are now at 48 thumbs up. That is a record here for the morning grind. So if you are here, if you just found us, please do hit the thumbs up. That would that'd be awesome. Uh, Benjamin says, actually, pen and paper RPGs were more exciting before the OGL. Most people played many games. The OGL made that scene more monoculture. Loved Merp back in the day. I got Merp back here. That was my first RPG. I got a, uh, you've probably seen those. Benjamin, I think you've commented on it. Uh, Merp was my favorite, uh, my first RPG, rather. My first RPG was Merp Middle Earth Role Playing. Uh, and I have that hardback book over here. Just fun to be able to grab books. Ha! Merp. Yep. There's one. So that was how, that was actually got me started with fantasy role playing right there. That was, that was, that's how it all started. Not fantasy gaming in general, but fantasy role playing game. Hero Quest got me started, but uh, with fantasy tabletop gaming in general. But this got me started with role playing. Uh, and actually, Benjamin, that's actually, we were talking about that, that that was a potential negative to the OGL people were talking about back in the day. There were positives and negatives. So the positive is that was apparently TSR was very litigious and going after people. And so the OGR, o OGL let people breathe a sigh of relief that, hey, we're not going to take a combative attitude to other people who are in the community and working on stuff. But I do remember what you're talking about right here is that the counter to that counter argument that people worried about was now, wait a minute, this is going to kill off other systems because other people will want to go and create stuff for Dungeons and Dragons and other people will be looking for that. So we did talk about that. That was uh, both uh, that was both sides of that coin. So there's undoubtedly been a flowering and explosion of D&D related content. But on the other hand, and, but people feared that was a way to kneecap and get rid of people from using other systems. In today's world, it seems we have just this absolute explosion of systems that we talk about here on the channel all the time. Elizaris, welcome, welcome, welcome. Elizaris says, been doom scrolling on Reddit. Oh, doom scrolling, always no good. <laughs> been doom scrolling, uh, uh, been doom scrolling Reddit and all the news on this topic. Happy to find a casual chat to keep it light and entertaining. Oh, well, good, excellent. Uh, I am, I'm glad. I hope that I bring that because I don't like on this channel to be. Um, needlessly critical or down or, or whatever. So uh, casual chat on this topic, uh, you know, we can be critical. I like being positive, so we can be critical, but I, I like this channel to have a positive uh, kind of vibe because there is so much negativity out there. Even if we get, if we're dealing with the subject, I really appreciate your comment here because even if we're dealing with a subject that we potentially don't like, like this one right here uh, and its impact on publishers and things like that, uh, I still want this to be a, a positive place. Bob World Builder. Oh, yeah. Bob World Builder. Bob World Builder is a big D&D channel. Uh, Grimhild. Oh, yeah. I've been DMing in person since 1981 and still running an eight-year uh, in-person 3.5 game. DMing custom stuff on VTTs is way more work. Yeah. Uh, when I'm thinking about online first kinds of stuff for something like... Um, fate, the Fated Edge RPG that we're kind of putting together here on this channel, when I'm thinking about online play first... I'm thinking about how do you play, because it, it's easier to get people together online, but how do you work uh, easily with things like um, just what's available in Zoom, a digital whiteboard, because you're not having to put together all this, this stuff. Keith. Hey, Keith. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Keith says, uh, I'm not sure if this was mentioned already late to the show, but I'm wondering if D&D &D Beyond was a reaction to possibly 
D&D uh, &D Beyond was a reaction to possible slumping sales during the pandemic due to people not being able to play in person. Uh, it could be. It could be. Are you talking about the reaction being to purchase D&D Beyond? Uh, it could have been. I know there was a, I mean, there was a lot of, I mean, the pandemic changed so much, but tabletop RPGs as well. Uh, so that could have been what got them. Th they they might have been thinking about it before that. And actually, one of the theories is they were thinking about that in terms of D and D Beyond is potentially a um, a potential competitor, a Paizo like competitor to being able to create their own system. Paul Lofty, welcome, Paul. Good to see you, Paul. Welcome, being welcome. Paul says coming in late, but the royalties are for your revenue of products that contain the OGL. You could split your products, so a $40 book with a $1 OGL companion add-on. Well, you could do that. You could do that. Uh, and actually, I've been thinking on this uh, channel, and we've been talking about that, a lot more about uh, game worlds that um, are usable in more than one system, and which is something that I don't have. Trey was talking about, Trey in the chat, Trey G, was talking about systems that have more, or game worlds and IPs that have more than one system. But, you know, I was looking at my shelf back here, which is you know, not comprehensive, but is extensive. And I don't see as many things um, here that have multiple systems in them or support for multiple systems. But I'm kind of thinking I like that. You know, so you could do your world book and then here's just, if you want the OGL stuff, if you want to be able to use that material, it's an add-on for one dollar. <laughs> right, yeah, it seems like you could do that. And then support more systems for any different IP. Because I don't understand why one IP has to be tied or one world has to be tied to a certain rule set. Um, I do like it when rule sets support the way that you're supposed to experience the world. Or, or let me revise. I like the, I like rule sets that support the way that you uh, should be or could could experience the world. I like that. But you know, it occurred to me that in different worlds, in different fantasy worlds, different people are going to see different things in it, and are going to want to experience different experience in different ways. Like if I if we were all writing about how, like, what's the experience that needs to be in middle earth, we might all identify different things, different experiences that we want, right? Oh, well, I really like this about middle earth. When I'm thinking about being in middle earth and experiencing it, it would be, you know, these kinds of things I'd focus on. Somebody else might go read the exact same source material and go, Oh, well, gee, in order to experience it, I would focus on these different things and different rule systems may cater to both of those. Not, neither one of those interpretations of what's most, the feel of the system, a feel of the world is, is right or wrong. So why not have multiple rule systems that support multiple worlds? Keith Crow says, possibly Watsi's desire to get in on the virtual tools that groups used at the time. And that's a, is an easy way to just purchase that. Um, the purchase of D&D Beyond is an easy way to all of a sudden get into that and gain access to that. Grimhild says, uh, or Bernhard on in response to Grimhild says, but on the other hand, you can now actually GM 3.5. Oh, big jump up to 53, 53. Thank you for keeping track of this, Mike. 53 thumbs up. Thank you all. And 37 currently watching via YouTube. I think most of our viewers do come in uh, via YouTube. We did earlier on the stream actually hit 50 concurrent viewers across all um, channels this is going out on. Building Persephone says, D&D Beyond was independent before being brought by Wizards of the Coast. Right. I think it was uh, actually developed by people who were up in uh, Huntsville. I think I, I want to say that people are saying you should go up and because I'm I'm here in I'm here in very rural Alabama, but uh, that I should go up and see or get to know the people who created that they were up in Huntsville. I think that was the case. So D and D Beyond was independent before being brought being bought by Wizards of the Coast. If anything, it was a response to more webcam remote play and digital tool sets for tracking at table games. Uh, right? Yeah. 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 So the construction of D&D &D Beyond wasn't a response to the, pan the pandemic. That would existed before. Because we were using, yeah, we were using D&D &D Beyond before the pandemic. But the purchase of it could have at least been in part motivated by that. Stray says, what an epic stream. It is, it is. I'm wondering now if I'm going for the, not only the record for the morning grind, which we have long surpassed, but also the longest live stream that I've done, which was not my intention when I started this. But how, the, how long was that after party? Once we were watching The Cultist, the Cultist, by the way, you can also check out on the stream, on this channel. The Cultist is the um, uh, live show. It's not live. It's a scripted show. It's our comedy web show about uh, Lovecraftian cultists who just want to worship Cthulhu in a world full of people who don't understand. And they actually play Dungeons and Dragons 
in uh, the cultists. So if you check out this channel, my uh, the live web show, not the live, the comedy web show that we've been doing is called The Cultists. And so one of the after parties with the cast and crew of The Cultists went to four hours and something. I don't remember what it was. So Mike Hansford says, amen. Oh, I don't know what Building Persephone uh, said. I haven't got that here, but thank you. Frank B says, Watsi has been actively trying to kill off other systems since the 90s. See, that's that's that was the argument against the um, the OGL. That is this an attempt to kill other systems? Not not at that time, not at that time other publishers, because other publishers uh, would be making D&D stuff, D&D &D compatible stuff, and that would kill other systems. And I remember the concern about becoming monolithic with systems. Now, I don't think that's happened because we've got, um, like, how are they going to kill off other systems? I mean, we just, they're gobs of them now. They're everywhere. <laughs> we got we got more systems than we can ever play. Grim Hill says, Roll20 and Beyond D&D made Hasbro, made, excuse me, Wizards of the Coast, so much more money during the pandemic. So much money during the pandemic. I think Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro think that level of revenue and growth is sustainable. I think Wizards of the Coast is wrong. Well, that's interesting. Uh, I don't remember when WotC bought D&D Beyond. Did they buy it during the pandemic or before the pandemic or after the pandemic? But if they owned it during it, then yeah, I can see them going, oh my God, this is the future. Like somebody, as far as the, somebody there was uh, thinking in leadership. Yeah, oh my God, this is the future. This is the future. But if you're looking just at the pandemic, yeah, the pandemic itself is not representative. Yep, support hashtag open RPG. Frank B says, system agnostic settings are pretty cool. I like the idea of keeping rule books and world books separate. Uh, I do too in general. I, maybe we publish things in both ways, but actually this is, this is a really small pet peeve of mine, but it is kind of one. This is way down on my list of concerns, but it is one of my concerns. And that has to do with table aesthetics. And that's a disadvantage. It's like low, low on the list. I'm not saying this is a major concern. But if I want to play, for instance, in Middle Earth, and I spent a lot of time uh, uh, years ago putting together a Middle Earth world book for GURPS, GURPS 5th edition. And maybe one day I get that material back out and we see what we can do with it. Although I think it was probably on a computer. I mean, it was a computer from decades ago, so I might not have access to it all. But I spent a lot of time making a Middle Earth uh, adaption for GURPS. I prefer, however, if we're playing in Middle Earth, all of a sudden I've got this generic rule book on the table, which kind of breaks the aesthetic of the table. I do prefer having something like and this is Decipher's, like this was the first, uh, no, this is not the first Middle Earth game I had because that's Merp, obviously. But I remember when this one came out from Decipher right here, one of the reasons that I did like it is because it uses so many uh, stills and imagery from the Fellowship of the Ring. And so you are actually in the Middle Earth aesthetic with your book at the table. And when you're referencing your book, you don't have to look at something that's got like space aliens and robots in it like you do with GURPS or FATE or something like that when it's at your table. Like I said, that's down low on the list of things. But to me, it is, is, is a thing. So if I were going to create a setting book and I knew that I wanted this particular rule book, I think I would be inclined to make sure that it had everything in it that you needed to reference so you wouldn't have to reference the generic book and break that aesthetic. It's a minor thing. It's a minor thing. But um, that's why I think when we were doing Journey to the Tree of Sorrows that I was writing, the idea was, well, let's take some stuff from the SRD and let's put put that, if we we're referencing some material rather than sending you back to another book, let's just go ahead and use the SRD since we can. Let's go ahead and put that rules inside what's going to be a very you know artistic and very art heavy book that gives you the feel of the world. Let's go ahead and put that in that book. That way you can stay in your, your book aesthetic. System rules should support setting lore and uh, versimilitude. Ver I know this word, versimilitude. Verisimilitude. There we go. Verisimilitude. Uh, I agree. I agree. Uh, I completely agree, actually. So con connecting, uh, for me personally, when I'm in control of everything, connecting the system and the rules to the lore and, and what it's trying to say is very important. But with that caveat that I was saying, that other people may interpret 
system or settings that people may interpret settings differently and be expecting different things out of settings. Um, and so there may be, so there's not one viable setting, not, not one be all end all rule system for each setting. Drohinix, Drohinix, welcome, welcome. Good to see you on the channel and on the stream. And he says, so is this the death of D&D &D and the return of Pathfinder? Well, I don't know. Of course, that thing has been officially published yet. The, the license is not out um, officially yet. So who knows? If something is changing on Twitter or something like that, let us know if Wizards of the Coast put something out while we're live here. So is this the death of D&D &D and the return of Pathfinder? I don't know. But there are a lot more options now. There's a lot more action. There's a lot more options. Uh, Rhino says you usually have only one IP in a rule set because of licenses of the IP is usually exclusive. Probably so. Uh, well, right, 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 right. Yeah. You're, you're, you're saying that, um, the license of the IP itself is usually exclusive to a publisher. Right. And then the publisher may have its game system that it likes to develop for. So typically you're right. You don't have multiple publishers with the same rights to the IP. If you had that situation, then you would have multiple books, and each publisher would put out their put out put out that IP using their in-house system or their other system, right, or some other system, right. Um, and it's a lot of trouble to lay out books and things like that. So even if you are the the publisher, the RPG publisher with the exclusive right to an IP, and you've got your rule system that you are most familiar with. Um, and laying out a book and whole design of a book is a lot of work. It makes sense that um, you just do that once. David62 says, uh, Thieves World, back in the day, spirited, spirited? No, oh, supported. Supported multiple game systems. I don't know that one. Thieves World? Supported multiple systems? I feel like... I didn't think I was a person who needed to hit certain or felt like I needed to hit certain marks in the live stream, but I want to keep going for a little while because this has been the, the live stream with the most thumbs up and the most concurrent watchers ever. And so I might as well make it the longest live stream that's gone on. If we make it, then I'll do a shot of tequila. I tell you what, if we do that. I don't know how long the other live stream was, but if I make it to five hours, that's as long as I can go. But if I make it to five hours, I'll do a shot of tequila. Uh, So Bernhard, regard, right, this is not published, right, regarding the official publication of this. Drohix, most likely not, unless they pu push through with this, which I doubt. I I'll be interested to see what happens. But I would like, if, if they're shocked by this, or they're expecting to play the hero, like we talked about earlier, you would think they would have already said something. Uh, Drohix, Pathfinder uses the OGL, so they're uh, hooped too. Uh, Drohix says... Uh, Bernhard, don't get me wrong. I've never stopped using Pathfinder, but 5, 5e was better for new players. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've introduced people to 5e, you know, uh, but there, what's what the best system is to introduce people to? Like, I introduced my uh, nephew to role-playing with 5e, but he wanted to play Dungeons and Dragons. He specifically wanted to play Dungeons and Dragons. And so there's that element, too. You know, do we want to role-play, or do you specifically want to play Dungeons and Dragons? Sometimes you do. I mean, there might, there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes you specifically want to play Dungeons and Dragons. He specifically wanted to experience Dungeons and Dragons. Grimhild says, love the cultists. Oh, excellent. You've seen the cultists. Excellent. Love the cultists. Still catching up on it. By the way, I am also a big fan of, a uh, big Call of Cthulhu fan. I have almost everything published for Cthul Call of Cthulhu up until 2012. I need more Call of Cthulhu stuff. And I, I don't, uh, and I, I'm not familiar as familiar with it as it should be. Oh, but the Call of Cthulhu starter set is sitting over there in the to be unboxed and analyzed uh, stack for the morning grind. So that's in the immediate stack over there to look at the Call of Cthulhu. And I'm glad somebody here has watched the cultists uh, who is coming in new. So yes, that's this. I uh, co-wrote, uh, created and produced the cultist in the se season two. I played a cultist of Nyarlathotep called Steve, who is homeless in the park. So definitely, please do check out um, check out the cultists. So no, Grimhild says uh, Wizard of the Coast bought it last summer. Okay, so it was kind of after pandemic. Uh, so so kind of after pandemic numbers, they may have been looking at the numbers and going, okay, that's what we got to get then. Rhino Watcher says, if you are using D&D &D to make a video, that means you might get a call from a lawyer to report income if you say D&D &D 
or specific spell names on the cultists. We will see. We will see. Uh, Jose says they brought, they bought network, but what you're saying here, like, sir, you know, you can still certainly review, like, there's no you do reviews of books and things like that. Cause you like using D you know, using D and D to make a video. What exactly does that mean? Using D and D to make a video. Uh, but certainly you can still do it on uh, like in the context of reviewing books and things like that and reviewing D and D. I mean, that's, you know, reviewing stuff, but on the other hand, um, I can see people deciding to stream other things than D and I want to do uh you know, I've got dinner and a board game, which is board games and uh, having lunch, having dinner. But I also do want to develop just an RPG stream where we play RPGs. Um, but we'll probably play other things, <laughs> probably play other things. I never thought about it being specifically Dungeons and Dragons focused anyway, because we talk about so many different systems here on this channel anyway. Maybe another great way to get words about different systems out. Jose says they bought uh, in April of 2022. So it may have been a reaction to the numbers of uh, the the pandemic. Grimhild says, but Wizards of the Coast got royalty percentage of the sales of their products on D&D Beyond and Roll20. Yeah, right, exactly. That's what I'm saying. So it may be a reaction to that. Well, look at what's been happening over here. We got to buy that. But not the subscription fees. Wizards of the Coast wants a bigger piece of the pie, so they bought D&D Beyond and are making their own VTT. Yeah, so they were seeing all that revenue coming in and going, gee, how much more could we have if we actually owned this and this was ourselves based on pandemic numbers? Seems to make sense. Andrew Andrew says, to help your pet peeve, they can make a line of book covers that come, uh, they can make a line of book covers that come with world books. That way you can put a specific cover on to match your game. Excellent idea, excellent idea. So at least for the, the, the cover here, if you're playing uh, Middle Earth, we should just have a book cover that can go on the, the uh, GURPS box or book or the Fate book or something like that or the Savage World book. And that way the book, at least when closed, does not disrupt table aesthetics. David62, I had that lore book. You're talking about the Decipher book? I think I was the very first person. In fact, no, I know. I was the very first person to ever review this book on Amazon. I got this book. I tore into it. I was so happy about it. This was when I was the Lord of the Rings mania because of the release of the books, uh, the films, the Peter Jackson trilogy was at its height. And I was so enthusiastic. I mean, I, I have loved Lord of the Rings ever since I was a kid. We have a tradition in my family that uh, before you were old enough to read The Hobbit, you have The Hobbit read to you. So you can still understand, you know, when you're old enough to understand The Hobbit, but you're not quite old enough to read it yet, you get The Hobbit read to you. And I've been continuing that tradition with my nephews. Uh, but so I've been a huge Lord of the Rings fan forever, like all my life. But of course, this was right in the mania because the movies were being released and this came out and I was the first person to ever review this on uh, Amazon. And I spent a lot of time uh, back in the day on the Decipher forums about this RPG. Sarah, Sarah, Sarah. Uh, nah, Pathfinder will be sued to annihilation. I hope not. Frank B says, I wonder how many systems have been used for Conan. I know it's been a lot. Uh, yeah, now that's right. Through time, you can end up with a whole bunch of different systems for an IP. Um, and in fact, I was just seeing, uh, we went over the Conan 2D20 system by, uh, how do you pronounce that? Modifius? I believe Modifius publishing on the morning grind like three or four, well, maybe last week we were looking at Conan, but they were telling me that they just were, people in the stream were saying that they were about to lose the license to Conan. So there probably have been a lot of different Conan uh, systems, interpretations of Conan in different systems. And um, Modifius's 2D20 system was the latest one. But then I saw on Twitter where they tweeted out that uh, December 31st of last year was the last day that they would be publishing and had the license to Conan. So now it's going someplace else. Conan, the, the history of the Conan uh, IP, especially recent history of the Conan IP is an interesting one. So I don't know what happens to it now as far as our tabletop games goes, but, it, but Modifius has lost that license. So now it will go to somebody else. And... Um, I guess it'll be developed for a new system. So we'll try to see. I don't know what's happening to it. Andrew Andrew says, very good choice of tequila. Actually, I got this for Christmas. So this is a good choice. I thought this was a good tequila because I did get this for Christmas. So Christmas gift. Uh, I am. 
Grimhild says, super sticker. Oh, thank you so much for sending a super sticker. Thank you so much. $5 super sticker from Gim Grimhild. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that uh, uh, very much. Mike Hansford says, oh, 55 thumbs up. Let me put that down here. 55 thumbs up. That is a the, the record for, we are blowing past the record. So we've set a new record here for the morning grind thumbs up. Troy Williams. Welcome, Troy. Troy says, this is not the end of D&D, just the start of something. It's the, well, the end of everything is the start of something. I don't even think it's the, necessarily the end of D&D. &D. We'll see what happens. And I said, nothing official has been published yet. We will see. They bought D&D &D in April, but it took six months to, but yes, but even the end of one thing is the start of something else. Building Persephone says they bought D&D &D in April, but it took six months to negotiate the sale. Yeah, those things are not easy. I can believe that. Um, I love the Decipher L-O-T. Uh, I love the Decipher L-O-T-E-R. Uh, I, Inner Light says, I need to get another hard copy. I sold mine like an idiot. You know, I, I had the great purge of RPGs when I decided, hey, I'm never going to be gaming again many, many years ago when I sold a bunch of stuff. This book survived that. It wasn't, it was one of the few that did. I've been having to rebuild my collection because like an idiot, I was like, well, I guess I'm a, well, I'm a college professor now. I'm graduated school. I'm a college professor now. I guess I won't ever do any more gaming. So ended up selling a bunch of gaming stuff. I wish that I had not. One of the things that I sold that I wish I did not is I had a hard copy of GURP Space. And I rebought the soft copy, but I really need a hard copy of GURP Space. We're going to get into GURP Space on one of the morning grind. If you have never ever gotten into this book, this book, you could like learn, learn, uh, aer uh, not aerodynamics, but uh, aer spacecraft dynamics from GURPS Space. Uh, this, this book, if you're looking for a crunchy system, it's this one right here. And I wish I still had my hard copy. I've got to find one. I got the softback copy now. I'm going to have to find that. Fair use is free speech. So a review of D&D is fair use. The cultists might get into trouble because you are making a story using uh, Watsi's IP and trademarks. Your tagline for season two was D&D &D playing cultist. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, could be. We will see. Uh, Benjamin says, same tradition in my house. Yes. So regarding The Hobbit uh, being uh, read, I love that tradition. That is a fantastic tradition. Oh, and Andrew Andrew says, I had The Hobbit read to me as a child as well. So lots of people have this happen. I think that's a great tradition. I think that's a fantastic tradition for getting new people into uh, uh, getting new people into fantasy. I mean, it was highly influential on me. Decipher also made the LOTR CCG, which I did not have, the customizable card game. I did not have the uh, customizable card game, right? Uh, I wasn't into card games at the time. Like I said, I never got into Magic the Gathering. I uh, never got into Magic the Gathering, and so I wasn't really into card games in general. But that I think it was hypothesized at the time there wasn't a whole lot of development that went on for this system, right? wasn't a whole lot of development. There were a few books released, but there weren't very many. And there were other books that were still in development that were never released. And a lot of people seem to hypothesize at the time that really that the license for the customizable card game and the role-playing game were kind of packaged and customizable card games were huge at the time. And um, the Decipher may have wanted, really wanted the, the card game rights is really what they were after. But then it kind of came with the, the RPG rights so this was always kind of an afterthought. I don't know that that's true. That's just what it was hypothesized at the time, especially on the um, uh, on the boards. That why aren't we getting more support here? Well, it's because maybe all the attention was on the card game because that's were huge at the time. Uh, Tom E asks, uh, "Is that LOTR book from the same producer as Dark Heresy? The cover style seems similar." Well, I don't know. I don't know Dark Her Heresy. Somebody else in the comments might know but this was published by decipher which i hadn't heard from decipher and i haven't heard the name a lot oh mike says uh mike sends a five dollar super sticker thank you so much mike thank you very much for your generosity i really appreciate it thank you it's always good to have you in the chat uh rhino watcher says the new ogl might signal that they will start cracking down on monetized streaming shows songs and parodies with dnd &D ip could be it could be that Cracking down on live play D and D streams. I we'll have to see how that goes. We'll have to see. 
Retro Nerd Girl is here. Welcome, Retro Nerd Girl. Retro Nerd Girl says, I can't wait for GURPS space. Uh, we've always, so we'll, we'll go through that. It'll be, it'll be fun. It's, it's so crunchy. We always wanted somebody to run GURPS space with all the rules in place about, you know, how your spacecraft operates and how you build out your spacecraft and how you accelerate. And if you can figure out if you've got enough fuel to get off a planet with a particular gravity and, and all of that. And uh, the DM who really, or GM who really knows that system and, and the players are like, well, I tell you what, let's do X or Y. And the game master's like, whoa, you're doing what? Hang on, wait a minute. Don't you know what that's going to do to the, the structural integrity of the whole of your spacecraft? Hold on, let's get out the quadratic equations and see exactly what happens to you. That would be fun. Probably too much for a narrative style game. But hey, everybody also make sure you check out Retro Nerd Girl's channel. Retro Nerd Girl uh, does uh, reviews of movies and TV shows and stuff in the popular culture, but also retro stuff. So definitely check out retro movies and TV and things like that. So please do check out and subscribe to her channel. Uh, she does great work too. Building Persephone says, gotta go, Heath, but love that you unlocked a new achievement. Enjoy your tequila. Well-deserved. New sub. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm, I am running out of steam, but I got to go for 10 more minutes. That'll be five hours, and then we'll do a shot of tequila. Uh, thank you so much for being here, uh, Building Persephone. I really appreciate all of the uh, commentary that you put in the comments and extending the conversation. I mean, everybody here, the comments here have been, been fantastic. That's what that's what gives me energy and drives me on. The the conversation and the dialogue here, uh, that's why I've, why I've been, ke been keeping going, because the conversation has been so great. So I really appreciate everybody who's being here. Access Your Inner Light says, The Hobbit was read to me as a child, too, but The Lord of the Rings I couldn't get until I read it myself. Yeah, uh, that's we read that ourselves too. Uh, I don't remember. I, I don't think we've ever tried to read The Lord of the Rings to people or to children. Uh, so it's kind of one of those things where when you're old enough to understand it, you get The Hobbit read to you. And then a little while later, you read The Hobbit yourself. And then a little while later, you get into The Lord of the Rings. Uh, Grimhild says, Rhino, do you think that the pantomimes phrase in OG 1.1 will be used against live streams D&D &D games? Well, that's interesting. Uh, we're, we, we, are, we were still wondering. We never actually came up with a definitive reason why um, pantomimes were specifically called out. Uh, but I wonder, but you're right. It could have something to do with, uh, with live streams. It could. Benjamin Decker says there were some really nice map sets for Decipher's LOTR game. Just found them at my parents' house over the holidays. Haha. -ha. Yes, there were. And let me tell you, that's one of the things that I wish I had been able to purchase. I, for some reason, I didn't get them. I don't think I had enough money at the time. I was in college at the time. So I remember seeing the map sets because the map sets were actually based on the maps for the, for the films, right? Those were really nice. And they even sold a collector's edition of them that were not folded. The standard edition did come folded in a box. And then there was a collector's edition that came rolled. So you didn't have the creases. And I saw that and um, I was like, oh my God, I would really like to have those. But they were uh, more than I could pay at the time. So as far as great RPG non-purchases non that I regret, that was one of them. That's definitely one of them. Access your inner light says, no, Dark Heresy was Games Workshop. Okay, so now we've got clarification on that. Rhino Watcher says, from an IP law standpoint, you are violating copyright if you read a book and record it to sell. So monetized live streams could fall in that category, as well as mentioned in reference, as well as we mentioned in reference to Critical Role before. If you yeah, if you record a book and you know, if you read a book and record it to sell, right? Okay, if you're, if you're creating an audio book, but can stop somebody stop you from playing a game online? Now you might end up reading off like a spell description, but is that enough? Can you stop somebody from playing your game online publicly? You know, if you're doing like a, a Zoom call. And you're just privately playing across Zoom and you're playing Dungeons and Dragons. Okay, that's one thing. But if you are publicly streaming a game of any kind, can somebody stop you? What about video games? Like video game publishers don't come after video game streamers, right? You can just stream your video game, right? Uh, so if you decide, hey, I'm going to play whatever game, whatever board game, whatever tabletop game, and I'm going to stream it. it. Seems like the 
incarnation of playing the game is different from like what yeah what you're bringing up here Andrew Andrew says I wonder if that's why I prefer the Hobbit to Lord of the Rings because I was read it was read to me first before I read it also I didn't have uh, LOTR read to me that would have taken some time yeah it would take a lot more that's probably why it doesn't happen quite as often it would take a lot more uh, dedication to get through the Lord of the Rings than it would be the Hobbit so Rhino Watcher says yes the pantomime phrasing was what I was thinking of for live streams and shows like the cultists that use D&D or playing D&D in the plot. Well, what about fair use? Well, we were thinking, well, we've been talking about that. Uh, fair use is talking about a thing, not replicating a work or using another's entity's trademark. That's not fair use. Um, I thought Dark Heresy was Fantasy Flights. So we have another, we have, I don't know. I don't know Dark Heresy, so I can't go to uh, so Nintendo goes after it? Really? Nintendo goes after live streaming uh, video games? I did not know that. Uh, if you live stream a Nintendo game, Nintendo comes after you? That, that's interesting. I mean, it, it seems like video game streaming is a huge thing, right? I mean, obviously. GM Hill says, if you're publicly streaming D&D live play, then under their OGL 1.1, WotC may own your content. Somebody's going to, we, I, I, we, we need multiple opinions on this. It's, it's Dark Heresy 2nd Edition is Fantasy Flight Games. <laughs> Keith Crow says, I think we need to do a Children of Huron discussion, going back to a few previous weeks' discussion. Yes, uh, we do need to do Children of Huron discussion. So Brianna and I have been studying, um, I remember this came up, and I need to read this again. So Brianna and I, if you don't know, Brianna De Silva is the director of The Cultist, and she's also the co-writer. And so on the after parties, we do discussion of at the cultist after parties. We do discussion of not only the show, but other topics. And she and I are both very interested in writing story arcs about corruption. When a hero is corrupted or also corruption or the fall, the, the arc of the fall. Now, actually, we've distinguished between corruption and the fall. Uh, so we were studying different corruption arcs. And there is a YouTube video uh, about uh, that I've got on the channel it's uh, Anakin Skywalker's corruption arc or arc of the fall doesn't make sense. It's something like that. It's about Anakin Skywalker. If you go to my channel, you can search and find it. Uh, and I was talking with Brianna specifically about uh, that. We studied that arc, Anakin's arc, as far as corruption. And Brianna had a lot to say about it. And I believe it was Keith. I believe it was you who brought up the children of Huron has another arc in it that we should study. Uh, that's another kind of a show idea that I've got where we discuss story ideas. I think it would be ideal to do that with Brianna because Brianna and I meet at least once a week to discuss stories and what we're writing and, and uh, film beat sheets and things like that. So I think eventually being able to do that live together sometimes would be good and Children of Huron should be on that. But that does mean coordinating with her and doing something else, so we would say. So we will see. But I would like to be able to talk more about stories, uh, particularly if we got a discussion and dialogue going on. And Brianna is fantastic about that. Uh, Dragon RSF says music focused, uh, part of the OGL. Uh, Andrew Andrew says lots of Twitch channels stream Nintendo games. The new Pokemon has many big streamers. Yeah, yeah so yeah, surely, um, yeah, I'll have to know more about that. Okay, maybe Watsy won't own, won't own you. <laughs> Troy Williams says, I have Lord of the Rings role playing. Uh, the one you showed, I love it. It's awesome as hell. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, they. It seems like even though this may not have been, you know, had a whole lot of attention from Decipher as far as continuing on its line, uh, putting out other um, things for it. Fell Beast and Wondrous Magic came out. I mean, there were not very many. This this was not a long lived line. So even though Decipher may not have had a lot of attention put to the line, the people who wrote it, I think, put a lot of care into this. I think they put a lot of care into this. So that's why this is a good one. So we've got um, Merp. Yeah, and then Merp went away. That was by Iron Crown Enterprises. Then we had Decipher's RPG here. Um, then um, the One Ring. And I was not I was not into the One Ring at all when it was owned by, who was its previous publisher, the first edition. So the One Ring came out. And then they did a fifth edition version of One Ring as well. So you got the you, so there's there is a there is a world supported by two systems at that time. At that time, who was the publisher of the One Ring, the One Ring first One Ring first edition? Uh, I forget, but they had both a One Ring system version 
and then also a 5e version. And I was a bit skeptical of 5e's ability to uh, do Middle Earth. But I did read it, and I never got to play it, so I don't have firsthand experience. But it does seem like they, they created all custom classes for Middle Earth with, uh, with, for 5e. And so actually, it they may have worked better than I think. And hey, there are probably a lot of people who say, well, I don't want to learn a new system but that who would like to play in Middle Earth and picked up the 5e system. So it probably worked. So there is an example. That publisher, Cubicle 7, thank you. Splinkrent, thank you. Cubicle 7 was running that. And I have no idea why they lost that. I remember at the time when Cubicle 7 had lost the Lord of the Rings license, uh, people were wondering why. And I thought that it was possibly because they were going to give it to Wizards of the Coast because Amazon's uh, Rings of Power series was coming out. So they were probably reshuffling all the licenses. And I thought that Wizards of the Coast was about to get it. But then Free League got it. And Free League has brought out uh, the One Ring RPG second edition, which I was completely, I was surprised that happened. And I've covered the One Ring RPG on this channel. I haven't gotten to play it yet, but we went through the starter box here. And I, this is, so this is the first time I've gotten into the One Ring. And I did like, uh, I did like what I had been seeing. Uh, I would like an opportunity to play it. So all the different iterations of Middle Earth role, uh, Wargaming. Uh, oh, okay. So uh, uh, Grimhild says, okay, maybe uh, Watsi won't own you. Maybe Watsi will just have an irre irrevocable license to use it without permission, just like other stuff they show. They also might be able to shut it down and live play that violates their morality codes. Well, now that's an interesting aspect of that too. Uh, what if you're playing something in your game that they don't like? Troy says, oh hell, uh, I have the Stargate as one and more. I've never, I don't have the Stargate RPG. Benjamin Decker says, I read LOTR to my eight-year-old daughter. Oh, so you took the commitment. Nice, nice, nice. It was quite a challenge, but she really loved it. The best and worst was the singing all the songs. That is, that can be the best, but also frequently the worst part when you're trying to have to sing the songs. If you're reading it out loud and then you get to the singing and you're like, well, now I've got to sing. And, you know, that's one of the things that people we've hit five hours. So uh, we'll do a shot of tequila here in just a moment. But that's one of the things that people are surprised about. If they only know the movies, all of the singing in uh, Lord of the Rings that they like, <laughs> you know, uh, someone who has just seen the movies and then somebody will be talking about the books and there's like, yeah, I, I did all this, but then I, I couldn't get over all the singing. And I've had people like who just know the movies who are like the singing. And they're like, yeah, in the books, they sing all the time. Whenever they're going someplace, they're singing. And then it makes it sound like Lord of the Rings is like a musical or something. And it's not quite that, but yes, the amount of singing there is in the books is, is substantial. Wizards of the Coast did make a Lord of the Rings version of Magic the Gathering. It's kind of controversial since they changed the skin color of Aragorn. Oh, I remember you saying that, or some I believe it was you, Interlight, saying there is going to be a Magic the Gathering Lord of the Rings. Is that already out? I've completely missed that. Like I said, I'm not following Magic the Gathering anyway, really. Uh, so they did get something. Maybe that had to do with it. Maybe, well, this is a theory, speculation, that if it were the case that the card game rights and the tabletop RPG rights were kind of bundled. Maybe Cubicle 7 had them both. And so they had to pull that back. And then in order to license out maybe the card game stuff to uh, Wizards of the Coast, if they are doing Lord of the Rings, Magic the Gathering, and then giving Free League uh, the ability to continue with an RPG. Maybe. I don't know. Splinkrent says, really good system for Middle Earth. I agree. Rhino says, generally, most third-party content 5e stuff calls it 5e compatible because they cannot use D&D &D as its own trademark. Technically, Wizards of the Coast does not call their game 5e officially, not a trademark. Yes, right. So you always see people say stuff like um, compatible with 5e or the world's most popular RPG. Guitar Guy Nick says, have you ever seen the Avatar TTRPG mechanics uh, force players to RP in meaningful ways? It's really good. I have not. I have not seen anything about the tabletop, the uh, Avatar uh, tabletop RPG. Keith says, I haven't actually read The Children of Hearing yet. An upcoming discussion would be great motivation for me to finally read it. I need to reread it, so it would be too. So many things to do. Mike Hansford says, love the version of the songs from the animated version of The Hobbit. Yes, they did put it in the animated Hobbit. Yes, they did. All right. 
So I've got two. So I think it is time. It is time. It is time. Because I've got, I had other things to do today. I still have other things to do today. Before the live streams tonight, we'll be painting some miniatures tonight. Dinner and a board game will be first. Then we'll rewatch Dinner and a board game uh, on the Crafter's Corner. So if you want to paint up stuff, uh, paint up. Uh, now would be a good time. Spray paint some miniatures. Uh, and then we'll be painting tonight on the Crafter's Corner. Love to have you there while we're rewatching Dinner and a board game. So here's the tequila right here. We are celebrating three things then. First of all, the longest live stream that I have ever done. Also, the most concurrent viewers, which was 50. At its height, it was 50 concurrent viewers. And what's our thumb count? What's our thumb count? Um, 53? Uh, oh, Cubicle 7 uh, lost their rights to a disagreement with the owner of the Tolkien estate. Oh, that's interesting. So is it 48 or 53 thumbs? Whatever it is. It's 57. 57. All right, I'm marking that down as my number. 57 thumbs up, concurrent viewers, uh, max at 50, and then a five-hour long stream. So where, do I have salt over here? I do. Always, you keep the salt and the tequila here at the desk, right? So tequila. Boom. Thank you so much for being with me. This was incredible. Had no idea this was going to happen when I got started this morning. Thank you all for being here. It was a wonderful live stream. We're going to carry on. We're going to carry on gaming. Uh, the last thing I will do, if you are here and you are not part of the Discord server, let me just drop a link in there. I would like to see you um, on future videos and also in the Discord server. And hey, there will be stuff premiering tonight. I got to get to work on that. So later, everybody. Thank you so much. Love you. Be productive. See you tonight. Bye.